Brienne. It was Hyle Hunt who insisted that they take the heads. Tarly will want them for the walls, he said. We have no tar, Brienne pointed out. The flesh will rot. Leave them. She did not want to travel through the green gloom of the piney woods with the heads of the men she'd killed. Hunt would not listen. He hacked through the dead men's necks himself, tied the three heads together by the hair, and slung them from his saddle. Brienne had no choice but to try and pretend that they were not there. But sometimes, especially at night, she could feel their dead eyes on her back, and once she dreamed she heard them whispering to one another. It was cold and wet on Cracklaw Point as they retraced their steps. Some days it rained, and some days it threatened rain. They were never warm. Even when they made camp, it was hard to find enough dry wood for a fire. By the time they reached the gates of Maidenpool, a host of flies attended them, a crow had eaten Shagwell's eyes, and Pig and Timian were crawling with maggots. Brienne and Podrick had long since taken to riding a hundred yards ahead, to keep the smell of rot well behind them. Sir Hyle claimed to have lost all sense of smell by then. Bury them, she told him, every time they made camp for a night. But Hunt was nothing if not stubborn. He will most like tell Lord Randall that he slew all three of them. To his honor, though, the knight did nothing of the sort. The stammering squire threw a rock, he said, when he and Brienne were ushered into Tarley's presence in the yard of Mouton's castle. The heads had been presented to a sergeant of the guard, who was told to have them cleaned and tarred and mounted above the gate. The sword's wench did the rest. All three? Lord Randall was incredulous. The way she fought, she could have killed three more. And did you find the Stark girl? Tarly demanded of her. No, my lord. Instead, you slew some rats. Did you enjoy it? No, my lord. A pity. Well, you've had your taste of blood, proved whatever it is you meant to prove. It's time you took off that mail and donned proper clothes again. There are ships in port, one's bound to stop at Tarth. I'll have you on it. Thank you, my lord. But no. Lord Tarley's face suggested he would have liked nothing better than to stick her own head on a spike and mount it above the gates of Maidenpool with Timian, Pig, and Shagwell. You mean to continue with this folly? I mean to find the Lady Sansa. If it please, my lord, Sir Hyle said, I watched her fight the mummers. She is stronger than most men, and quick. The sword is quick, Tarley snapped. That is the nature of Valyrian steel. Stronger than most men? Aye, she's a freak of nature. Far be it from me to deny it. His sort will never love me, Brienne thought, no matter what I do. My lord, it may be that Sander Clegane has some knowledge of the girl. If I could find him— Clegane's turned outlaw. He rides with Beric Dundarian now, it would seem. Or not, the tales vary. Show me where they are hiding. I will gladly slit their bellies open, pull their entrails out, and burn them. We've hanged dozens of outlaws, but the leaders still elude us. Clegane, Dondarian, the Red Priest, and now this woman Stoneheart. How do you propose to find them when I cannot? My lord, I— She had no good answer for him. All I can do is try. Try, then. You have your letter— you do not need my leave, but I'll give it none the less. If you're fortunate, all you get for your trouble are saddle sores. If not, perhaps Clegane will let you live after he and his pack are done raping you. You can crawl back to Tarth with some dog's bastard in your belly. Brienne ignored that. If it please, my lord, how many men ride with the hound? Six or sixty or six hundred. It would seem to depend on whom we ask. Randall Tarley had plainly had enough of the conversation. He started to turn away. If my squire and I might beg your hospitality until— Beg all you want. I will not suffer you beneath my roof. Sir Hyle Hunt stepped forward. If it please, my lord, 
I had understood that it was still Lord Mouton's roof. Tarley gave the knight a venomous look. Mouton has the courage of a worm. You will not speak to me of Mouton. As for you, my lady, it is said that your father is a good man. If so, I pity him. Some men are blessed with sons, some with daughters. No man deserves to be cursed with such as you. Live or die, Lady Biryani, do not return to Maidenpool whilst I rule here. Words are wind, Brienne told herself. They cannot hurt you. Let them wash over you. As you command, my lord, she tried to say, but Tarly had gone before she got it out. She walked from the yard like one asleep, not knowing where she was going. Sir Hyle fell in beside her. There are inns. She shook her head. She did not want words with Hyle Hunt. Do you recall the stinking goose? Her cloak still smelled of it. Why? Meet me there on the morrow at midday. My cousin Alan was one of those sent out to find the hound. I'll speak with him. Why would you do that? Why not? If you succeed where Alan failed, I shall be able to taunt him with that for years. There were still inns in Maidenpool. Sir Hyle had not been wrong. Some had burned during one sack or the other, however, and had yet to be rebuilt, and those that remained were full to bursting with men from Lord Tarley's host. She and Padrick visited all of them that afternoon, but there were no beds to be had anywhere. Sir, my lady, Padrick said, as the sun was going down, there are ships. Ships have beds, hammocks, or bunks. Lord Randall's men still prowled the docks, as thick as the flies had been on the heads of the three bloody mummers. But their sergeant knew Brienne by sight and let her pass. The local fisherfolk were tying up for the night and crying the day's catch, but her interest was in the larger ships that plied the stormy waters of the narrow sea. Half a dozen were in port, though one, a galleus called the Titan's Daughter, was casting off her lines to ride out on the evening tide. She and Padrick Payne made the rounds of the ships that remained. The master of the Gulltown girl took Brienne for a whore and told them that his ship was not a boarding house, and a harpooner on the Ebenese whaler offered to buy her boy, but they had better fortune elsewhere. She purchased Padrick an orange on the sea strider, a cog just in from Old Town by way of Tyrosh, Pentos, and Duskendale. Gull Town next, her captain told her. Thence around the fingers to Sisterton and White Harbor, if the storms allow. She's a clean ship, Strider, not so many rats as most, and we'll have fresh eggs and new churned butter aboard. Is my lady seeking passage north? No. Not yet. She was tempted, but... As they were making their way to the next pier, Padrick shuffled his feet and said, Sir, my lady, what if my lady did go home? My other lady, I mean, sir, Lady Sansa, they burned her home. Still, that's where her gods are, and gods can't die. Gods cannot die, but girls can. Timian was a cruel man and a murderer, but I do not think he lied about the hound. We cannot go north until we know for certain. There will be other ships. At the east end of the harbor they finally found shelter for the night, aboard a storm-racked trading galley called the Lady of Mir. She was listing badly, having lost her mast and half her crew in a storm. But her master did not have the coin he needed to refit her, so he was glad to take a few pennies from Brienne and allow her and Pod to share an empty cabin. They had a restless night. Thrice Brienne woke, once when the rain began, and once at a creek that made her think Nimble Dick was creeping in to kill her. The second time she woke with knife in hand, but it was nothing. In the darkness of the cramped little cabin it took her a moment to remember that Nimble Dick was dead. When she finally drifted back to sleep, she dreamed about the men she'd killed. They danced around her, mocking her, pinching at her as she slashed at them with her sword. 
She cut them all to bloody ribbons, yet still they swarmed around her. Shagwell, Timian, and Pig. I, but Randall Tarley, too, and Vargo Hote, and Red Ronnet Connington. Ronnet had a rose between his fingers. When he held it out to her, she cut his hand off. She woke sweating, and spent the rest of the night huddled under her cloak, listening to rain pound against the deck over her head. It was a wild night. From time to time she heard the sound of distant thunder, and thought of the Bravosi ship that had sailed upon the evening tide. The next morning she found the stinking goose again, woke its slatternly proprietor, and paid her for some greasy sausages, fried bread, half a cup of wine, a flagon of boiled water, and two clean cups. The woman squinted at Brienne as she was putting the water on to boil. "'Here the pig one went off with nimble Dick. I remember. He cheat you? No. Rape you? No. Steal your horse? No, he was slain by outlaws. Outlaws? The woman seemed more curious than upset. I always figured Dick would hang, or get sent off to that wall. They ate the fried bread and half the sausages. Padrick Payne washed his down with wine-flavored water, whilst Brienne nursed a cup of watered wine and wondered why she'd come. Hyle Hunt was no true knight. His honest face was just a mummer's mask. I do not need his help. I do not need his protection. And I do not need him, she told herself. He is probably not even coming. Telling me to meet him here was just another jape. She was getting up to go when Sir Hyle arrived. My lady, Padrick, he glanced at the cups and plates and the half-eaten sausages cooling in a puddle of grease and said, Gods, I hope you did not eat the food here. What we ate is no concern of yours, Brienne said. Did you find your cousin? What did he tell you? Sandor Clegane was last seen in salt pans the day of the raid. Afterward he rode west along the Trident. She frowned. The Trident is a long river. Aye, but I don't think our dog will have wandered too far from its mouth. Westeros has lost its charm for him, it would seem. At salt pans he was looking for a ship. Sir Hyle drew a roll of sheepskin from his boot, pushed the sausages aside, and unrolled it. It proved to be a map. The hound butchered three of his brother's men at the old inn by the crossroads here. He led the raid on salt pans here. He tapped salt pans with his finger. He may be trapped. The Freys are up here at the Twins. Darry and Harrenhal are south across the Trident. West he's got the Blackwoods and the Brackens fighting. And Lord Randall's here at Maidenpool. The high road to the Vale is closed by snow, even if he could get past the mountain clans. Where's a dog to go? If he is with Dondarrion... He is not. Alan is certain of that. Dondarrion's men are looking for him, too. They have put out word that they mean to hang him for what he did at Saltpans. They had no part of that. Lord Randall is putting it about that they did in hopes of turning the commons against Beric and his brotherhood. He will never take the lightning lord so long as the small folk are protecting him. And there's this other band, led by this woman Stoneheart, Lord Beric's lover, according to one tale. Supposedly she was hanged by the Freys, but Dondarrion kissed her and brought her back to life, and now she cannot die no more than he can. Brienne considered the map. If Clegane was last seen at Saltpans, that would be the place to find his trail. There is no one left at Saltpans but an old knight hiding in his castle, Alan said. Still, it would be a place to start. There is a man, Sir Hyle said, a septon. He came in through my gate the day before you turned up. Meribald, his name is, Riverborn and Riverbred, and he served here all his life. He's departing on the morrow to make his circuit, and he always calls it salt pans. We should go with him. Brienne looked up sharply. We? I'm going with you. You're not. 
When I'm going with Septon Maribald to sort pans, you and Padrick can go wherever you bloody well like. Did Lord Randall command you to follow me again? He commanded me to stay away from you. Lord Randall is of the view that you might benefit from a good hard raping. Then why would you come with me? It was that, or return to gate duty. If your lord commanded, he is no longer my lord. That took her aback. You left his service? His lordship informed me that he had no further need of my sword or my insolence. It amounts to the same thing. Henceforth I shall enjoy the adventuresome life of a hedge knight, though if we do find Sansa Stark, I imagine we will be well rewarded. Gold and land, that's what he sees in this. I mean to save the girl, not sell her. I swore a vow. I don't recall that I did. That is why you will not be coming with me. They left the next morning as the sun was coming up. It was a queer procession, Sir Hyle on a chestnut courser, and Brienne on her tall grey mare, Padrick Payne astride his swayback stot, and Septon Maribald walking beside them with his quarterstaff, leading a small donkey and a large dog. The donkey carried such a heavy load that Brienne was half afraid its back would break. Food for the poor and hungry of the Riverlands, Septon Maribald told them at the gates of Maidenpool. Seeds and nuts and dried fruit, oaten porridge, flour, barley bread, three wheels of yellow cheese from the inn by the fool's gate, salt cod for me, salt mutton for dog, oh, and salt, onions, carrots, turnips, two sacks of beans, four of barley and nine of oranges. I have a weakness for the orange, I confess. I got these from a sailor and I fear they will be the last I'll taste till spring. Maribald was a septon without a sept, only one step up from a begging brother in the hierarchy of the faith. There were hundreds like him, a ragged band whose humble task it was to trudge from one fly-speck of a village to the next, conducting holy services, performing marriages, and forgiving sins. Those he visited were expected to feed and shelter him, but most were as poor as he was, so Maribald could not linger in one place too long without causing hardship to his hosts. Kindly innkeeps would sometimes allow him to sleep in their kitchens or their stables, and there were septries and holdfasts and even a few castles where he knew he would be given hospitality. Where no such places were at hand, he slept beneath the trees or under hedges. There are many fine hedges in the riverlands, Maribald said. The old ones are the best. There's nothing beats a hundred-year-old hedge. Inside one of those a man can sleep as snug as at an inn, and with less fear of fleas. The septon could neither read nor write, as he cheerfully confessed along the road, but he knew a hundred different prayers and could recite long passages from the seven-pointed star from memory which was all that was required in the villages. He had a seamed, wind-burnt face, a shock of thick grey hair, wrinkles at the corners of his eyes. Though a big man, six feet tall, he had a way of hunching forward as he walked that made him seem much shorter. His hands were large and leathery, with red knuckles and dirt beneath the nails, and he had the biggest feet that Brienne had ever seen, bare and black and hard as horn. I have not worn a shoe in twenty years, he told Brienne. The first year I had more blisters than I had toes, and my soles would bleed like pigs whenever I trod on a hard stone. But I prayed, and the cobbler above turned my skin to leather. There is no cobbler above, Hodrick protested. There he is, lad, though you may call him by another name. Tell me, which of the seven gods do you love best? The warrior, said Padrick, without a moment's hesitation. Brienne cleared her throat. At evenfall, my father Septon always said that there was but one god. One god with seven aspects. That's so, my lady, and you are right to point it out. 
But the mystery of the seven who are one is not easy for simple folk to grasp, and I am nothing if not simple. So I speak of seven gods. Mirbald turned back to Podrick. I have never known a boy who did not love the warrior. I am old, though, and being old, I love the smith. Without his labor, what would the warrior defend? Every town has a smith, and every castle. They make the plows we need to plant our crops, the nails we use to build our ships, iron shoes to save the hooves of our faithful horses, the bright swords of our lords. No one could doubt the value of a smith, and so we name one of the seven in his honor, but we might as easily have called him the farmer, or the fisherman, the carpenter, or the cobbler. What he works at makes no matter. What matters is, he works. The father rules, the warrior fights, the smith labors, and together they perform all that is rightful for a man. Just as the smith is one aspect of the godhead, the cobbler is one aspect of the smith. It was he who heard my prayer and healed my feet. The gods are good, Sir Hyle said in a dry voice, but why trouble them when you might just have kept your shoes? Going barefoot was my penance. Even holy septons can be sinners, and my flesh was weak as weak could be. I was young and full of sap, and the girls? A septon can seem as gallant as a prince, if he is the only man you know who has ever been more than a mile from your village. I would recite to them from the seven-pointed star. The maiden's book worked best. Oh, I was a wicked man before I threw away my shoes. It shames me to think of all the maidens I deflowered. Brienne shifted in the saddle uncomfortably, thinking back to the camp below the walls of Highgarden and the wager Sir Hyle and the others had made to see who could bed her first. Were you looking for a maiden? confided Podrick Payne. A high-born girl of three and ten, with auburn hair. I had understood that you were seeking outlaws. Them too, Podrick admitted. Most travelers do all they can to avoid such men, said Septon Mirabald. Yet you would seek them out. We only seek one outlaw, Brienne said. The hound. So Sir Hyle told me. May the seven save you, child. It said he leaves a trail of butchered babes and ravished maids behind him. The mad dog of saltpans, I've heard him called. What would good folk want with such a creature? The maid that Padrick spoke of may be with him. Truly. Then we must pray for the poor girl. And for me, thought Brienne, a prayer for me as well. Ask the crone to raise her lamp and lead me to the Lady Sansa and the warrior to give strength to my arm so that I might defend her. She did not say the words aloud, though, not where Hyle Hunt might hear her and mock her for her woman's weakness. With Septon Mirabald afoot and his donkey bearing such a heavy load, the going was slow all that day. They did not take the main road west, the road that Brienne had once ridden with Sir Jamie, when they came the other way to find Maidenpool sacked and full of corpses, Instead, they struck off toward the northwest, following the shore of the Bay of Crabs, on a crooked track so small that it did not appear on either of Sir Hyle's precious sheepskin maps. The steep hills, black bogs, and piney woods of Cracklaw Point were nowhere to be found this side of Maidenpool. The lands they traveled through were low and wet, a wilderness of sandy dunes and salt marshes beneath a vast blue-gray vault of sky. The road was prone to vanishing amongst the reeds and tidal pools, only to appear again a mile farther on. Without Maribald, Brienne knew they surely would have lost their way. The ground was often soft, so in places the septon would walk ahead, tapping with his quarterstaff, to make certain of the footing. There were no trees for leagues around, just sea and sky and sand. No land could have been more different from Tarth, with its mountains and waterfalls, its high meadows and shadowed vales, 
Yet this place had its own beauty, Brienne thought. They crossed a dozen slow-flowing streams, alive with frogs and crickets, watched terns floating high above the bay, heard the sandpipers calling from amongst the dunes. Once a fox crossed their path and set Maribald's dog to barking wildly. And there were people, too. Some lived amongst the reeds in houses built of mud and straw, whilst others fished the bay in leather coracles and built their homes on rickety wooden stilts above the dunes. Most seemed to live alone, out of sight of any human habitation but their own. They seemed a shy folk for the most part, but near midday the dog began to bark again, and three women emerged from the reeds to give Maribald a woven basket full of clams. He gave each of them an orange in return, though clams were as common as mud in this world, and oranges were rare and costly. One of the women was very old, one was heavy with child, and one was a girl as fresh and pretty as a flower in spring. When Maribald took them off to hear their sins, Sir Hyle chuckled and said, It would seem the gods walk with us, at least the maiden, the mother, and the crone. Podrick looked so astonished that Brienne had to tell him no. They were only three marsh women. Afterward, when they resumed their journey, she turned to the septon and said, These people live less than a day's ride from Maidenpool, and yet the fighting has not touched them. They have little to touch, my lady. Their treasures are shells and stones and leather boats. Their finest weapons, knives of rusted iron. They are born, they live, they love, they die. They know Lord Mooton rules their lands, but few have ever seen him, and River Run and King's Landing are only names to them. And yet they know the gods, said Brienne. That is your work, I think. How long have you walked the riverlands? It will be forty years soon, the septon said, and his dog gave a loud bark. From Maidenpool to Maidenpool, my circuit takes me half a year, and oft times more, but I will not say I know the trident. I glimpse the castles of the great lords only at a distance, but I know the market towns and hold fasts, the villages too small to have a name, the hedges and the hills, the rills where a thirsty man can drink, and the caves where he can shelter, and the roads the small folk use, the crooked muddy tracks that do not appear on parchment maps, I know them too. He chuckled, I should. My feet have trod every mile of them, ten times over. The back roads are the ones the outlaws use, and the caves would make fine places for hunted men to hide. A prickle of suspicion made Brienne wonder just how well Sir Hyle knew this man. It must make for a lonely life, Septon. The seven are always with me, said Maribald, and I have my faithful servant and dog. Does your dog have a name? asked Padrick Payne. He must, said Maribald. But he is not my dog, not him. The dog barked and wagged his tail. He was a huge, shaggy creature, ten stone of dog at least, but friendly. Who does he belong to? asked Padrick. Why, to himself, and to the seven. As to his name, he has not told me what it is. I call him Dog. Oh! Padrick did not know what to make of a dog named Dog, plainly. The boy chewed on that a while, then said, I used to have a dog when I was little. I called him Hero. Was he? Was he what? A hero. No, he was a good dog, though. He died. Dog keeps me safe upon the roads, even in such trying times as these. Neither wolf nor outlaw dare molest me when dog is at my side. The septon frowned. The wolves have grown terrible of late. There are places where a man alone would do well to find a tree to sleep in. In all my years, the biggest pack I ever saw had fewer than a dozen wolves in it. But the great pack that prowls along the trident now numbers in the hundreds. Have you come on them yourself? Sir Hyle asked. 
I have been spared that, seven save me, but I have heard them in the night, and more than once. So many voices, a sound to curdle a man's blood, and even set dog to shivering, and dog has killed a dozen wolves. He ruffled the dog's head. Some will tell you that they are demons. They say the pack is led by a monstrous she-wolf, a stalking shadow, grim and gray and huge. They will tell you that she has been known to bring aurochs down all by herself, that no trap nor snare can hold her, that she fears neither steel nor fire, slays any wolf that tries to mount her, and devours no other flesh but man. Sir Hyle Hunt laughed. Now you've done it, Septon. Poor Podrick's eyes are big as boiled eggs. They're not, said Podrick, indignant. Dog barked. That night they made a cold camp in the dunes. Brienne sent Podrick walking by the shore to find some driftwood for a fire, but he came back empty-handed with mud up to his knees. The tide's out, sir, my lady. There's no water, only mud flats. Stay off the mud, child, counsel Septon Maribald. The mud is not fond of strangers. If you walk in the wrong place, it will open up and swallow you. It's only mud, insisted Padrick, until it fills your mouth and starts creeping up your nose. Then it's death. He smiled to take the chill off his words. Wipe off that mud and have a slice of orange, lad. The next day was more of the same. They broke their fast on salt cod and more orange slices, and were on their way before the sun was wholly risen, with a pink sky behind them and a purple sky ahead. Dog led the way, sniffing at every clump of reeds and stopping every now and then to piss on one. He seemed to know the road as well as Maribald. The cries of terns shivered through the morning air as the tide came rushing in. Near midday they stopped at a tiny village, the first they had encountered, where eight of the stilt houses loomed above a small stream. The men were out fishing in their coracles, but the women and young boys clambered down dangling rope ladders and gathered around Septon Maribald to pray. After the service he absolved their sins and left them with some turnips, a sack of beans, and two of his precious oranges. Back on the road the Septon said, we would do well to keep a watch tonight, my friends. The villagers say they've seen three broken men skulking round the dunes west of the old watchtower. Only three? Sir Hyle smiled. Three is honey to our sword's wench. They're not like to trouble armed men. Unless they're starving, the Septon said. There is food in these marshes, but only for those with the eyes to find it. And these men are strangers here, survivors from some battle. If they should accost us, sir, I beg you, leave them to me. What will you do with them? Feed them, ask them to confess their sins, so that I might forgive them. Invite them to come with us to the quiet isle. That's as good as inviting them to slit our throats as we sleep, Hal Hunt replied. Lord Randall has better ways to deal with broken men. "'Steel and heaven rope. "'Sir, my lady,' said Padrick, "'is a broken man an outlaw?' "'More or less,' Brienne answered. "'Septon Maribald disagreed. "'More or less than more. "'There are many sorts of outlaws, "'just as there are many sorts of birds. "'The sandpiper and the sea eagle both have wings, "'but they are not the same.' The singers love to sing of good men forced to go outside the law to fight some wicked lord. But most outlaws are more like this ravening hound than they are the lightning lord. They are evil men, driven by greed, soured by malice, despising the gods and caring only for themselves. Broken men are more deserving of our pity, though they may be just as dangerous. Almost all are common-born simple folk who had never been more than a mile from the house where they were born until the day some lord came round to take them off to war. Poorly shod and poorly clad, they march away beneath his banners, oft times with no better arms than a sickle or a sharpened hoe, 
or a maul they made themselves by lashing a stone to a stick with strips of hide. Brothers march with brothers, sons with fathers, friends with friends. They've heard the songs and stories, so they go off with eager hearts, dreaming of the wonders they will see, of the wealth and glory they will win. War seems a fine adventure, the greatest most of them will ever know. Then they get a taste of battle. For some, that one taste is enough to break them. Others go on for years until they lose count of all the battles they have fought in. But even a man who has survived a hundred fights can break in his hundred and first. Brothers watch their brothers die. Fathers lose their sons. Friends see their friends trying to hold their entrails in after they've been gutted by an axe. They see the Lord who led them there cut down, and some other Lord shouts that they are his now. They take a wound, and when that's still half healed, they take another. There is never enough to eat. Their shoes fall to pieces from the marching. Their clothes are torn and rotting, and half of them are shitting in their britches from drinking bad water. If they want new boots or a warmer cloak, or maybe a rusted iron half-elm, they need to take them from a corpse. And before long they are stealing from the living, too, from the small folk whose lands they are fighting in. Men very like the men they used to be. They slaughter their sheep and steal their chickens, and from there it's just a short step to carrying off their daughters, too. And one day they look around and realize all their friends and kin are gone that they are fighting beside strangers, beneath a banner that they hardly recognize. They don't know where they are, or how to get back home, and the Lord they are fighting for does not know their names. Yet here he comes, shouting for them to form up, to make a line with their spears and scythes and sharpened hoes, to stand their ground. And the knights come down on them, faceless men, clad all in steel, and the iron thunder of their charge seems to fill the world. And the man breaks. He turns and runs, or crawls off afterward over the corpses of the slain, or steals away in the black of night, and he finds some place to hide. All thought of home was gone by then, and kings and lords and gods mean less to him than a haunch of spoiled meat that will let him live another day or a skin of bad wine that might drown his fear for a few hours. The broken man lives from day to day, from meal to meal, more beast than man. Lady Vienne is not wrong. In times like these, the traveler must beware of broken men and fear them. But he should pity them as well. When Maribald was finished, a profound silence fell upon their little band. Rienne could hear the wind rustling through a clump of pussy willows, and farther off the faint cry of a loon. She could hear Dog panting softly as he loped along beside the septon and his donkey, tongue lolling from his mouth. The quiet stretched and stretched, until finally she said, How old were you when they marched you off to war? Why, no older than your boy, Mirabal replied. Too young for such, in truth. But my brothers were all going, and I would not be left behind. William said I could be his squire, though Will was no knight, only a potboy armed with a kitchen knife he'd stolen from the inn. He died upon the stepstones and never struck a blow. It was fever did for him, and for my brother Robin. Owen died from a mace that split his head apart, and his friend John Pox was hanged for rape. The War of the Nine Penny Kings, asked Hyle Hunt. So they called it, though I never saw a king nor earned a penny. It was a war, though. That it was. Samwell. Sam stood before the window, rocking nervously as he watched the last light of the sun vanish behind a row of sharp peaked rooftops. He must have gotten drunk again, he thought glumly or else he's met another girl. He did not know whether to curse or weep. Darian was supposed to be his brother. 
Ask him to sing, and no one could be better. Ask him to do what else. The mists of evening had begun to rise, sending gray fingers up the walls of the buildings that lined the old canal. He promised he'd be back, Sam said. You heard him, too. Gilly looked at him with eyes red-rimmed and puffy. Her hair hung about her face, unwashed and tangled. She looked like some weary animal peering through a bush. It had been days since they'd last had a fire, yet the wildling girl liked to huddle near the hearth, as if the cold ashes still held some lingering warmth. "'He doesn't like it here with us,' she said, whispering so as not to wake the babe. "'It's sad here. He likes it where the wine is, and the smiles.' Yes, thought Sam, and the wine is everywhere but here. Bravos was full of inns, alehouses, and brothels. And if Darian preferred a fire and a cup of mulled wine to stale bread in the company of a weeping woman, a fat craven, and a sick old man, who could blame him? I could blame him. He said he would be back before the gloaming. He said he would bring us wine and food. He looked out the window once more hoping against hope to see the singer hurrying home. Darkness was falling across the secret city, creeping through the alleys and down the canals. The good folk of Bravos would soon be shuttering their windows and sliding bars across their doors. Night belonged to the Bravos and the courtesans. Darian's new friends, Sam thought bitterly. They were all the singer could talk about of late. He was trying to write a song about one courtesan, a woman called the Moon Shadow, who had heard him singing beside the moon pool and rewarded him with a kiss. You should have asked her for silver, Sam had said. It's coin we need, not kisses. But the singer only smiled. Some kisses are worth more than yellow gold, Slayer. That made him angry, too. Darian was not supposed to be making up songs about courtesans. He was supposed to be singing about the wall and the valor of the night's watch. John had hoped that perhaps his songs might persuade a few young men to take the black. Instead, he sang of golden kisses, silvery hair, and red, red lips. No one ever took the black for red, red lips. Sometimes his playing would wake the babe, too. Then the child would begin to wail. Darian would shout at him to be quiet. Gilly would weep and the singer would storm out and not return for days. "'All that weeping makes me want to slap her,' he complained, "'and I can scarce sleep for her sobbing. "'You would weep as well if you had a son and lost him,' Sam almost said. He could not blame Gilly for her grief. Instead he blamed John Snow, and wondered when John's heart had turned to stone. Once he asked Maester Eamon that very question— when Gilly was down at the canal, fetching water for them. "'When you raised him up to be the Lord Commander,' the old man answered, "'Even now, rotting here in this cold room beneath the eaves, part of Sam did not want to believe that John had done what Maester Eamon thought. "'It must be true, though. Why else would Gilly weep so much? "'All he had to do was ask her whose child she was nursing at her breast, "'but he did not have the courage.' He was afraid of the answer he might get. I am still a craven, John. No matter where he went in this wide world, his fears went with him. A hollow rumbling echoed off the roofs of Bravos, like the sound of distant thunder. A titan sounding nightfall from across the lagoon. The noise was loud enough to wake the babe, and his sudden wail woke Maester Eamon. As Gilly went to give the boy the breast, the old man's eyes opened, and he stirred feebly in his narrow bed. Egg? It's dark. Why is it so dark? Because you're blind. Haman's wits were wandering more and more since they arrived at Bravos. Some days he did not seem to know where he was. Some days he would lose his way when saying something and begin to ramble on about his father or his brother. He is one hundred and two. Sam reminded himself, but he had been just as old at Castle Black, and his wits had never wandered there. "'It's me,' 
he had to say, Samuel Tarley, your steward. Sam? Maester Eamon licked his lips and blinked. Yes, and this is Bravos. Forgive me, Sam. Is morning come? No. Sam felt the old man's brow. His skin was damp with sweat, cool and clammy to the touch, his every breath a soft wheeze. It's night, Maester. You've been asleep. Too long. It's cold in here. We have no wood, Sam told him, and the innkeep will not give us more unless we have the coin. It was the fourth or fifth time they'd had the same conversation. I should have used our coin for wood, Sam chided himself every time. I should have had the sense to keep him warm. Instead, he had squandered the last of their silver on a healer from the House of the Red Hands, a tall pale man in robes embroidered with swirling stripes of red and white. All that the silver bought him was half a flask of dream wine. This may help gentle his passing, the Bavosi had said not unkindly. When Sam asked if there wasn't any more that he could do, he shook his head. Ointments I have, potions and infusions, tinctures and venoms and poultices. I might bleed him, purge him, leech him. But why? No leech can make him young again. This is an old man, and death is in his lungs. Give him this, and let him sleep. And so he had, all night and all day. But now the old man was struggling to sit. We must go down to the ships. The ships again. You're too weak to go out, he had to say. A chill had gotten inside Mr. Eamon during the voyage and settled in his chest. By the time they got to Bravos, he had been so weak it had to carry him ashore. They'd still had a fat bag of silver then, so Darian had asked for the inn's biggest bed. The one they'd gotten was large enough to sleep eight, so the innkeep insisted on charging them for that many. On the morrow we can go to the docks, Sam promised. You can ask about and find which ship is departing next for Old Town. Even in autumn, Bravos was still a busy port. Once Eamon was strong enough to travel, they should have no trouble finding a suitable vessel to take them where they had to go. Paying for their passage would prove more difficult. A ship from the Seven Kingdoms would be their best hope. A trader out of Old Town, maybe, with kin in the Night's Watch. There must still be some who honor the men who walk the wall. Old Town, Master Eamon wheezed. Yes, I dreamt of Old Town, Sam. I was young again, and my brother Egg was with me, with that big knight he served. We were drinking in the old inn where they make the fearsomely strong cider. He tried to rise again, but the effort proved too much for him. After a moment he settled back. The ships, he said again. We will find our answer there. About the dragons, I need to know. No, thought Sam, it's food and warmth you need, a full belly and a hot fire crackling in the hearth. Are you hungry, Maester? We have some bread left and a bit of cheese. Not just now, Sam. Later, when I'm feeling stronger. How will you get stronger unless you eat? None of them had eaten much at sea, not after Skagos. The autumn gales had hounded them all across the narrow sea. Sometimes they came up from the south, roiling with thunder and lightning and black rains that fell for days. Sometimes they came down from the north, cold and grim, with savage winds that cut right through a man. Once it got so cold that Sam had woken to find the whole ship coated in ice, shining as white as pearl. The captain had taken down their mast and tied it to the deck to finish the crossing on oars alone. No one had been eating by the time they saw the Titan. Once safe ashore, though, Sam had found himself ravenously hungry. It was the same for Darian and Gilly. Even the babe had begun to suck more lustily. Eamon, though. The bread's gone stale, but I can beg some gravy from the kitchens to soak it in, Sam told the old man. 
The innkeeper was a hard man, cold-eyed and suspicious of these black-clad strangers beneath his roof, but his cook was kinder. No. Perhaps a sip of wine, though? They had no wine. Darian had promised to buy some with the corn from his singing. We'll have wine later, Sam had to say. There's water, but it's not the good water. The good water came over the arches of the great brick aqueduct the Bravosi called the Sweetwater River. Rich men had it piped into their homes. The poor filled their pails and buckets at public fountains. Sam had sent Gilly out to get some, forgetting that the wandling girl had lived her whole life inside of Craster's Keep and never seen so much as a market town. The stony maze of islands and canals that was Bravos, devoid of grass and trees, and teeming with strangers who spoke to her in words she could not understand, frightened her so badly that she lost the map and soon herself. Sam found her weeping at the stony feet of some long-dead sea-lord. "'All we have is canal water,' he told Maester Eamon. "'But the cook gave it a boil. "'There's dream wine, too, if you need more of that. "'I have dreamt enough for now. "'Canal water will suffice. "'Help me, if you would.' Sam eased the old man up and held the cup to his dry, cracked lips. "'Even so,' Half the water dribbled down the maester's chest. Enough! Eamon coughed after a few sips. You drowned me! He shivered in Sam's arms. Why is the room so cold? There's no more wood. Darian had paid the innkeep double for a room with a hearth, but none of them had realized that wood would be so costly here. Trees did not grow on bravos, save in the courts and gardens of the mighty nor would the Bravosi cut the pines that covered the outlying islands around their great lagoon and acted as windbreaks to shield them from storms. Instead, firewood was brought in by barge, up the rivers and across the lagoon. Even dung was dear here. The Bravosi used boats in place of horses. None of that would have mattered if they had departed as planned for Old Town, but that had proved impossible with Maester Eamon so weak. Another voyage on the open sea would kill him. Eamon's hand crept across the blankets, groping for Sam's arm. "'We must go to the docks, Sam. "'When you are stronger.' The old man was in no state to brave the salt spray and wet winds along the waterfront. And Bravos was all waterfront. To the north was the Purple Harbor, where Bravosi traders tied up beneath the domes and towers of the Sea Lord's Palace. To the west lay the Ragman's Harbor, crowded with ships from the other free cities, from Westeros and Ibn, and the fabled far-off lands of the east. And everywhere else were little piers and ferry berths and old grey wharves, where shrimpers and crabbers and fisherfolk moored after working the mud flats and river mouths. It would be too great a strain on you. Then go in my stead, Haman urged. And bring me someone who has seen these dragons. Me? Sam was dismayed by the suggestion. Maester, it was only a story, a sailor's story. Darian was to blame for this as well. The singer had been bringing back all manner of queer tales from the alehouses and brothels. Unfortunately, he had been in his cups when he heard the one about the dragons, and could not recall the details. Darian may have made up the whole story. Singers do that. They make things up. They do, said Maester Eamon. But even the most fanciful song may hold a kernel of truth. Find that truth for me, Sam. I wouldn't know who to ask, or how to ask him. I only have a little high Valyrian, and when they speak to me in Bravosi, I cannot understand half of what they're saying. You speak more tongues than I do. Once you are stronger, you can— When will I be stronger, Sam? Tell me that. Soon, if you rest and eat. When we reach Old Town— I shall not see Old Town again. I know that now. The old man tightened his grip on Sam's arm. I will be with my brothers soon. Some were bound to me by vows, 
and some by blood. But they were all my brothers. And my father. He never thought the throne would pass to him. And yet it did. He used to say that was his punishment for the blow that slew his brother. I pray he found the peace in death that he never knew in life. The septons sing of sweet surcease, of laying down our burdens and voyaging to a far sweet land where we may laugh and love and feast until the end of days. But what if there is no land of light and honey, only cold and dark and pain beyond the wall called death? He is afraid, Sam realized, you are not dying. You're ill, that's all. It will pass. Not this time, Sam. I dreamed. In the black of night, a man asks all the questions he dare not ask by daylight. For me, these past years, only one question has remained. Why would the gods take my eyes and my strength, yet condemn me to linger on so long? frozen and forgotten. What use could they have for an old, done man like me? Eamon's fingers trembled, twigs sheathed in spotted skin. I remember, Sam. I still remember. He was not making sense. Remember what? Dragons, Eamon whispered. The grief and glory of my house they were. The last dragon died before you were born, said Sam. How could you remember them? I see them in my dreams, Sam. I see a red star bleeding in the sky. I still remember red. I see their shadows on the snow, hear the crack of leathern wings, feel their hot breath. My brothers dreamed of dragons, too, and the dreams killed them, every one. Sam, we tremble on the cusp of half-remembered prophecies, of wonders and terrors that no man now living could hope to comprehend, or—or, or, said Sam, or not. Eamon chuckled softly, or I am an old man feverish and dying. He closed his white eyes wearily, then forced them open once again. I should not have left the wall. Lord Snow could not have known, but I should have seen it. Fire consumes, but cold preserves. The wall? But it is too late to go running back. The stranger waits outside my door and will not be denied. Steward, you have served me faithfully. Do this one last brave thing for me. Go down to the ships, Sam. Learn all you can about these dragons. Sam eased his arm out of the old man's grasp. I will, if you want. I only... He did not know what else to say. I cannot refuse him. He could look for Darien as well, along the docks and wharves of the Ragman's Harbor. I will find Darien first, and we'll go to the ships together. And when we come back, we'll bring food and wine and wood. We'll have a fire and a good hot meal. He rose. Well, I should go then. If I am going. Gilly will be here. Gilly, bar the door when I am gone. The stranger waits outside the door. Gilly nodded, cradling the babe against her breast, her eyes welling full of tears. She is going to weep again, Sam realized. It was more than he could take. His sword belt hung from a peg on the wall, beside the old cracked horn that John had given him. He ripped it down and buckled it about him, and swept his black wool cloak about his rounded shoulders, slumped through the door and clattered down a wooden stair whose steps creaked beneath his weight. The inn had two front doors, one opening on a street and one on a canal. 
Sam went out through the former to avoid the common room where the innkeep was sure to give him the sour eye that he reserved for guests who had overstayed their welcome. There was a chill in the air, but the night was not half so foggy as some. Sam was grateful for that much. Sometimes the mists covered the ground so thick that a man could not see his own feet. Once he had come within a step of walking into a canal. As a boy, Sam had read a history of Bravos and dreamed of one day coming here. He wanted to behold the titan rising stern and fearsome from the sea, glide down the canals in a serpent boat, past all the palaces and temples, and watch the Bravos do their water dance, blades flashing in the starlight. But now that he was here, all he wanted was to leave and go to Old Town. With his hood up and his cloak flapping, he made his way along the cobblestones toward the Ragman's Harbor. His sword belt kept threatening to fall down about his ankles, so he had to keep tugging it back up as he went. He stayed to the smaller, darker streets, where he was less likely to encounter anyone, yet every passing cat still made his heart thump, and Bravos crawled with cats. I need to find Darian, he thought. He is a man of the Night's Watch. My sworn brother, he and I will puzzle out what to do. Maester Eamon's strength was gone, and Gilly would have been lost here even if she had not been grief-stricken. But Darian, I should not think ill of him. He could be hurt. Perhaps that is why he did not come back. He could be dead, lying in some alley in a pool of blood, or floating face down in one of the canals. At night, the Bravos swaggered through the city in their party-colored finery, spoiling to prove their skill with those slender swords they wore. Some would fight for any cause, some for none at all. And Darian had a loose tongue and quick temper, especially when he'd been drinking. Just because a man can sing about battles doesn't mean he's fit to fight one. The best alehouses, inns, and brothels were near the Purple Harbor or the Moon Pool. But Darian preferred the Ragman's Harbor, where the patrons were more apt to speak the common tongue. Sam began his search at the Inn of the Green Eel, the Black Bargeman, and Morogos, places where Darian had played before. He was not to be found at any of them. Outside the fog house, several serpent boats were tied up, awaiting patrons, and Sam tried to ask the Pullman if they had seen a singer all in black but none of the Pullman understood his high Valyrian. That, or they do not choose to understand. Sam peered into the dingy wine sink beneath the second arch of Nabo's bridge, barely large enough to accommodate ten people. Darian was not one of them. He tried the outcast inn, the house of seven lamps, and the brothel called the Cattery, where he got strange looks but no help. Leaving, he almost bumped into two young men beneath the cattery's red lantern. One was dark, and one was fair. The dark-haired one said something in Bravosi. I am sorry, Sam had to say. I do not understand. He edged away from them, afraid. In the Seven Kingdoms, nobles draped themselves in velvets, silks, and Semites of a hundred hues, whilst peasants and small folk wore raw wool and dull brown roughspun. In Bravos, it was otherwise. The Bravos swaggered about like peacocks, fingering their swords, whilst the mighty dressed in charcoal gray and purple, blues that were almost black, and blacks as dark as a moonless night. My friend Tero says you are so fat you make him sick, said the fair-haired Bravo, whose jacket was green velvet on one side and cloth of silver on the other. My friend Tero says that the rattle of your sword makes his head ache. He was speaking in the common tongue. The other one, the dark-haired bravo in the burgundy brocade and yellow cloak, whose name would appear to have been Tero, made some comment in bravosi, and his fair-haired friend laughed and said, My friend Tero says you dress above your station. Are you some great lord to wear the black? Sam wanted to run, but if he did, was like to trip over his own sword belt. Do not touch your sword, he told himself. Even a finger on the hilt might be enough for one or the other of the bravos to take as a challenge. 
He tried to think of words that might appease them. I'm not, was all he managed. He is not a lord, a child's voice put in. He's in the Night's Watch, stupid. From Westeros. A girl edged into the light, pushing a barrel full of seaweed, a scruffy, skinny creature in big boots with ragged, unwashed hair. There's another one down at the happy port, singing songs to the sailor's wife, she informed the two bravos. To Sam, she said, If they ask who is the most beautiful woman in the world, say, the nightingale, or else they'll challenge you. Do you want to buy some clams? I sold all my oysters. I have no coin, Sam said. He has no coin, mocked the fair-haired bravo. The dark-haired friend grinned and said something in bravosi. My friend Taro is chilly. Be our good fat friend and give him your cloak. Don't do that either, said the barrel girl, or else they'll ask for your boots next, and before long you'll be naked. Little cats who howl too loud get drowned in the canals, warned the fair-haired bravo. Not if they have claws. And suddenly there was a knife in the girl's left hand, a blade as skinny as she was. The one called Taro said something to his fair-haired friend, and the two of them moved off, chuckling at one another. Thank you, Sam told the girl when they were gone. Her knife vanished. If you wear a sword at night, it means you can be challenged. Did you want to fight them? No. It came out in a squeak that made Sam wince. Are you truly in the night's watch? I never saw a black brother like you before. The girl gestured at the barrow. You can have the last clams if you want. It's dark. No one will buy them now. Are you sailing to the wall? To Old Town. Sam took one of the baked clams and wolfed it down. We're between ships. The clam was good. He ate another. The bravos never bother anyone without a sword. Not even stupid camel cunts like Tero and Orbello. Who are you? No one. She stank of fish. I used to be someone, but now I'm not. You can call me Cat if you like. Who are you? Samwell, of House Tarley. You speak the common tongue. My father was the ore master on Nymeria. A bravo killed him for saying that my mother was more beautiful than the nightingale. Not one of those camel cunts you met. A real bravo. Some day I'll slit his throat. The captain said Nymeria had no need of little girls, so he put me off. Brusco took me in and gave me a barrow. She looked up at him. What ship will you be sailing on? We bought passage on the Lady Ushinora. The girl squinted at him suspiciously. She is gone. Don't you know? She left days and days ago. I know, Sam might have said. He and Darian had stood on the dock watching the rise and fall of her oars as she beat for the Titan and the open sea. Well, the singer said, that's done. If Sam had been a braver man, he would have shoved him into the water. When it came to talking girls out of their clothes, Darian had a honeyed tongue. Yet in the captain's cabin, somehow Sam had done all the talking, trying to persuade the bravosi to wait for them. Three days I have waited for this old man, the captain had said. My holds are full, and my men have fucked their wives farewell. With you or without, my lady leaves on the tide. Please, Sam had pleaded, just a few more days, that's all I ask, so Mr. Eamon can recover his strength. He has no strength. The captain had visited the inn the night before to see Mr. Eamon for himself. He is old and ill, and I will not have him dying on my lady. Stay with him or leave him, it matters not to me. I sail. Even worse, he had refused to return the passage money they had paid him, the silver that was meant to see them safe to Old Town. You bought my finest cabin. It is there, awaiting you. If you do not choose to occupy it, that is no fault of mine. Why should I bear the loss? By now we might be at Duskendale. Sam thought mournfully. 
We might even have reached Pentos if the winds were kind. But none of that would matter to the barrel girl. You said you saw a singer. At the happy port. He's going to wed the sailor's wife. Wed? She only beds the ones who marry her. Where is this happy port? Across from the mummer's ship. I can show you the way. I know the way. Sam had seen the mummer's ship. Darian cannot wed. He said the words, I have to go. He ran. It was a long way over slick cobbles. Before long he was puffing, his big black cloak flapping noisily behind him. He had to keep one hand on his sword belt as he ran. What few people he encountered gave him curious looks, and once a cat reared up and hissed at him. By the time he reached the ship he was staggering. The happy port was just across the alley. No sooner had he entered, flushed and out of breath, than a one-eyed woman threw her arms around his neck. Don't, Sam told her. I'm not here for that. She answered in bravosi. I do not speak that tongue, Sam said in high valyrian. There were candles burning and a fire crackling in the hearth. Someone was sawing on a fiddle, and he saw two girls dancing around a red priest holding hands. The one-eyed woman pressed her breasts against his chest. Don't do that! I'm not here for that! Sam! Darian's familiar voice rang out. Ina, let him go! That's Sam the Slayer, my sworn brother! The one-eyed woman peeled away, though she kept one hand on his arm. One of the dancers called out, He can slay me if he likes! And the other said, Do you think he'd let me touch his sword? Behind them a purple gallius had been painted on the wall, crewed by women clad in thigh-high boots and nothing else. The Tyroshi sailor was passed out in a corner, snoring into his huge scarlet beard. Elsewhere an older woman with huge breasts was turning tiles with a massive summer islander in black and scarlet feathers. In the center of it all sat Darian, nuzzling at the neck of the woman in his lap. She was wearing his black cloak. Slayer, the singer called out drunkenly, come meet my lady wife. His hair was sand and honey, his smile warm. I sang her love songs. Women melt like butter when I sing. How could I resist this face? He kissed her nose. Wife, give Slayer a kiss. He's my brother. When the girl got to her feet, Sam saw that she was naked underneath the cloak. "'Don't go fondling my wife now, Slayer,' said Darian, laughing. "'But if you want one of her sisters, you feel free. I still have corn enough, I think.' "'Coin that might have bought us food,' Sam thought. "'Coin that might have bought wood, so Maester Eamon could keep warm.' What have you done? You can't marry. You said the words the same as me. They could have your head for this. We're only wed for this one night, Slayer. Even in Westeros, no one takes your head for that. Haven't you ever gone to Molestown to dig for buried treasure? No, Sam reddened. I would never. What about your wildling wench? You must have fucked her a time or three. All those nights in the woods, huddled together under your cloak? Don't you tell me that you never stuck it in her. He waved a hand toward a chair. Sit down, Slayer. Have a cup of wine. Have a whore. Have both. Sam did not want a cup of wine. You promised to come back before the gloaming, to bring back wine and food. Is this how you kill that other... Scolding him to death? Darian laughed. She's my wife, not you. If you will not drink to my marriage, go away. Come with me, said Sam. Maester Eamon's woken up and wants to hear about these dragons. He's talking about bleeding stars and white shadows and dreams, and if we could find out more about these dragons, it might help give him ease. Help me. On the morrow, not on my wedding night. 
Darian pushed himself to his feet, took his bride by the hand, and started toward the stairs, pulling her behind him. Sam blocked his way. You promised, Darian. You said the words. You're supposed to be my brother. And Westeros. Does this look like Westeros to you? Maester Eamon is dying. That stripy healer you wasted all our silver on said as much. Darian's mouth had turned hard. Have a girl or go away, Sam. You're ruining my wedding. I'll go, said Sam, but you'll come with me. No, I'm done with you. I'm done with black. Darian tore his cloak off his naked bride and tossed it in Sam's face. Here, throw that rag on the old man. It may keep him a little warmer. I shan't be needing it. I'll be clad in velvet soon. Next year, I'll be wearing furs and eating. Sam hit him. He did not think about it. His hand came up, curled into a fist, and crashed into the singer's mouth. Darian cursed, and his naked wife gave a shriek, and Sam threw himself onto the singer and knocked him backwards over a low table. They were almost of a height, but Sam weighed twice as much, and for once he was too angry to be afraid. He punched the singer in the face and in the belly, then began to pummel him about the shoulders with both hands. When Darian grabbed his wrists, Sam butted him with his head and broke his lip. The singer let go, and he smashed him in the nose. Somewhere a man was laughing, a woman cursing. The fight seemed to slow, as if they were two black flies struggling in amber. Then someone dragged Sam off the singer's chest. He hit that person, too, and something hard crashed into his head. The next he knew he was outside, flying headfirst through the fog. For half a heartbeat he saw black water underneath him. Then the canal came up and smashed him in the face. Sam sank like a stone, like a boulder, like a mountain. The water got into his eyes and up his nose, dark and cold and salty. When he tried to shout for help, he swallowed more. Kicking and gasping, he rolled over, bubbles bursting from his nose. Swim, he told himself. Swim! The brine stung his eyes when he opened them, blinding him. He popped to the surface for just an instant, sucked down air, and slapped desperately with one hand whilst the other scrabbled at the wall of the canal. But the stones were slick and slimy, and he could not get a grasp. He sank again. Sam could feel the cold against his skin as the water soaked through his clothes. His sword belt slipped down his legs and tangled around his ankles. I'm going to drown, he thought, in a blind black panic. He thrashed, trying to claw his way back to the surface, but instead his face bumped the bottom of the canal. I'm upside down, he realized. I'm drowning. Something moved beneath one flailing hand, an eel or a fish, slithering through his fingers. I can't drown. Maester Eamon will die without me, and Gilly will have no one. I have to swim. I have to— There was a huge splash, and something coiled around him, under his arms and around his chest. The eel, was his first thought. The eel has got me. It's going to pull me down. He opened his mouth to scream and swallowed more water. I'm drowned, was his last thought. Oh, God's be good. I'm drowned. When he opened his eyes, he was on his back, and a big black summer islander was pounding on his belly with fists the size of hams. Stop that. You're hurting me. Sam tried to scream. Instead of words, he retched out water and gasped. He was sodden and shivering, lying on the cobbles in a puddle of canal water. The summer islander punched him in the belly again, and more water came squirting out his nose. Stop that! Sam gasped. I haven't drowned. I haven't drowned. No. His rescuer leaned over him, huge and black and dripping. You owe Shondo many feathers. The water ruined Shondo's fine cloak. It had, Sam saw. The feathered cloak clung to the black man's huge shoulders, sodden 
and soiled. I never meant to be swimming. Shondo saw. Too much splashing. Fat men should float. He grabbed Sam's doublet with a huge black fist and hauled him to his feet. Shondo mates on cinnamon wind. Many tongues he speaks a little. Inside, Shondo laughs to see you punch the singer. And Shondo hears. A broad white smile spread across his face. Shondo knows these dragons. Jamie. I had hoped that by now you would have grown tired of that wretched beard. All that hair makes you look like Robert. His sister had put aside her mourning for a jade-green gown with sleeves of silver mirish lace. An emerald the size of a pigeon's egg hung on a golden chain about her neck. Robert's beard was black. Mine is gold. Gold or silver? Cersei plucked a hair from beneath his chin and held it up. It was gray. All the color is draining out of you, brother. You become a ghost of what you were, a pale, crippled thing, and so bloodless, always in white. She flicked the hair away. I prefer you garbed in crimson and gold. I prefer you dappled in sunlight, with water beating on your naked skin. He wanted to kiss her, carry her to her bedchamber, throw her on the bed. She's been fucking Lancel and Osmond Kettleblack and Moonboy. I will make a bargain with you. Relieve me of this duty, and my razor is yours to command. Her mouth tightened. She had been drinking hot-spiced wine and smelled of nutmeg. You presume to dicker with me? Need I remind you, you are sworn to obey. I am sworn to protect the king. My place is at his side. Your place is wherever he sends you. Tommen puts his seal on every paper that you put in front of him. This is your doing, and it's folly. Why name Davin your warden of the West if you have no faith in him? Circe took a seat beneath the window. Behind her, Jamie could see the blackened ruin of the Tower of the Hand. Why so reluctant, sir? Did you lose your courage with your hand? I swore an oath to Lady Stark, never again to take up arms against the Starks or Tullys. A drunken promise, made with a sword at your throat. How can I defend Toman if I am not with him? By defeating his enemies. Father always said that a swift sword stroke is a better defense than any shield. Admittedly, most sword strokes require a hand. Still, even a crippled lion may inspire fear. I want River Run. I want Brindon Tully chained or dead. And someone needs to set Harrenhal to rights. We have urgent need of Willis Manderley, assuming he is still alive and captive. But the garrison has not replied to any of our ravens. Those are Gregor's men at Harrenhal, Jamie reminded her. The mountain liked them cruel and stupid. Most like they ate your ravens, messages and all. That's why I'm sending you. They may eat you as well, brave brother, but I trust you'll give them indigestion. Circe smoothed her skirt. I want Sir Osmond to command the king's guard in your absence. She's been fucking Lancel and Osmond Kettleblack and Moonboy for all I know. That's not your choice. If I must go, Solaris will command here in my stead. Is that a jape? You know how I feel about Sir Loris. If you had not sent Balan Swan to Dorne, I need him there. These Dornishmen cannot be trusted. That red snake champion Tyrion, have you forgotten that? I will not leave my daughter to their mercy. And I will not have Loris Tyrell commanding the King's Guard. Sir Loris is thrice the man Sir Osmond is. Your notions of manhood have changed somewhat, brother. Jamie felt his anger rising. True, Loris does not leer at your teats the way Sir Osmond does, but I hardly think— Think about this! Cersei slapped his face. 
Jamie made no attempt to block the blow. I see I need a thicker beard to cushion me against my queen's caresses. He wanted to rip her gown off and turn her blows to kisses. He'd done it before, back when he had two good hands. The queen's eyes were green ice. You had best go, sir. Ansel, Osmond Kettleblack, and Moonboy. Are you deaf as well as maimed? You'll find the door behind you, sir. As you command. Jimmy turned on his heel and left her. Somewhere the gods were laughing. Circe had never taken kindly to being balked. He knew that. Softer words might have swayed her, yet of late the very sight of her made him angry. Part of him would be glad to put King's Landing behind him. He had no taste for the company of the lickspittles and fools who surrounded Circe. The smallest council, they were calling them in Flea Bottom, according to Adam Marbrand, and Kyburn. He might have saved Jamie's life, but he was still a bloody mummer. Kyburn stinks of secrets, he warned Circe. That only made her laugh. We all have secrets, brother, she replied. She's been fucking Lancel and Osmond Kettleblack and Moonboy, for all I know. Forty knights and as many esquires awaited him outside the Red Keep's stables. Half were westermen, sworn to House Lannister, the others' recent foes turned doubtful friends. Sir Dermot of the Rainwood would carry Tommen's standard, Red Run at Connington, the white banner of the King's Guard. A page, a piper, and a peckledon would share the honor of squiring for the Lord Commander. Keep friends at your back and foes where you can see them, Summer Craighall had once counseled him. Or had that been farther? His palfrey was a blood bay, his destrier a magnificent grey stallion. It had been long years since Jamie had named any of his horses. He had seen too many die in battle, and that was harder when you named them. But when the Piper boy started calling them honor and glory, he laughed and let the names stand. Glory wore trappings of Lannister crimson. Honor was barded in King's Guard white. Josman Peckledon held the palfrey's reins as Sir Jamie mounted. The squire was skinny as a spear, with long arms and legs, greasy mouse-brown hair, and cheeks soft with peach fuzz. His cloak was Lannister crimson, but his surcoat showed the ten purple mullets of his own house arrayed upon a yellow field. "'My lord,' the lad asked, "'will you be wanting your new hand?' "'Wear it, Jamie,' urged Sir Kenneth's of Case. "'Wave at the small folk and give them a tale to tell their children.' I think not. Jamie would not show the crowds a golden lie. Let them see the stump. Let them see the cripple. But feel free to make up for my lack, Sir Kenneth. Wave with both hands, and waggle your feet if it please you. He gathered the reins in his left hand and wheeled his horse around. Pain, he called as the rest were forming up. You'll ride beside me. Sir Illyn Payne made his way to Jamie's side, looking like the beggar at the ball. His ring-mail was old and rusted, worn over a stained jack of boiled leather. Neither the man nor his mount showed any heraldry. His shield was so hacked and battered it was hard to say what color paint might once have covered it. With his grim face and deep-sunk hollow eyes, Sir Illyn might have passed for death himself as he had for years. No longer, though. Sir Ellen had been half of Jamie's price, for swallowing his boy-king's command like a good little lord commander. The other half had been Sir Adam Marbrand. I need them, he had told his sister, and Circe had not put up a fight. Most like she's pleased to rid herself of them. Sir Adam was a boyhood friend of Jamie's, and the son headsman had belonged to their father if he belonged to anyone. Payne had been the captain of the Hand's Guard when he had been heard boasting that it was Lord Tywin who ruled the Seven Kingdoms and told King Eris what to do. Eris Targaryen took his tongue for that. "'Open the gates,' said Jamie, 
and Strongbore, in his booming voice, called out, Open the gates! When Mace Tyrell had marched out through the mud gate to the sound of drums and fiddles, thousands lined the streets to cheer him off. Little boys had joined the march, striding along beside the Tyrell soldiers with heads held high and legs pumping, whilst their sisters threw down kisses from the windows. Not so today. A few whores called out invitations as they passed, and a meat-pie man cried his wares. In Cobbler's Square, two threadbare sparrows were haranguing several hundred small folk, crying doom upon the heads of godless men and demon worshippers. The crowd parted for the column. Sparrows and cobblers alike looked on with dull eyes. They like the smell of roses, but have no love for lions, Jamie observed. My sister would be wise to take note of that. Sir Ellen made no reply. The perfect companion for a long ride. I will enjoy his conversation. The greater part of his command awaited him beyond the city walls. Sir Adam Marbrand with his outriders, Sir Stephen Swift and the baggage train, the Holy Hundred of old Sir Bonifer the Good, Sarsfield's mounted archers, Maester Julian with four cages full of ravens, two hundred heavy horse under Sir Flamant Brax. Not a great host, all in all, fewer than a thousand men in total. Numbers were the last thing needed at River Run. A Lannister army already invested the castle, and an even larger force of Freys. The last bird they'd received suggested that the besiegers were having difficulty keeping themselves fed. Brendan Tully had scoured the land clean before retiring behind his walls. Not that it required much scouring. From what Jamie had seen of the Riverlands, scarce a field remained unburnt, a town unsacked, a maiden undespoiled. And now my sweet sister sends me to finish the work that Amory Lorch and Gregor Clegane began. He left a bitter taste in his mouth. This near to King's Landing, the King's Road was as safe as any road could be in such times, Yet Jamie sent Marbrand and his outriders ahead to scout. Rob Stark took me unawares in the whispering wood, he said. That will never happen again. You have my word on it. Marbrand seemed visibly relieved to be a horse again, wearing the smoke gray cloak of his own house instead of the gold wool of the city watch. If any foe should come within a dozen leagues, you will know of them beforehand. Jamie had given stern commands that no man was to depart the column without his leave. Elsewise, he knew he would have bored young lordlings racing through the fields, scattering livestock and trampling down the crops. There were still cows and sheep to be seen near the city, apples on the trees and berries in the brush, stands of barley corn and oats and winter wheat, wains and ox carts on the road. Farther afield, things would not be so rosy. Riding at the front of the host with Sir Illyn silent by his side, Jamie felt almost content. The sun was warm on his back, and the wind riffled through his hair like a woman's fingers. When little Lou Piper came galloping up with a helmful of blackberries, Jamie ate a handful and told the boy to share the rest with his fellow squires and Sir Illyn Payne. Payne seemed as comfortable in his silence as in his rusted ringmail and boiled leather. The clop of his gelding's hooves and the rattle of sword and scabbard whenever he shifted his seat were the only sounds he made. Though his pox-scarred face was grim and his eyes as cold as ice on a winter lake, Jamie sensed that he was glad he'd come. I gave the man a choice, he reminded himself. He could have refused me and remained king's justice. Sir Ellen's appointment had been a wedding gift from Robert Baratheon to the father of his bride, a sinecure to compensate Payne for the tongue he'd lost in the service of House Lannister. He made a splendid headsman. He had never botched an execution, and seldom required as much as a second stroke. And there was something about his silence that inspired terror. Seldom had a king's justice seemed so well fitted for his office. When Jamie decided to take him, he had sought out Sir Illyn's chambers at the end of Traitor's Walk. The upper floor of the squat, 
half round tower, was divided into cells for prisoners who required some measure of comfort, captive knights or lordlings awaiting ransom or exchange. The entrance to the dungeons proper was at ground level, behind a door of hammered iron and a second of splintery grey wood. On the floors between were rooms set aside for the use of the chief jailer, the lord confessor, and the king's justice. The justice was a headsman, but by tradition he also had charge of the dungeons and the men who kept them. And for that task Sir Illyn Payne was singularly ill-suited, as he could neither read, nor write, nor speak. Sir Illyn had left the running of the dungeons to his underlings, such as they were. The realm had not had a Lord Confessor since the second Daron, however, and the last chief jailer had been a cloth merchant who purchased the office from Littlefinger during Robert's reign. No doubt he'd had good profit from it for a few years, and Hilly made the error of conspiring with some other rich fools to give the Iron Throne to Stannis. They called themselves Antler Men, so Joff had nailed antlers to their heads before flinging them over the city walls. So it had been left to Renifer Longwaters, the head under jailer with the twisted back, who claimed at tedious length to have a drop of dragon in him, to unlock the dungeon doors for Jamie and conduct him up the narrow steps inside the walls to the place where Illyn Payne had lived for fifteen years. The chambers stank of rotted food, and the rushes were crawling with vermin. As Jamie entered, he almost trod upon a rat. Payne's great sword rested on a trestle table beside a whetstone and a greasy oilcloth. The steel was immaculate, the edge glimmering blue in the pale light, but elsewhere piles of soiled clothing were strewn about the floors, and the bits of mail and armor scattered here and there were red with rust. Jamie could not count the broken wine jars. The man cares for naught but killing, he thought as Sir Ellen emerged from a bedchamber that reeked of overflowing chamber pots. "'His grace bids me win back his riverlands,' Jamie told him. "'I would have you with me, if you can bear to give up all of this.' Silence was his answer, and a long, unblinking stare. But just as he was about to turn and take his leave, Payne had given him a nod. "'And here he rides.' Jamie glanced at his companion. Perhaps there is yet hope for the both of us. That night they made camp beneath the hilltop castle of the Haywards. As the sun went down, a hundred tents sprouted beneath the hill, along the banks of the stream that ran beside it. Jamie set the sentries himself. He did not expect trouble this close to the city, but his uncle Stavard had once thought himself safe on the Ox Cross, too. It was best to take no chances. When the invitation came down from the castle for him to sup with Lady Hayford's castellan, Jamie took Sir Ellen with him, along with Sir Adam Marbrand, Sir Boniface Hasty, Red Ronnet Connington, Strongbore, and a dozen other knights and lordlings. "'I suppose I ought to wear the hand,' he said to Peck before making his ascent. The lad fetched it straight away. The hand was wrought of gold, very lifelike, with inlaid nails of mother-of-pearl, its fingers and thumb half-closed so as to slip around a goblet's stem. I cannot fight, but I can drink. Jamie reflected as the lad was tightening the straps that bound it to his stump. Men shall name you Golden Hand from this day forth, my lord, the armor had assured him the first time he'd fitted it onto Jamie's wrist. He was wrong. I shall be the Kingslayer till I die. The golden hand was the occasion for much admiring comment over supper, at least until Jamie knocked over a goblet of wine. Then his temper got the best of him. If you admire the bloody thing so much, lop off your own sword hand and you can have it, he told Flemont Brax. After that, there was no more talk about his hand, and he managed to drink some wine in peace. The lady of the castle was a Lannister by marriage, a plump toddler who had been wed to his cousin Tyrek before she was a year old. Lady Ermesand was duly trotted out for their approval, all trussed up in a little gown of cloth of gold, with a green fretty and green pale wavy of House Hayford rendered in tiny beads of jade. But soon enough 
the girl began to squall, whereupon she was promptly whisked off to bed by her wet nurse. Has there been no word of our Lord Tyrick? her castellan asked as a course of trout was served. None. Tyrick Lannister had vanished during the riots in King's Landing, whilst Jamie himself was still captive at River Run. The boy would be fourteen by now, assuming he was still alive. I let a search myself at Lord Tymon's command, offered Adam Marbrand as he boned his fish, but I found no more than Bywater had before me. The boy was last seen a horse when the press of the mob broke the line of gold cloaks. Afterward, well, his palfrey was found, but not the rider. Most like they pulled him down and slew him. But if that's so, where is his body? The mob let the other corpses lie. Why not his? He would be of more value alive, suggested Strongbore. Any Lannister would bring a hefty ransom. No doubt, Arbrand agreed. Yet no ransom demand was ever made. The boy is simply gone. The boy is dead. Jamie had drunk three cups of wine, and his golden hand seemed to be growing heavier and clumsier by the moment. A hook would serve me just as well. If they realized whom they'd killed, no doubt they'd throw him in the river for fear of my father's wrath. They know the taste of that in King's Landing. Lord Tywin always paid his debts. Always, Strongbore agreed, and that was the end of that. Yet afterward, alone in the tower room he had been offered for the night, Jamie found himself wondering. Tyrick had served King Robert as a squire, side by side with Lancel. Knowledge could be more valuable than gold, more deadly than a dagger. It was Varys he thought of then, smiling and smelling of lavender. The eunuch had agents and informers all over the city. It would have been a simple matter for him to arrange to have Tyrick snatched during the confusion, provided he knew beforehand that the mob was like to riot. And Varys knew all, or so he would have us believe. Yet he gave Cersei no warning of that riot, nor did he ride down to the ships to see Myrcella off. He opened the shutters. The night was growing cold, and a horned moon rode the sky. His hand shone dully in its light. No good for throttling eunuchs, but heavy enough to smash that slimy smile into a fine red ruin. He wanted to hit someone. Jamie found Sir Illyn honing his greatsword. It's time, he told the man. The headsman rose and followed, his cracked leather boots scraping against the steep stone steps as they went down the stair. A small courtyard opened off the armory. Jamie found two shields there, two half-helms, and a pair of blunted tourney swords. He offered one to Payne, and took the other in his left hand as he slid his right through the loops of the shield. His golden fingers were curved enough to hook, but could not grasp, so his hold upon the shield was loose. "'You were a knight once, sir,' Jamie said. "'So was I. Let us see what we are now.' Sir Ellen raised his blade in reply, and Jamie moved at once to the attack. Payne was as rusty as his ringmail, and not so strong as Brienne, yet he met every cut with his own blade, or interposed his shield. They danced beneath the horned moon as the blunted swords sang their steely song. The silent knight was content to let Jamie lead the dance for a while, but finally he began to answer stroke for stroke. Once he shifted to the attack, he caught Jamie on the thigh, on the shoulder, on the forearm. Thrice he made his head ring with cuts to the helm. One slash ripped the shield off his right arm and almost burst the straps that bound his golden hand to his stump. By the time they lowered their swords, he was bruised and battered, but the wine had burned away, and his head was clear. "'We will dance again,' he promised Sir Elin. "'On the morrow, and the morrow, every day we'll dance, till I am as good with my left hand as ever I was with the right.' Sir Elin opened his mouth and made a clacking sound. A laugh, Jamie realized. Something twisted in his gut. Come morning, none of the others was so bold as to make mention of his bruises. Not one of them had heard the sound of swordplay in the night, it would seem. 
Yet when they climbed back down to camp, Little Lou Piper voiced the question the knights and lordings dared not ask. Jamie grinned at him. They have lusty winches in House Hayford. These are love bites, lad. Another bright and blustery day was followed by a cloudy one, then three days of rain. Wind and water made no matter. The column kept its pace, north along the King's Road, and each night Jamie found some private place to win himself more love bites. They fought inside a stable as a one-eyed mule looked on, and in the cellar of an inn amongst the casks of wine and ale. They fought in the blackened shell of a big stone barn, on a wooded island in a shallow stream, and in an open field as the rain pattered softly against their helms and shields. Jamie made excuses for his nightly forays, but he was not so foolish as to think that they were believed. Adam Marbrand knew what he was about, surely, and some of his other captains must have suspected. But no one spoke of it in his hearing. And since the only witness lacked a tongue, he need not fear anyone learning just how inept a swordsman the Kingslayer had become. Soon the signs of war could be seen on every hand. Weeds and thorns and brushy trees grew high as a horse's head in fields where autumn wheat should be ripening. The king's road was bereft of travelers, and wolves ruled the weary world from dusk till dawn. Most of the animals were wary enough to keep their distance, but one of Marbrand's outriders had his horse run off and killed when he dismounted for a piss. No beast would be so bold, declared Sir Bonner for the good, of the stern, sad face. These are demons in the skins of wolves, sent to chastise us for our sins. This must have been an uncommonly sinful horse, Jamie said, standing over what remained of the poor animal. He gave orders for the rest of the carcass to be cut apart and salted down. It might be they would need the meat. At a place called Sow's Horn, they found a tough old knight named Sir Roger Hogg, squatting stubbornly in his tower house with six men-at-arms, four crossbowmen, and a score of peasants. Sir Roger was as big and bristly as his name, and Sir Kenos suggested that he might be some lost crake hall, since their sigil was a brindled boar. Strong boar seemed to believe it, and spent an earnest hour questioning Sir Roger about his ancestors. Jamie was more interested in what Hogg had to say of wolves. They had some trouble with a band of them white star wolves, the old knight told him. They come round sniffing after you, my lord, but we saw them off and buried three down by the turnips. Before them there was a pack of bloody lions, begging your pardon. The one who led them had a manticore on his shield. Sir Amory Lorch, Jamie offered. My lord father commanded him to harry the riverlands. Which we're no part of, Sir Roger Hogg said stoutly. My field is owed to House Hayford, and Lady Ermesand bends her little knee at King's Landing, or will when she's old enough to walk. I told him that, but this lorch wasn't much for listening. He slaughtered half my sheep and three good milk goats, and tried to roast me in my tower. My walls are solid stone and eight feet thick, though, so after his fire burned out he rode off, bored. The wolves come later the ones on four legs. They ate the sheep the manticore left me. I got a few good pelts in recompense, but fur don't fill your belly. What should we do, my lord? Plant, said Jamie, and pray for one last harvest. It was not a hopeful answer, but it was the only one he had. The next day the column crossed the stream that formed the boundary between the lands that did fealty to King's Landing, and those beholden to River Run. Maester Julian consulted a map and announced that these hills were held by the brothers Wode, a pair of landed knights sworn to Heron Hall, but their halls had been earth and timber, and only blackened beams remained of them. No Wodes appeared, nor any of their small folk, though some outlaws had taken shelter in the root cellar beneath the second brother's keep. One of them wore the ruins of a crimson cloak, but Jamie hanged him with the rest. It felt good. This was justice. 
Make a habit of it, Lannister. And one day men might call you Golden Hand after all. Golden Hand the Just. The world grew ever grayer as they drew near to Harrenhal. They rode beneath slate skies, beside waters that shone old and cold as a sheet of beaten steel. Jamie found himself wondering if Brienne might have passed this way before him. If she thought that Sansa Stark had made for River Run, had they encountered other travelers, he might have stopped to ask if any of them had chance to see a pretty maid with auburn hair, or a big ugly one with a face that would curdle milk. But there was no one on the roads but wolves, and their howling held no answers. Across the pewter waters of the lake, the towers of Black Heron's Folly appeared at last, five twisted fingers of black, misshapen stone grasping for the sky. Though Littlefinger had been named the Lord of Harren Hall, he seemed in no great haste to occupy his new seat, so it had fallen to Jamie Lannister to sort out Harren Hall on his way to River Run. That it needed sorting out, he did not doubt. Gregor Clegane had wrested the immense, gloomy castle away from the bloody mummers before Cersei recalled him to King's Landing. No doubt the mountains men were still rattling around inside like so many dried peas in a suit of plate, but they were not ideally suited to restore the king's peace to the trident. The only peace Sir Gregor's lot had ever given anyone was the peace of the grave. Sir Adam's outriders had reported that the gates of Harren Hall were closed and barred. Jamie drew his men up before them and commanded Sir Kenneth of Case to sound the Horn of Herrick black and twisted and banded in old gold. When three blasts had echoed off the walls, they heard the groan of iron hinges and the gates swung slowly open. So thick were the walls of Black Heron's folly that Jamie passed beneath a dozen murder holes before emerging into sudden sunlight in the yard where he'd bid farewell to the bloody mummers not so long ago. Weeds were spouting from the hard-packed earth and flies buzzed about the carcass of a horse. A handful of Sir Gregor's men emerged from the towers to watch him dismount. Hard-eyed, hard-mouthed men, the lot of them. They would have to be, to ride beside the mountain. About the best that could be said for Gregor's men was that they were not quite as vile and violent a bunch as the brave companions. "'Fuck me, Jamie Lannister!' blurted one grey and grizzled man-at-arms. It's the bleeding Kingslayer, boys. Fuck me with a spear. Who might you be? Jimmy asked. Sir, you used to call me Shitmouth, if it please my lord. He spit in his hands and wiped his cheeks with them, as if that would somehow make him more presentable. Charming, do you command here? Me? Shit, no, my lord. Bugger me with a bloody spear. Shitmouth had enough crumbs in his beard to feed the garrison. Jamie had to laugh. The man took that for encouragement. Bugger me with a bloody spear, he said again, and started laughing too. You heard the man, Jamie said to Ellen Payne. Find a nice long spear and shove it up his arse. Sir Ellen did not have a spear, but beardless John Betley was glad to toss him one. Shitmouth's drunken laughter stopped abruptly. You keep that bloody thing away from me. Make up your mind, said Jamie. Who has the command here? Did Sir Gregor name a castellan? Poliver, another man said. Only the hound killed him, my lord. Him and the tickler both, and that Sarsfield boy. The hound again. You know it was Sandor? You saw him? Not us, my lord. That innkeep told us. It happened at the Crossroads Inn, my lord. The speaker was a younger man with a mop of sandy hair. He wore the chain of coins that had once belonged to Vargo Hoat, coins from half a hundred distant cities, silver and gold, copper and bronze, square coins and round coins, triangles and rings and bits of bone. The innkeep swore the man had one side of his face all burned. His horrors told the same tale. Sander had some boy with him, a ragged peasant lad. They hacked Polly and the tickler to bloody bits and rode off down the trident, we were told. 
Did you send men after them? Shitmouth frowned, as if the thought were painful. No, my lord. Fuck us all, we never did. When a dog goes mad, you cut his throat. Well, the man said, rubbing his mouth, I never much liked Polly, that shit. And the dog, he were Sir's brother, so... We're bad, my lord, broke in the man who wore the coins. But you need to be mad to face the hound. Jamie looked him over, bolder than the rest, and not as drunk as Shitmouth. You were afraid of him? I wouldn't say afraid, my lord. I'd say we was leaving him for our betters. Someone like Sir, or you. Me, when I had two hands. Jamie did not delude himself. Sandy would make short work of him now. You have a name? Rafford, if it pleases. Most call me Raff. Raff, gather the garrison together in the hall of a hundred hearths. Your captives as well. I want to see them. Those whores from the crossroads, too. Oh, and Hoot. I was distraught to hear that he had died. I'd like to look upon his head. When they brought it to him, he found that the goat's lips had been sliced off, along with his ears and most of his nose. The crows had supped upon his eyes. It was still recognizably Hoat, however. Jamie would have known his beard anywhere. An absurd rope of hair two feet long, dangling from a pointed chin. Elsewise, only a few leathery strips of flesh still clung to Kohorik's skull. "'Where is the rest of him?' he asked. No one wanted to tell him. Finally, Shitmouth lowered his eyes and muttered, Rotted, sir, and et. One of the captives was always begging food, Rafford admitted, so sir said to give him roast goat. The Kohoric didn't have much meat on him, though. Sir took his hands and feet first, then his arms and legs. The fat bugger got most, my lord, Shitmouth offered, but sir, he said to see that all the captives had a taste, and hoped, too, his own self. That horse and a slobber, when we fed him, and the grease had run down into that skinny beard of his. Father, Jamie thought, your dogs have both gone mad. He found himself remembering tales he had first heard as a child at Casterly Rock of mad Lady Lothston, who bathed in tubs of blood and presided over feasts of human flesh within these very walls. Somehow, Revenge had lost its savor. Take this and throw it in the lake. Jamie tossed Holt's head to Peck and turned to address the garrison. Until such time as Lord Peter arrives to claim his seat, Sir Bonifer Hasty shall hold Harren Hall in the name of the Crown. Those of you who wish may join him if he'll have you. The rest will ride with me to River Run. The mountain's men looked at one another. "'We are owed,' said one. "'Sir promised us. Rich rewards,' he said. "'His very words,' Shitmouth agreed. "'Rich rewards for them as rides with me.' A dozen others began to yammer their assent. Sir Bonifer raised a gloved hand. "'Any man who remains with me shall have a hide of land to work.' a second hide when he takes a wife, a third at the birth of his first child. Land, sir, Shitmouth spat. Piss on that. If we wanted to grub in the bloody dirt, we could have bloody well stayed home, begging your pardon, sir. Rich rewards, sir said, meaning gold. If you have a grievance, go to King's Landing and take it up with my sweet sister. Jamie turned to Rafford. I'll see those captives now, starting with Sir Willis Manderley. He the fat one? asked Rafford. I devoutly hope so. And tell me no sad stories of how he died, or the lot of you are apt to do the same. Any hopes you might have nursed of finding Shagwell, Pig, or Zollo languishing in the dungeons were sadly disappointed. The brave companions had abandoned Vargo Hote to a man, it would seem. Of Lady Wentz's people, only three remained. 
the cook who had opened the postern gate for Sir Gregor, a bent-back armorer called Ben Blackthumb, and a girl named Pia, who was not near as pretty as she had been when Jamie saw her last. Someone had broken her nose and knocked out half her teeth. The girl fell at Jamie's feet when she saw him, sobbing and clinging to his leg with hysterical strength, till Strongbore pulled her off. "'No one will hurt you now,' he told her, but that only made her sob the louder. The other captives had been better treated. Sir Willis Manderley was amongst them, along with several other high-born Northmen taken prisoner by the mountain that rides in the fighting at the fords of the Trident. Useful hostages, all worth a goodly ransom. They were ragged, filthy, and shaggy to a man, and some had fresh bruises, cracked teeth, and missing fingers. But their wounds had been washed and bandaged, and none of them had gone hungry. Jimmy wondered if they had any inkling what they had been eating, and decided it was better not to inquire. None had any defiance left, especially not Sir Willis, a bushy-faced tub of suet with dull eyes and sallow, sagging jowls. When Jamie told him that he would be escorted to Maidenpool and there put on a ship for White Harbor, Sir Willis collapsed into a puddle on the floor and sobbed longer and louder than Pia had. It took four men to lift him back onto his feet. Too much roast goat, Jamie reflected. Gods, but I hate this bloody castle. Harren Hall had seen more horror in its three hundred years than Casterly Rock had witnessed in three thousand. Jamie commanded that fires be lit in the hall of a hundred hearths, and sent the cook hobbling back to the kitchens to prepare a hot meal for the men of his column. Anything but goat. He took his own supper in Hunter's Hall with Sir Boniface Hasty, a solemn stork of a man, prone to salting his speech with appeals to the seven. "'I want none of Sir Gregor's followers,' he declared, as he was cutting up a pear as withered as he was, so as to make certain that its non-existent juice did not stain his pristine purple doublet, embroidered with the white bend cottage of his house. "'I will not have such sinners in my service.' My septon used to say all men were sinners. "'He was not wrong,' Sir Bonifer allowed, but some sins are blacker than others, and fouler in the nostrils of the seven. And you have no more nose than my little brother, or my own sins would have you choking on that pair. Very well, I'll take Gregor's lot off your hands. He could always find a use for fighters. If nothing else, he could send them up the ladders first, should he need to storm the walls of River Run. Take the whore as well, Sir Bonifer urged. You know the one, the girl from the dungeons. Pia. The last time he had been here, Kyburn had sent the girl to his bed, thinking that would please him. But the Pia they had brought up from the dungeons was a different creature from the sweet, simple, giggly creature who'd crawled beneath his blankets. She had made the mistake of speaking when Sir Gregor wanted quiet, so the mountain had smashed her teeth to splinters with a mailed fist and broken her pretty little nose as well. He would have done worse, no doubt, if Circe had not called him down to King's Landing to face the Red Viper's spear. Jamie would not mourn him. Pia was born in this castle, he told Sir Bonifer. It is the only home she has ever known. She is a font of corruption, said Sir Bonifer. I won't have her near my men, flaunting her parts. I expect her flaunting days are done, he said. But if you find her that objectionable, I'll take her. He could make her a washerwoman, he supposed. His squires did not mind raising his tent, grooming his horse, or cleaning his armor, but the task of caring for his clothes struck them as unmanly. Can you hold Harren Hall with just your holy hundred? Jamie asked. They should actually be called the Holy Eighty-Six, having lost fourteen men upon the Blackwater, but no doubt Sir Bonifer would fill up his ranks again as soon as he found some sufficiently pious recruits. "'I anticipate no difficulty. The crone will light our way, and the warrior will give strength to our arms. Or else the stranger will turn up for the whole holy lot of you.' Jamie could not be certain who had convinced his sister that Sir Bonifer should be named Castellan of Harrenhal, but the appointment smelled of Orton Merriweather. 
Hasty had once served Mary with his grandsire, he seemed to recall dimly, and the carrot-haired justice here was just the sort of simple-minded fool to assume that someone called the good was the very potion the Riverlands required to heal the wounds left by Roos Bolton, Wargo Holt, and Gregor Clegane. But he might not be wrong. Hasty hailed from the Stormlands, so had neither friends nor foes along the Trident. No blood feuds, no debts to pay, no cronies to reward. He was sober, just, and dutiful, and his holy eighty-six were as well disciplined as any soldiers in the Seven Kingdoms, and made a lovely sight as they wheeled and pranced their tall grey geldings. Littlefinger had once quipped that Sir Bonifer must have gelded the riders, too, so spotless was their repute. All the same, Jamie wondered about any soldiers who were better known for their lovely horses than for the foes they'd slain. They pray well, I suppose, but can they fight? They had not disgraced themselves on the Blackwater, so far as he knew, but they had not distinguished themselves either. Sir Bonifer himself had been a promising knight in his youth, but something had happened to him, a defeat or a disgrace or a near brush with death, and afterward he had decided that jousting was an empty vanity and put away his lance for good and all. Harrenhal must be held, though, and Bader Butthole here is the man that Circe chose to hold it. This castle has an ill repute, he warned him, and one that's well deserved. It's said that Harren and his sons still walk the halls by night, a fire. Those who look upon them burst into flame. I fear no shade, sir. It is written in the seven-pointed star that spirits, whites, and revenants cannot harm a pious man so long as he is armored in his faith. Then arm yourself in faith by all means, but wear a suit of mail and plate as well. Every man who holds this castle seems to come to a bad end. The mountain, the goat, even my father. If you will forgive my saying so, they were not godly men, as we are. The warrior defends us, and help is always near, if some dread foe should threaten. Maester Julian will be remaining with his ravens, Lord Lancel is nearby at Darry with his garrison, and Lord Randall holds Maidenpool. Together we three shall hunt down and destroy whatever outlaws prowl these parts. Once that is done, the seven will guide the good folk back to their villages to plough and plant and build anew. The ones the goat didn't kill, at least. Jamie hooked his golden fingers round the stem of his wine goblet. If any of Holt's brave companions fall into your hands, send word to me at once. The stranger might have made off with the goat before Jamie could get around to him, but Fat Zola was still out there, with Shagwell, Rorge, faithful Erswick, and the rest. So you can torture them and kill them? I suppose you would forgive them in my place? If they made sincere repentance for their sins, yes, I would embrace them all as brothers and pray with them before I sent them to the block. Sins may be forgiven. Crimes require punishment. Hasty folded his hands before him like a steeple, in a way that reminded Jamie uncomfortably of his father. If it is Sandor Clegane that we encounter, what would you have me do? Pray hard, Jamie thought, and run. Send him to join his beloved brother, and be glad the gods made seven hells. One would never be enough to hold both of the Cleganes. He pushed himself awkwardly to his feet. Beric Dondarrion is a different matter. Should you capture him, hold him for my return. I'll want to march him back to King's Landing with a rope about his neck, and have Sir Illyn take his head off where half the realm can see. And this merish priest who runs with him? It is said he spreads his false faith everywhere. Kill him, kiss him, or pray with him as you please. I have no wish to kiss the man, my lord. No doubt he'd say the same of you. Jamie's smile turned into a yawn. My pardons, I shall take my leave of you, if you have no objections. None, my lord. 
said Hasty. No doubt he wished to pray. Jamie wished to fight. He took the steps two at a time, out to where the night air was cold and crisp. In the torch-lit yard, Strong Boar and Sir Flemont Brax were having at each other, whilst a ring of men-at-arms cheered them on. Sir Lyle will have the best of that one, he knew. I need to find Sir Illin. His fingers had the itch again. His footsteps took him away from the noise and the light. He passed beneath the covered bridge and through the flowstone yard before he realized where he was headed. As he neared the bear pit, he saw the glow of a lantern, its pale wintry light washing over the tiers of steep stone seats. Someone has come before me, it would seem. The pit would be a fine place to dance. Perhaps Sir Ellen had anticipated him. But the knight standing over the pit was bigger. A husky, bearded man in a red and white surcoat adorned with griffins. Cunnington! What's he doing here? Below, the carcass of the bear still sprawled upon the sands, though only bones and ragged fur remained, half buried. Jamie felt a pang of pity for the beast. At least he died in battle. Sir Ronnet, he called. Have you lost your way? It is a large castle, I know. Red Ronnet raised his lantern. I wished to see where the bear danced with a maiden not so fair. His beard shone in the light as if it were a fire. Jamie could smell wine on his breath. Is it true the wench fought naked? Naked? No. He wondered how that wrinkle had been added to the story. The mummers put her in a pink silk gown and shoved a tourney sword into her hand. The goat wanted her death to be a moothing. Elsewise, the sight of Brienne naked might have made the bear flee in terror. Connington laughed. Jamie did not. You speak as if you know the lady. I was betrothed to her. That took him by surprise. Brienne had never mentioned a betrothal. Her father made a match for her. Thrice, said Connington. I was the second. My father's notion. I had heard the wench was ugly, and I told him so, but he said all women were the same once you blew the candle out. Your father. Jimmy eyed Red Runnet's surcoat, where two griffins faced each other on a field of red and white. Dancing griffins. Our late hands. Brother, was he? Cousin. Lord John had no brothers. No. It all came back to him. John Connington had been Prince Rager's friend. When Merriweather failed so dismally to contain Robert's rebellion, and Prince Rager could not be found, Ares had turned to the next best thing and raised Connington to the handship. But the Mad King was always chopping off his hands. He had chopped Lord John after the Battle of the Bells, stripping him of honors, lands, and wealth, and packing him off across the sea to die in exile, where he soon drank himself to death. The cousin, though, Red Ronnet's father, had joined the rebellion and been rewarded with Griffin's Roost after the trident. He only got the castle, though. Robert kept the gold and bestowed the greater part of the Connington lands on more fervent supporters. Sir Ronnet was a landed knight no more. For any such, the maid of Tarth would have been a sweet plum indeed. "'How is it that you did not wed?' Jamie asked him. "'Why, I went to Tarth and saw her. I had six years on her, yet the wench could look me in the eye. She was a sow in silk, though most sows have bigger teeth. When she tried to talk, she almost choked on her own tongue. I gave her a rose and told her it was all that she would ever have from me. Connington glanced into the pit. The bear was less hairy than that freak I'll— Jamie's golden hand cracked him across the mouth so hard the other night went stumbling down the steps. His lantern fell and smashed and the oil spread out, burning. You are speaking of a high-born lady, sir. Call her by her name. Call her Brienne. Connington edged away from the spreading flames on his hands and knees. Brienne, if it please, my lord. He spat a glob of blood at Jamie's foot. 
Rhiannu the Beauty, Circe. It was a slow climb to the top of Visenya's hill. As the horses labored upward, the queen leaned back against the plump red cushion. From outside came the voice of Sir Osmond Kettleblack. Make way! Clear the street! Make way for Her Grace the Queen! Marjorie does keep a lively court, Lady Merriweather was saying. We have jugglers, mummers, poets, puppets. Singers? prompted Circe. Many and more, Your Grace. Hamish the Harper plays for her once a fortnight, and sometimes Alaric of Ison will entertain us of an evening. But the Blue Bard is her favorite. Circe recalled the bard from Toman's wedding. Young and fair to look upon. Could there be something there? There are other men as well, I hear. Knights and courtiers, admirers. Tell me true, my lady, do you think Marjorie is still a maiden? She says she is, Your Grace. So she does. What do you say? Tana's black eyes sparkled with mischief. When she wed Lord Renly at Highgarden, I helped disrobe him for the bedding. His lordship was a well-made man, and lusty. I saw the proof when we tumbled him into the wedding bed, where his bride awaited him as naked as her name day, blushing prettily beneath the coverlets. Sir Loris had carried her up the steps himself. Marjorie may say that the marriage was never consummated, that Lord Renly had drunk too much wine at the wedding feast, but I promise you the bit between his legs was anything but weary when last I saw it. Did you chance to see the marriage bed the morning after? Circe asked. Did she bleed? No sheet was shown, Your Grace. A pity. Still, the absence of a bloody sheet meant little by itself. Common peasant girls bled like pigs upon their wedding nights. She had heard. But that was less true of high-born maids like Marjorie Tyrell. A lord's daughter was more like to give her maidenhead to a horse than a husband, it was said, and Marjorie had been riding since she was old enough to walk. I understand the little queen has many admirers amongst our household knights. The red wine twins, Sir Talad. Who else, pray tell? Lady Merriweather gave a shrug. Sir Lambert, the fool who hides a good eye behind a patch. Bad Norcross, Courtney Greenhill. The brothers Woodwright, sometimes Portifer and often Lucantine. Oh, and Grand Maester Pissell is a frequent visitor. Pissell, truly? Had that doddering old worm forsaken the lion for the rose? If so, he will regret it. Who else? The summer islander in his feathered cloak. How could I have forgotten him, with his skin as black as ink? Others come to pay court to her cousins. Eleanor is promised to the Ambrose boy, but loves to flirt. And Mega has a new suitor every fortnight. Once she kissed a potboy in the kitchen. I have heard talk of her marrying Lady Bulwer's brother, but if Mega were to choose for herself, she would sooner have Mark Mullendore, I am certain. Circe laughed. The butterfly knight who lost his arm on the black water? What good is half a man? Mega thinks him sweet. She has asked Lady Marjorie to help her find a monkey for him. A monkey? The Queen did not know what to say to that. Sparrows and monkeys. Truly the realm is going mad. What of our brave Sir Loras? How often does he call upon his sister? More than any of the others. When Tana frowned, a tiny crease appeared between her dark eyes. Every morn and every night he visits, unless duty interferes. Her brother is devoted to her. They share everything with... Oh! For a moment the mirish woman looked almost shocked. Then a smile spread across her face. I have had a most wicked thought, Your Grace. Best keep it to yourself. The hill is thick with sparrows, and we all know how sparrows abhor wickedness. I have heard they abhor soap and water, too, Your Grace. 
Perhaps too much prayer robs a man of his sense of smell. I shall be sure to ask his high holiness. The draperies swayed back and forth in a wash of crimson silk. Orton told me that the High Septon has no name, Lady Tainer said. Can that be true? In Mir we all have names. Oh, he had a name once. They all do. The Queen waved a hand dismissively. Even Septons born of noble blood go only by their given names once they have taken their vows. When one of them is elevated to High Septon, he puts aside that name as well. The faith will tell you he no longer has any need of a man's name, for he has become the avatar of the gods. How do you distinguish one high septon from another? With difficulty. One has to say the fat one, or the one before the fat one, or the old one who died in his sleep. You can always winkle out their birth names if you like, but they take umbrage if you use them. It reminds them that they were born ordinary men and they do not like that. My lord husband tells me this new one was born with filth beneath his fingernails. So I suspect. As a rule, the most devout elevate one of their own, but there have been exceptions. Grandmaster Pissell had informed her of the history at tedious length. During the reign of King Baylor, the Blessed, a simple stonemason was chosen as High Septon. He worked stone so beautifully that Baylor decided he was the smith reborn in mortal flesh. The man could neither read nor write, nor recall the words of the simplest of prayers. Some still claimed that Baylor's hand had the man poisoned to spare the realm embarrassment. After that one died, an eight-year-old boy was elevated, once more at King Baylor's urging. The boy worked miracles, his grace declared though even his little healing hands could not save Bela during his final fast. Lady Merriweather gave a laugh. Eight years old? Perhaps my son could be High Septon. He is almost seven. Does he pray a lot? the Queen asked. He prefers to play with swords. A real boy, then. Can he name all seven gods? I think so. I shall have to take him under consideration. Cersei did not doubt that there were any number of boys who would do more honor to the crystal crown than the wretch on whom the most devout had chosen to bestow it. This is what comes of letting fools and cowards rule themselves. Next time I will choose their master for them. And the next time might not be long in coming, if the new High Septon continued to annoy her. Baylor's hand had little to teach Cersei Lannister where such matters were concerned. Clear the way, Sir Osmond Kettleblack was shouting. Make way for the Queen's grace. The letter began to slow, which could only mean that they were near the top of the hill. You should bring this son of yours to court, Cersei told Lady Merriweather. Six is not too young. Tolman needs other boys about him. Why not your son? Joffrey had never had a close friend of his own age that she recalled. The poor boy was always alone. I had Jamie when I was a child, and Milara until she fell into the well. Joff had been fond of the hound, to be sure, but that was not friendship. He was looking for the father he never found in Robert. A little foster brother might be just what Toman needs to wean him away from Marjorie and her hens. In time they might grow as close as Robert and his boyhood friend Ned Stark. A fool, but a loyal fool. Tommen will have need of loyal friends to watch his back. Your grace is kind, but Russell has never known any home but Longtable. I fear he would be lost in this great city. In the beginning, the queen allowed, but he will soon outgrow that, as I did. When my father sent for me to court, I wept, and Jamie raged, until my aunt sat me down in the stone garden and told me there was no one in King's Landing that I need ever fear. You are a lioness, she said, and it is for all the lesser beasts to fear you. Your son will find his courage, too. Surely you would prefer to have him close at hand, where you could see him every day? He is your only child, is he not? For the present, 
My lord husband has asked the gods to bless us with another son, in case— I know. She thought of Joffrey, clawing at his neck. In his last moments he had looked to her in desperate appeal, and a sudden memory had stopped her heart. A drop of red blood hissing in a candle flame, a croaking voice that spoke of crowns and shrouds, of death at the hands of the Valonqar. Outside the litter, Sir Osmond was shouting something, and someone was shouting back. The litter jerked to a halt. "'Are you all dead?' roared Kettleblack. "'Get out of the bloody way!' The Queen pulled back a corner of the curtain and beckoned to Sir Merrin Trant. "'What seems to be the trouble?' "'The sparrows, Your Grace.' Sir Merrin wore white-scale armor beneath his cloak. His helm and shield were slung from his saddle. "'Camping in the street. We'll make the move.' "'Do that, but gently. I do not care to be caught up in another riot.' Cersei let the curtain fall. This is absurd. It is, Your Grace, Lady Merriwether agreed. The High Septon should have come to you. And these wretched sparrows, he feeds them, coddles them, blesses them, yet will not bless the king. The blessing was an empty ritual she knew, but rituals and ceremonies had power in the eyes of the ignorant. Aegon the Conqueror himself had dated the start of his realm from the day the High Septon anointed him in Old Town. This wretched priest will obey, or learn how weak and human he still is. Orton says it is the gold he really wants, that he means to withhold his blessing until the crown resumes its payments. The faith will have its gold as soon as we have peace. Septon Torbert and Septon Raynard had been most understanding of her plight, unlike the wretched Bravosi, who had hounded poor Lord Giles so mercilessly that he had taken to his bed, coughing up blood. We had to have those ships. She could not rely upon the arbor for her navy. The red wines were too close to the Tyrells. She needed her own strength at sea. The Dormans rising on the river would give her that. Her flagship would dip twice as many oars as King Robert's hammer. Orain had asked her leave to name her Lord Tywin, which Circe had been pleased to grant. She looked forward to hearing men speak of her father as a she. Another of the ships would be named Sweet Circe, and would bear a gilded figurehead carved in her likeness, clad in mail and lion helm, with spear in hand. Brave Joffrey, Lady Joanna, and Lioness would follow her to sea, along with Queen Marjorie, Golden Rose, Lord Renly, Lady Olenna, and Princess Myrcella. The Queen had made the mistake of telling Toman he might name the last five. He had actually chosen Moon Boy for one. Only when Lord Orain suggested that men might not want to serve on a ship named for a fool had the boy reluctantly agreed to honor his sister instead. If this ragged septon thinks to make me buy Toman's blessing, he will soon learn better, she told Taina. The queen did not intend to truckle to a pack of priests. The litter halted yet again, so suddenly that Circe jerked. Oh, this is infuriating! She leaned out once more and saw that they had reached the top of Visenya's hill. Ahead loomed the great sept of Baylor, with its magnificent dome and seven shining towers, but between her and the marble steps lay a sullen sea of humanity, brown and ragged and unwashed. Sparrows, she thought, sniffing, though no sparrows had ever smelled so rank. Circe was appalled. Kyburn had brought her reports of their numbers, but hearing about them was one thing and seeing them another. Hundreds were encamped upon the plaza, hundreds more in the gardens. Their cook-fires filled the air with smoke and stinks. Rough-spun tents and miserable hovels made of mud and scrap wood besmirched the pristine white marble. They were even huddled on the steps, beneath the great sept's towering doors. Sir Osmond came trotting back to her. Beside him rode Sir Osfred, mounted on a stallion as golden as his cloak. Osfred was the middle kettle-black, quieter than his siblings, more apt to scowl than smile. And crueler as well. 
if the tales are true. Perhaps I should have sent him to the wall. Grandmaster Pissell had wanted an older man, more seasoned in the ways of war, to command the gold cloaks, and several of her other counsellors had agreed with him. Sir Osfrid is seasoned quite sufficiently, she had told them, but even that did not shut them up. They yap at me like a pack of small, annoying dogs. Her patience with Pissell had all but run its course. He had even had the temerity to object to her sending to Dorne for a master-at-arms, on the grounds that it might offend the Tyrells. "'Why do you think I'm doing it?' she had asked him scornfully. "'Beg pardon, Your Grace,' said Sir Osmond. "'My brother's summoning more gold cloaks. We'll clear a path, never fear. I do not have the time. I will continue on afoot.' "'Please, Your Grace,' Tana caught her arm. "'They frighten me. There are hundreds of them, and so dirty.' Circe kissed her cheek. "'The lion does not fear the sparrow. But it is good of you to care. I know you love me well, my lady. Sir Osmond, kindly help me down. If I had known I was going to have to walk, I would have dressed for it.' She wore a white gown, slashed with cloth of gold, lacy but demure. It had been several years since the last time she had donned it, and the Queen found it uncomfortably tight about the middle. Sir Osmond, Sir Merrin, you will accompany me. Sir Osfrid, see that my letter comes to no harm. Some of the sparrows looked gaunt and hollow-eyed enough to eat her horses. As she made her way through the ragged throng, past their cook-fires, wagons, and crude shelters, the Queen found herself remembering another crowd that had once gathered on this plaza. The day she wed Robert Baratheon, thousands had turned out to cheer for them. All the women wore their best, and half the men had children on their shoulders. When she had emerged from inside the sept, hand in hand with the young king, the crowd sent up a roar so loud it could be heard in Lannisport. "'They like you well, my lady,' Robert whispered in her ear. "'See? Every face is smiling.' For that one short moment she had been happy in her marriage until she chanced to glance at Jamie. No, she remembered thinking, not every face, my lord. No one was smiling now. The looks the sparrows gave her were dull, sullen, hostile. They made way, but reluctantly. If they were truly sparrows, a shout would send them flying. A hundred gold cloaks with staves and swords and maces could clear this rabble quick enough. That was what Lord Tywin would have done. He would have ridden over them instead of walking through. When she saw what they had done to Bela the Beloved, the Queen had cause to rue her soft heart. The great marble statue that had smiled serenely over the plaza for a hundred years was waist-deep in a heap of bones and skulls. Some of the skulls had scraps of flesh still clinging to them. A crow sat atop one such, enjoying a dry, leathery feast. Flies were everywhere. "'What is the meaning of this?' Circe demanded of the crowd. "'Do you mean to bury blessed Bader in a mountain of carrion?' A one-legged man stepped forward, leaning on a wooden crutch. "'Your Grace, these are the bones of holy men and women, murdered for their faith. Septons, septers, brothers brown and dun and green—' Sisters white and blue and gray. Some were hanged, some disemboweled. Septs have been despoiled. Maidens and mothers raped by godless men and demon worshippers. Even silent sisters have been molested. The mother above cries out in her anguish. We have brought their bones here from all over the realm to bear witness to the agony of the holy faith. Circe could feel the weight of eyes upon her. The king shall know of these atrocities, she answered solemnly. Toman will share your outrage. This is the work of Stannis and his red witch, and the savage Northmen who worship trees and wolves. She raised her voice. Good people, your dead shall be avenged. A few cheered, but only a few. We ask no vengeance for our dead said the one-legged man. 
only protection for the living, for the septs and holy places. The iron throne must defend the faith, growled a hawking lout with a seven-pointed star painted on his brow. A king who does not protect his people is no king at all. Mutters of assent went up from those around him. One man had the temerity to grasp Sir Merrin by the wrist and say, It is time for all anointed knights to forsake their worldly masters and defend our holy faith. Stand with us, sir, if you love the seven. Unhand me, said Sir Merrin, wrenching free. I hear you, Circe said. My son is young, but he loves the seven well. You shall have his protection and mine own. The man with the star upon his brow was not appeased. The warrior will defend us, he said. Not this fat boy king. Merrin Trent reached for his sword, but Circe stopped him before he could unsheath it. She had only two knights amidst the sea of sparrows. She saw staves and scythes, cudgels and clubs, several axes. I will have no blood shed in this holy place, sir. Why are all men such children? Cut him down, and the rest will tear us limb from limb. We are all the mother's children. Come, his high holiness awaits us. But as she made her way through the press to the steps of the sept, a gaggle of armed men stepped out to block the doors. They wore mail and boiled leather, with here and there a bit of dinted plate. Some had spears, and some had long swords, more favored axes, and had sewn red stars upon their bleached white surcoats. Two had the insolence to cross their spears and bar her way. "'Is this how you receive your queen?' she demanded of them. "'Pray, where are Reynard and Torbert?' It was not like those two to miss a chance to fawn on her. Torbert always made a show of getting down on his knees to wash her feet. "'I do not know the man you speak of,' said one of the men with the red star in his surcoat. But if they are of the faith, no doubt the seven had need of their service. Septon Reynard and Septon Torbert are of the most devout, Circe said, and will be furious to learn that you obstructed me. Do you mean to deny me entrance to Baylor's holy sept? Your grace, said a greybeard with a stooped shoulder, you are welcome here. But your men must leave their sword belts. No weapons are allowed within, by command of the High Septon. Knights of the King's Guard do not set aside their swords, not even in the presence of the King. In the King's house, the King's word must rule, replied the aged knight. But this is the house of the gods. Color rose to her cheeks. One word to Marin Trant, and the stoop-backed greybeard would be meeting his gods sooner than he might have liked. Not here, though. Not now. Wait for me, she told the king's guard curtly. Alone, she climbed the steps. The spearmen uncrossed their spears. Two other men put their weight against the doors, and with a great groan they swung apart. In the hall of lamps, Circe found a score of septons on their knees, but not in prayer. They had pails of soap and water, and were scrubbing at the floor. Their rough-spun robes and sandals led Circe to take them for sparrows, until one raised his head. His face was red as a beet, and there were broken blisters on his hands, bleeding. "'Your Grace!' "'Septon Reynard?' The Queen could scarce believe what she was seeing. What are you doing on your knees? He is cleaning the floor. The speaker was shorter than the queen by several inches, and as thin as a broom handle. Work is a form of prayer, most pleasing to the smith. He stood, scrub brush in hand. Your Grace, we have been expecting you. The man's beard was gray and brown, and closely trimmed. His hair tied up in a hard knot, behind his head. Though his robes were clean, they were frayed and patched as well. He had rolled his sleeves up his elbows as he scrubbed, but below the knees the cloth was soaked and sodden. His face was sharply pointed, 
with deep-set eyes as brown as mud. His feet are bare, she saw with dismay. They were hideous as well, hard and horny things, thick with callous. You are his high holiness? We are. Father, give me strength. The queen knew that she should kneel, but the floor was wet with soap and dirty water, and she did not wish to ruin her gown. She glanced over at the old men on their knees. I do not see my friend Septon Torbert. Septon Torbert has been confined to a penitent cell on bread and water. It is sinful for any man to be so plump when half the realm is starving. Circe had suffered quite enough for one day. She let him see her anger. Is this how you greet me, with a scrub brush in your hand, dripping water? Do you know who I am? Your grace is the queen regent of the seven kingdoms, the man said. But in the seven-pointed star it is written that as men bow to their lords and lords to their kings, so kings and queens must bow before the seven who are one. Is he telling me to kneel? If so, he did not know her very well. By rights you should have met me on the steps in your finest robes, with a crystal crown upon your head. We have no crown, your grace. Her frown deepened. My lord father gave your predecessor a crown of rare beauty, wrought in crystal and spun gold. And for that gift we honor him in our prayers, the high septon said. But the poor need food in their bellies more than we need gold and crystal on our head. That crown has been sold. So have the others in our vaults, and all our rings, and our robes of cloth of gold and cloth of silver. Wool will keep a man as warm. That is why the seven gave us sheep. He is utterly mad. The most devout must have been mad as well, to elevate this creature. Mad, or terrified of the beggars at their doors. Kyburn's whisperers claimed that Septon Lucian had been nine votes from elevation when those doors had given way, and the sparrows came pouring into the great sept with their leader on their shoulders and their axes in their hands. She fixed the small man with an icy stare. Is there some place where we may speak more privily, Your Holiness? The High Septon surrendered his scrub brush to one of the most devout. If Your Grace will follow us? He led her through the inner doors into the sept proper. Their footsteps echoed off the marble floor. Dust motes swam in the beams of colored light slanting down through the leaded glass of the great dome. Incense sweetened the air, and beside the seven altars candles shone like stars. A thousand twinkled for the mother, and near as many for the maid. But you could count the stranger's candles on two hands and still have fingers left. Even here the sparrows had invaded. A dozen scruffy hedge knights were kneeling before the warrior, beseeching him to bless the swords they had piled at his feet. At the mother's altar a septon was leading a hundred sparrows in prayer, their voices as distant as waves upon the shore. The high septon led Circe to where the crone raised her lantern. When he knelt before the altar she had no choice but to kneel beside him. Mercifully this high septon was not as long-winded as the fat one had been. I should be grateful for that much, I suppose. His high holiness made no move to rise when his prayer was done. It would seem they must confer upon their knees. A small man's ploy, she thought, amused. High holiness, she said, these sparrows are frightening the city. I want them gone. Where should they go, your grace? There are seven hills. Any one of them will serve. Back where they came from, I would imagine. They came from everywhere. As the sparrow is the humblest and most common of the birds, they are the humblest and most common of men. They are common. We agree on that much. Have you seen what they have done to Blessed Baylor's statue? They befound the plaza with their pigs and goats and night soil. Night soil can be washed away more easily than blood, Your Grace. 
If the plaza was befouled, it was befouled by the execution that was done here. He dares throw Ned Stark in my face? We all regret that. Joffrey was young, and not as wise as he might have been. Lord Stark should have been beheaded elsewhere, out of respect for Blessed Baylor. But the man was a traitor, let us not forget. King Baylor forgave those who conspired against him. King Baylor imprisoned his own sisters, whose only crime was being beautiful. The first time Circe heard that tale, she had gone to Tyrion's nursery and pinched the little monster till he cried. I should have pinched his nose shut and stuffed my sock into his mouth. She forced herself to smile. King Tommen will forgive the sparrows, too, once they have returned to their homes. Most have lost their homes. Suffering is everywhere, and grief and death. Before coming to King's Landing, I tended to half a hundred little villages too small to have a septon of their own. I walked from each one to the next, performing marriages, absolving sinners of their sins, naming newborn children. Those villages are no more, Your Grace. Weeds and thorns grow where gardens once flourished, and bones litter the roadsides. War is a dreadful thing. These atrocities are the work of the Northmen, and of Lord Stannis and his demon worshippers. Some of my sparrows speak of bands of lions who despoiled them, and of the hound, who was your own sworn man. At Saltpans he slew an aged septon, and despoiled a girl of twelve, an innocent child promised to the faith. He wore his armor as he raped her, and her tender flesh was torn and crushed by his iron mail. When he was done, he gave her to his men, who cut off her nose and nipples. His grace cannot be held responsible for the crimes of every man who ever served House Lannister. Sandor Clegane is a traitor and a brute. Why do you think I dismissed him from our service? He fights for the outlaw Beric Dondarrion now, not for King Tommen. As you say. Yet it must be asked, Where were the king's knights when these things were being done? Did not Jaehaerys the conciliator once swear upon the iron throne itself that the crown would always protect and defend the faith? Cersei had no idea what Jaehaerys the conciliator might have sworn. He did, she agreed, and the High Septon blessed him and anointed him as king. It is traditional for every new High Septon to give the king his blessing, and yet you have refused to bless King Tommen. Your grace is mistaken. We have not refused. You have not come. The hour is not yet ripe. Are you a priest? Or a greengrocer. And what might I do to make it riper? If he dares mention gold, I will deal with this one as I did the last, and find a pious eight-year-old to wear the crystal crown. The realm is full of kings. For the faith to exalt one above the rest, we must be certain. Three hundred years ago, when Aegon the dragon landed beneath this very hill, the High Septon locked himself within the starry sept of old town and prayed for seven days and seven nights, taking no nourishment but bread and water. When he emerged, he announced that the faith would not oppose Aegon and his sisters, for the crone had lifted up her lamp to show him what lay ahead. If old town took up arms against the dragon, old town would burn, and the high tower and the citadel and the starry sept would be cast down and destroyed. Lord Hightower was a godly man. When he heard the prophecy, he kept his strength at home, and opened the city gates to Aegon when he came, and his high holiness anointed the conqueror with the seven oils. I must do as he did three hundred years ago. I must pray and fast. For seven days and seven nights. For as long as need be. Circe itched to slap his solemn, pious face. I could help you fast, she thought. I could shut you up in some tower and see that no one brings you food until the gods have spoken. These false kings espouse false gods, she reminded him. Only King Tommen defends the holy faith. 
Yet everywhere septs are burned and looted. Even silent sisters have been raped, crying their anguish to the sky. Your grace has seen the bones and skulls of our holy dead? I have, she had to say. Give Toman your blessing, and he shall put an end to these outrages. And how shall he do that, your grace? Will he send a knight to walk the roads with every begging brother? Will he give us men to guard our scepters against the wolves and lions? I will pretend you did not mention lions. The realm is at war. His grace has need of every man. Circe did not intend to squander Toman's strength playing wet nurse to sparrows or guarding the wrinkled cunts of a thousand sour scepters. Half of them are probably praying for a good raping. Your sparrows have clubs and axes. Let them defend themselves. King Mago's laws prohibit that, as your grace must know. It was by his decree that the faith laid down its swords. Toman is king now, not Mago. What did she care what Mago the Cruel had decreed three hundred years ago? Instead of taking the swords out of the hands of the faithful, he should have used them for his own ends. She pointed to where the warrior stood above his altar of red marble. What is that he holds? A sword. Has he forgotten how to use it? Mager's laws could be undone. She let that hang there, waiting for the high sparrow to rise to the bait. He did not disappoint her. The faith militant reborn. That would be the answer to three hundred years of prayer, your grace. The warrior would lift his shining sword again and cleanse this sinful realm of all its evil. If his grace were to allow me to restore the ancient blessed orders of the sword and star, every godly man in the seven kingdoms would know him to be our true and rightful lord. That was sweet to hear, but Circe took care not to seem too eager. Your High Holiness spoke of forgiveness earlier. In these troubled times, King Toman would be most grateful if you could see your way to forgiving the crown's debt. It seems to me we owe the faith some nine hundred thousand dragons. Nine hundred thousand six hundred and seventy-four dragons. Gold that could feed the hungry, and we build a thousand septs. Is it gold you want? The Queen asked. Or do you want these dusty laws of Magers set aside? The High Septon pondered that a moment. As you wish. This debt shall be forgiven, and King Toman will have his blessing. The warrior's sons shall escort me to him, shining in the glory of their faith, whilst my sparrows go forth to defend the meek and humble of the land, reborn as poor fellows as of old. The queen got to her feet and smoothed her skirts. I shall have the papers drawn up, and his grace will sign them and affix them with the royal seal. If there was one part of kingship that Toman loved, it was playing with his seal. Seven save his grace, long may he reign. The high septon made a steeple of his hands and raised his eyes to heaven. Let the wicked tremble! Do you hear that, Lord Stannis? Circe could not help but smile. Even her lord father could have done no better. At a stroke, she had rid King's Landing of the plague of sparrows, secured Toman's blessing, and lessened the crown's debt by close to a million dragons. Her heart was soaring as she allowed the high septon to escort her back to the Hall of Lamps. Lady Merriweather shared the Queen's delight though she had never heard of the warriors' sons or the poor fellows. They date from before Egan's conquest, Circe explained to her. The warriors' sons were an order of knights who gave up their lands and gold and swore their swords to his high holiness. The poor fellows, they were humbler, though far more numerous, begging brothers of a sort, though they carried axes instead of bowls. They wanted the roads escorting travelers from sept to sept and town to town. Their badge was a seven-pointed star, red on white, so the small folk named them stars. 
The warrior's sons wore rainbow cloaks and inlaid silver armor over hair shirts, and wore star-shaped crystals in the pommels of their long swords. They were the swords. Holy men, ascetics, fanatics, sorcerers, dragon slayers, demon hunters. There were many tales about them, but all agree that they were implacable in their hatred for all enemies of the holy faith. Lady Merriweather understood at once. Enemies such as Lord Stannis and his red sorceress, perhaps? Why, yes, as it happens, said Cersei, giggling like a girl. Shall we broach a flagon of Hippocras and drink to the fervor of the warrior's sons on our way home? To the fervor of the warrior's sons and the brilliance of the Queen Regent. To Cersei, the first of her name. The Hippocras was as sweet and savory as Cersei's triumph, and the Queen's litter seemed almost to float back across the city. But at the base of Aegon's high hill they encountered Marjorie Tyrell and her cousins returning from a ride. She dogs me everywhere I go, Cersei thought with annoyance when she laid eyes on the little queen. Behind Marjorie came a long tail of courtiers, guards, and servants, many of them laden with baskets of fresh flowers. Each of her cousins had an admirer in thrall. The gangly squire, Alan Ambrose, rode with Eleanor, to whom he was betrothed, Sir Talad with shy Alla. One armed Mark Mullendore with Mega, plump and laughing. The Red Wine twins were escorting two of Marjorie's other ladies, Meredith Crane and Janna Fossaway. The women all wore flowers in their hair. Jalabar Show had attached himself to the party too, as had Sir Lambert Turnberry with his eye patch and the handsome singer known as the Blue Bard. And of course, the Knight of the King's Guard must accompany the little queen. And, of course, it is the night of flowers. In white-scale armor chased with gold, Sir Loras glittered. Though he no longer presumed to train Tommen at arms, the king still spent far too much time in his company. Every time the boy returned from an afternoon with his little wife, he had some new tale to tell about something that Sir Loras had said or done. Marjorie hailed them when the two columns met and fell in beside the queen's litter. Her cheeks were flushed, her brown ringlets tumbling loosely about her shoulders, stirred by every puff of wind. "'We have been picking autumn flowers in the Kingswood,' she told them. "'I know where you were,' the Queen thought. Her informers were very good about keeping her apprised of Marjorie's movements. Such a restless girl, our little Queen. She seldom let more than three days pass without going off for a ride. Some days they would ride along the Rosby Road, to hunt for shells and eat beside the sea. Other times she would take her entourage across the river for an afternoon of hawking. The little queen was fond of going out on boats as well, sailing up and down the Blackwater Rush to no particular purpose. When she was feeling pious, she would leave the castle to pray at Baylor's Sept. She gave her custom to a dozen different seamstresses, was well known amongst the city's goldsmiths, and had even been known to visit the fish market by the mud gate for a look at the day's catch. Wherever she went, the small folk fawned on her, and Lady Marjorie did all she could to fan their ardor. She was forever giving alms to beggars, buying hot pies off baker's carts, and reining up to speak to common tradesmen. Had it been up to her, she would have had Toman doing all these things as well. She was forever inviting him to accompany her and her hens on their adventures, and the boy was forever pleading with his mother for leave to go along. The queen had given her consent a few times, if only to allow Sir Osney to spend a few more hours in Marjorie's company. For all the good it has done, Osney has proved a grievous disappointment. "'Do you remember the day your sister sailed for Dorne?' Cersei asked her son. "'Do you recall the mob howling on our way back to the castle? The stones, the curses?' But the king was deaf to sense— thanks to his little queen. If we mingle with the commons, they will love us better. The mob loved the fat high septon so well they tore him limb from limb, and him a holy man. She reminded him. All it did was make him sullen with her. Just as Marjorie wants, I wager. 
Every day, in every way, she tries to steal him from me. Joffrey would have seen through her schemer's smile and let her know her place, but Tommen was more gullible. She knew Joff was too strong for her, Cersei thought, remembering the gold coin Kybern had found. For House Tyrell to hope to rule, he had to be removed. It came back to her that Marjorie and her hideous grandmother had once plotted to marry Sansa Stark to the little queen's crippled brother, Willis. Lord Tywin had forestalled that by stealing a march on them and wedding Sansa to Tyrion. But the link had been there. They are all in it together, she realized with a start. The Tyros bribed the jailers to free Tyrion and whisked him down the Rose Road to join his vile bride. By now the both of them are safe in Highgarden, hidden away behind a wall of roses. You should have come along with us, Your Grace, the little schemer prattled on as they climbed the slope of Aegon's high hill. We could have had such a lovely time together. The trees are gowned in gold and red and orange, and there are flowers everywhere. Chestnuts, too. We roasted some on our way home. I have no time for riding through the woods and picking flowers, Cersei said. I have a kingdom to rule. Only one, Your Grace? Who rules the other six? Marjorie laughed a merry little laugh. You will forgive me my jest, I hope. I know what a burden you bear. You should let me share the load. There must be some things I could do to help you. It would put to rest all this talk that you and I are rivals for the king. Is that what they say? Cersei smiled. How foolish! I have never looked upon you as a rival, not even for a moment. I am so pleased to hear that. The girl did not seem to realize that she had been cut. You and Tommen must come with us the next time. I know his grace would love it. The blue bard played for us, and Sir Talad showed us how to fight with a staff, the way the small folk do. The woods are so beautiful in autumn. My late husband loved the forest, too. In the early years of their marriage, Robert was forever employing her to hunt with him, but Circe had always begged off. His hunting trips allowed her time with Jamie. Golden days and silver nights. It was a dangerous dance that they had danced, to be sure. Eyes and ears were everywhere within the Red Keep, and one could never be certain when Robert would return. Somehow the peril had only served to make their times together that much more thrilling. Still, beauty can sometimes mask deadly danger, she warned the little queen. Robert lost his life in the woods. Marjorie smiled at Sir Loras, a sweet sisterly smile full of fondness. Your grace is kind to fear for me, but my brother keeps me well protected. Go and hunt, Circe had urged Robert half a hundred times. My brother keeps me well protected. She recalled what Tana had told her earlier, and a laugh came bursting from her lips. Your grace laughs so prettily, Lady Marjorie gave her a quizzical smile. Might we share the jest? You will, the queen said. I promise you, you will. The Reaver The drums were pounding out a battle beat as the Iron Victory swept forward, her ram cutting through the choppy green waters. The smaller ship ahead was turning, oars slapping at the sea. Roses streamed upon her banners, fore and aft a white rose upon a red escutcheon, atop her mast a golden one on a field as green as grass. The Iron Victory raked her side so hard that half the boarding party lost their feet. Oars snapped and splintered, sweet music to the captain's ears. He vaulted over the gunwale, landing on the deck below with his golden cloak billowing behind him. The white roses drew back, as men always did at the sight of Victorian Greyjoy, armed and armored, his face hidden behind his crocken helm. They were clutching swords and spears and axes, but nine of every ten wore no armor, and the tenth had only a shirt of sewn scales. These are no iron men, Victorian thought. They still fear drowning. Get him, one man shouted. He's alone. Come, he roared back, 
Come kill me if you can. From all sides the rosy warriors converged, with gray steel in their hands and terror behind their eyes. Their fear was so ripe that Tarion could taste it. Left and right he laid about, hewing off the first man's arm at the elbow, cleaving through the shoulder of the second. The third buried his own axe head in the soft pine of Victorian's shield. He slammed it into the fool's face, knocked him off his feet, and slew him when he tried to rise again. As he was struggling to free his axe from the dead man's rib cage, a spear jabbed him between the shoulder blades. It felt as though someone had slapped him on the back. Victorian spun and slammed his axe down onto the spearman's head, feeling the impact in his arm as the steel went crunching through helm and hair and skull. The man swayed for half a heartbeat till the iron captain wrenched the steel free and sent his corpse staggering, loose-limbed, across the deck, looking more drunk than dead. By then his iron-born had followed him down onto the deck of the broken longship. He heard Wolf one ear let out a howl as he went to work, glimpsed Ragnar Pike in his rusted mail, saw Newt the barber send a throwing axe spinning through the air to catch a man in the chest. Victorian slew another man and another. He would have killed a third, but Ragnar cut him down first. Well struck, Victorian bellowed at him. When he turned to find the next victim for his axe, he spied the other captain across the deck. His white surcoat was spotted with blood and gore, but Victorian could make out the arms upon his breast, the white rose within its red escutcheon. The man bore the same device upon his shield, on a white field with a red embattled border. You, the iron captain called across the carnage, you of the rose, be you the lord of South Shield? The other raised his visor to show a beardless face. His son and heir, Sir Talbot Surrey. And who are you, Kraken? Your death, Victorian bulled toward him. Seri leapt to meet him. His long sword was good castle-forged steel, and the young knight made it sing. His first cut was low, and Victorian deflected it off his axe. His second caught the iron captain on the helm before he got his shield up. Victorian answered with a sidearm blow of his axe. Seri's shield got in the way. Wooden splinters flew, and the white rose split lengthwise with a sweet, sharp crack. The young knight's long sword hammered at his thigh once, twice, thrice, screaming against the steel. This boy is quick, the iron captain realized. He smashed his shield in Seri's face and sent him staggering back against the gunwale. Victorian raised his axe and put all his weight behind his cut to open the boy from neck to groin, but Seri spun away. The axe head crashed through the rail, sending splinters flying, and lodged there when he tried to pull it free. The deck moved under his feet, and he stumbled to one knee. Sir Talbot cast away his broken shield and slashed down with his longsword. Victorian's own shield had twisted half around when he stumbled. He caught Ceres' blade in an iron fist. Lobstered steel crunched, and a stab of pain made him grunt. Yet Victorian held on. "'I am quick as well, boy,' he said, as he ripped the sword from the knight's hand and flung it into the sea. Sir Talbot's eyes went wide. My sword! Victorian caught the lad about the throat with a bloody fist. Go and get it, he said, forcing him backwards over the side into the blood-stained waters. That won him a respite to pull his axe loose. The white roses were falling back before the iron tide. Some tried to flee below decks as others cried for quarter. Victorian could feel warm blood trickling down his fingers beneath the mail and leather and lobstered plate, but that was nothing. Around the mast a thick knot of foemen fought on, standing shoulder to shoulder in a ring. These few are men, at least. They would sooner die than yield. Victorian would grant some of them that wish. He beat his axe against his shield and charged them. The drowned god had not shaped Victorian Greyjoy to fight with words at King's Moots, nor struggle against furtive sneaking foes in endless bogs. This was why he had been put on earth, to stand steel-clad with an axe red and dripping in his hand, dealing death with every blow. 
They hacked at him from front and back, but their swords might have been willow switches for all the harm they did him. No blade could cut through Victorian Greyjoy's heavy plate, nor did he give his foes the time to find the weak points at the joints, where only mail and leather warded him. Let three men assail him, or four, or five, it made no matter. He slew them one at a time, trusting in his steel to protect him from the others. As each foe fell, he turned his wrath upon the next. The last man to face him must have been a smith. He had shoulders like a bull, and one much more muscular than the other. His armor was a studded brigandine and a cap of boiled leather. The only blow he landed completed the ruin of Victorian's shield, but the cut the captain dealt in answer split his head in two. Would that I could deal with the crow's eye as simply. When he jerked his axe head free again, the smith's skull seemed to burst. Bone and blood and brain went everywhere, and the corpse fell forward up against his legs. Too late to plead for quarter now, Victorian thought as he untangled himself from the dead man. By then the deck was slick beneath his feet, and the dead and the dying lay in heaps on every side. He threw his shield away and sucked in air. "'Lord Captain,' he heard the barber say beside him, "'the day is ours!' All around the sea was full of ships. Some were burning, some were sinking, some had been smashed to splinters. Between the hulls the water was thick as stew, full of corpses, broken oars, and men clinging to the wreckage. In the distance half a dozen of southern long ships were racing back toward the mander. Let them go, Victorian thought. Let them tell the tale. Once a man had turned his tail and run from battle, he ceased to be a man. His eyes were stinging from the sweat that had run down into them during the fight. Two of his oarsmen helped undo his crock and helm so he might lift it off. Victorian mopped at his brow. That night, he grumbled, the night of the white rose, did any of you pull him out? A lord's son would be worth a goodly ransom. From his father, if Lord Sarry had survived the day. From his liege at Highgarden, if not. None of his men had seen what became of the knight after he went over the side, however. Most like the man had drowned. May he feast as he fought in the drowned god's watery halls. Though the men of the Shield Islands called themselves sailors, they crossed the seas in dread and went lightly clad in battle for fear of drowning. Young Sari had been different. A brave man, thought Victorian, almost ironborn. He gave the captured ship to Ragnar Pike, named a dozen men to crew her, and clambered back up onto his own iron victory. Strip the captives of arms and armor, and have their wounds bound up, he told Newt the barber. Throw the dying in the sea. If any beg for mercy, cut their throats first. He had only contempt for such. Better to drown on seawater than on blood. I want a count of the ships we won, and all the knights and lordlings we took captive. I want their banners, too. One day he would hang them in his hall, so when he grew old and feeble he could remember all the foes he had slain when he was young and strong. It will be done, Newt grinned. It is a great victory. Aye, he thought, a great victory for the crow's eye and his wizards. The other captains would shout his brother's name anew when the tidings reached Oakenshield. Euron had seduced them with his glib tongue and smiling eye, and bound them to his cause with the plunder of half a hundred distant lands. Gold and silver, ornate armor, curved swords with gilded pummels, daggers of Valyrian steel, striped tiger pelts, and the skins of spotted cats, jade manticores and ancient Valyrian sphinxes, chests of nutmeg, cloves, and saffron, ivory tusks and the horns of unicorns, green and orange and yellow feathers from the summer sea, bolts of fine silk and shimmering samite. And yet all that was little and less compared to this. Now he has given them conquest, and they are his for good and all, the captain thought. The taste was bitter on his tongue. This was my victory, not his. Where was he? Back on Oakenshield, lazing in a castle. He stole my wife, 
and he stole my throne, and now he steals my glory. Obedience came naturally to Victorian Greyjoy. He had been born to it. Growing to manhood in the shadow of his brothers, he had followed Balin dutifully in everything he did. Later, when Balin's sons were born, he had grown to accept that one day he would kneel to them as well, when one of them took his father's place upon the sea stone chair. But the drowned god had summoned Balin and his sons down to his watery halls, and Victorian could not call Euron king without tasting bile in his throat. The wind was freshening, and his thirst was raging. After a battle he always wanted wine. He gave the deck to Newt and went below. In his cramped cabin aft he found the dusky woman, wet and ready. Perhaps the battle had warmed her blood as well. He took her twice, in quick succession. When they were done there was blood smeared across her breasts and thighs and belly, but it was his blood from the gash in his palm. The dusky woman washed it out for him with boiled vinegar. The plan was good, I grant him, Victorian said as she knelt beside him. The mander is open to us now, as it was of old. It was a lazy river, wide and slow and treacherous, with snags and sandbars. Most seagoing vessels dared not sail beyond High Garden, but long ships with their shallow drafts could navigate as far upstream as Bitterbridge. In ancient days the Ironborn had boldly sailed the river road and plundered all along the Mander and its vassal streams, until the kings of the Green Hand had armed the fisherfolk on the four small islands off the Mander's mouth and named them his shields. Two thousand years had passed, but in the watchtowers along their craggy shores greybeards still kept the ancient vigil. At the first glimpse of longships the old men would light their beacon fires, and the call would leap from hill to hill and island to island. Fear! Foes! Raiders! Raiders! When the fisherfolk saw the fires burning on the high places, they would put their nets and ploughs aside and take up their swords and axes. Their lords would rush from their castles, attended by their knights and men-at-arms. War horns would echo across the waters from green shield and grey shield, oaken shield and south shield and their long ships would come sliding out from moss-covered stone pens along the shores, oars flashing as they swarmed across the straits to seal the mander and hound and harry the raiders upriver to their doom. Euron had sent Torvald, Roundtooth, and the red oarsmen up the mander with a dozen swift long ships, so the lords of the Shield Islands would spill forth in pursuit. By the time his main fleet arrived, only a handful of fighting men remained to defend the isles themselves. The Ironborn had come in on the evening tide, so the glare of the setting sun would keep them hidden from the greybeards in the watchtowers until it was too late. The wind was at their backs, as it had been all the way down from Old Wick. It was whispered about the fleet that Euron's wizards had much and more to do with that, that the crow's eye appeased the storm god with blood sacrifice. How else would he have dared sail so far to the west, instead of following the shoreline as was the custom? The Ironborn ran their longships up onto the stony shingles and spilled out into the purple dusk with steel glimmering in their hands. By then the fires were burning in the high places, but few remained to take up arms. Grey Shield, Green Shield, and South Shield fell before the sun came up. Oaken Shield lasted half a day longer and when the men of the four shields broke off their pursuit of Torwald and the red oarsmen and turned down river, they found the iron fleet waiting at the mander's mouth. All fell out as Euron said it would, Victorian told the dusky woman as she bound up his hand with linen. His wizards must have seen it. He had three aboard the silence. Colin Humble had confided in a whisper. Queer men and terrible they were, but the crow's eye had made them slaves. He still needs me to fight his battles, though, Victorian insisted. Wizards may be well and good, but blood and steel win wars. The vinegar made his wound hurt worse than ever. He shoved the woman away and closed his fist, glowering. Bring me wine. He drank in the darkness, brooding on his brother. If I do not strike the blow with mine own hand, 
Am I still a kinslayer? Victorian feared no man, but the drowned god's curse gave him pause. If another strikes him down at my command, will his blood still stain my hands? Aaron Damp Hare would know the answer. But the priest was somewhere back on the Iron Islands, still hoping to raise the ironborn against their new crowned king. Newt the barber can shave a man with a thrown axe from twenty yards away, and none of Euron's mongrels could stand against Wolf One Ear or Andric the Unsmiling. Any of them could do it. But what a man can do and what a man will do are two different things, he knew. Euron's blasphemies will bring down the drowned god's wrath upon us all, Aaron had prophesied back on Old Wick. We must stop him, brother. We are still of Balan's blood, are we not? So is he, Victorian had said. I like it no more than you, but Euron is the king. Your king's moot raised him up, and you put the driftwood crown upon his head yourself. I placed the crown upon his head, said the priest, seaweed dripping in his hair, and gladly will I rest it off again and crown you in his stead. Only you are strong enough to fight him. The drowned god raised him up, Victorian complained. Let the drowned god cast him down. Aaron gave him a baleful look, the look that had been known to sour wells and make women barren. It was not the god who spoke. Euron is known to keep wizards and foul sorcerers on that red ship of his. They sent some spell among us, so we could not hear the sea. The captains and the kings were drunk with all this talk of dragons. Drunk and fearful of that horn. You heard the sound it made. It makes no matter. Euron is our king. Not mine, the priest declared. The drowned god helps bold men. Not those who cower below their decks when the storm is rising. If you will not bestir yourself to remove the crow's eye from the sea stone chair, I must take the task upon myself. How? You have no ships, no swords. I have my voice, the priest replied, and the god is with me. Mine is the strength of the sea, a strength the crow's eye cannot hope to withstand. The waves may break upon the mountain, yet still they come, wave upon wave, and in the end only pebbles remain where once the mountain stood. And soon even the pebbles are swept away to be ground beneath the sea for all eternity. Pebbles, Victorian grumbled. You are mad if you think to bring the crow's eye down with talk of waves and pebbles. The ironborn shall be waves, the damp hair said. Not the great and lordly, but the simple folk, tellers of the soil and fishers of the sea. The captains and the kings raised Euron up, but the common folk shall tear him down. I shall go to Great Wick, to Harlaw, to Orkmont, to Pike itself. In every town and village shall my words be heard. No godless man may sit the sea stone chair. He shook his shaggy head and stalked back out into the night. When the sun came up the next day, Aaron Greyjoy had vanished from Old Wick. Even his drowned men knew not where. They said the crow's eye only laughed when he was told. That though the priest was gone, his dire warnings lingered. Victorian found himself remembering Baylor Blacktide's words as well. Balan was mad, Aaron is madder, and Euron is maddest of them all. The young lord had tried to sail home after the king's moot, refusing to accept Euron as his liege. But the Iron Fleet had closed the bay. The habit of obedience was rooted deep in Victorian grey joy, and Euron wore the driftwood crown. Nightflyer was seized, Lord Blacktide delivered to the king in chains. Euron's mutes and mongrels had cut him into seven parts to feed the seven green land gods he worshipped. As a reward for his leal service, the new crowned king had given Victorian the dusky woman. Taken off some slaver bound for Lys. I want none of your leavings, he had told his brother scornfully, but when the crow's eye said, 
that the woman would be killed unless he took her, he had weakened. Her tongue had been torn out, but elsewise she was undamaged, and beautiful besides, with skin as brown as oiled teak. Yet sometimes when he looked at her, he found himself remembering the first woman his brother had given him to make a man of him. Victorian wanted to use the dusky woman once again, but found himself unable. "'Fetch me another skin of wine,' he told her. "'Then get out.' When she returned with a skin of sour red, the captain took it up on deck, where he could breathe the clean sea air. He drank half the skin and poured the rest into the sea for all the men who died. The Iron Victory lingered for hours off the mouth of the Mander. As the greater part of the Iron Fleet got under way for Oakenshield, Victorian kept Grief, Lord Dagon, Iron Wind, and Maidensbane about him as a rear guard. They pulled survivors from the sea, and watched Hard Hand sink slowly, dragged under by the wreck that she had rammed. By the time she vanished beneath the waters, Victorian had the count he'd asked for. He had lost six ships, and captured eight and thirty. "'It will serve,' he told Newt. "'To the oars. We return to Lord Hewitt's town.' His oarsmen bent their backs toward Oakenshield, and the iron captain went below decks once again. "'I could kill him,' he told the dusky woman, "'though it is a great sin to kill your king, and a worse one to kill your brother.' He frowned. Asha should have given me her voice. How could she have ever hoped to win the captains and the kings, her with her pine cones and her turnips? Balan's blood is in her, but she is still a woman. She had run after the king's moot. The night the driftwood crown was placed on Euron's head, she and her crew had melted away. Some small part of Victorian was glad she had. If the girl keeps her wits about her, she will wed some northern lord, and live with him in his castle, far from the sea, and you're on crow's eye. "'Lord Hewitt's town, Lord Captain,' the crewman called. Victorian rose. The wine had dulled the throbbing in his hand. Perhaps he would have Hewitt's maester look at it, if the man had not been killed. He returned to deck as they came around a headland. The way Lord Hewitt's castle sat above the harbour reminded him of Lordsport, though this town was twice as big. A score of long ships prowled the waters beyond the port, the golden kraken writhing on their sails. Hundreds more were beached along the shingles and drawn up to the piers that lined the harbour. At a stone quay stood three great cogs and a dozen smaller ones, taking on plunder and provisions. Victorian gave orders for the Iron Victory to drop anchor. Have a boat made ready. The town seemed strangely still as they approached. Most of the shops and houses had been looted, as their smashed doors and broken shutters testified, but only the sept had been put to the torch. The streets were strewn with corpses, each with a small flock of carrion crows in attendance. A gang of sullen survivors moved amongst them, chasing off the blackbirds and tossing the dead into the back of a wagon for burial. The notion filled Victorian with disgust. No true son of the sea would want to rot beneath the ground. How would he ever find the drowned god's watery halls, to drink and feast for all eternity? The silence was amongst the ships they passed. Victorian's gaze was drawn to the iron figurehead at her prow, the mouthless maiden with the wind-blown hair and outstretched arm. Her mother-of-pearl eyes seemed to follow him. She had a mouth like any other woman till the crow's eye sewed it shut. As they neared the shore, he noticed a line of women and children herded up onto the deck of one of the great cogs. Some had their hands bound behind their backs, and all wore loops of hempen rope about their necks. "'Who are they?' he asked the men who helped tie up their boat. "'Widows and orphans. They are to be sold as slaves.' "'Sold? There were no slaves in the Iron Islands.' only thralls. A thrall was bound to service, but he was not chattel. His children were born free, so long as they were given to the drowned god, and thralls were never bought nor sold for gold. A man paid the iron price for thralls 
or else had none. They should be thralls or salt wives, Victorian complained. It's by the king's decree, the man said. The strong have always taken from the weak, said Newt the barber. Thralls or slaves, it makes no matter. Their men could not defend them, so now they are ours, to do with as we will. It is not the old way, he might have said, but there was no time. His victory had preceded him, and men were gathering round to offer congratulations. Victorian let them fawn until one began to praise Euron's daring. It is daring to sail out of sight of land, so no word of our coming could reach these islands before us, he growled. But crossing half the world to hunt for dragons, that is something else. He did not wait for a reply, but shouldered through the press and on up to the keep. Lord Hewitt's castle was small but strong, with thick walls and studded oaken gates that evoked his house's ancient arms, an oak escutcheon studded with iron upon a field of undy blue and white. But it was the kraken of House Greyjoy that flew atop his green-roofed towers now, and they found the great gates burned and broken. On the ramparts walked iron-born with spears and axes, and some of Euron's mongrels, too. In the yard, Victorian came on Gorold Goodbrother and Old Drum, speaking quietly with Roderick Harlaw. Newt the barber gave a hoot at the sight of them. Reader, he called out, why is your face so long? Your misgivings were for naught. The day is ours, and ours the prize. Lord Roderick's mouth puckered. These rocks, you mean? All four together wouldn't make Harlaw. We have won some stones and trees and trinkets, and the enmity of House Tyrell. The roses? Newt laughed. What rose can harm the krakens of the deep? We have taken their shields from them and smashed them all to pieces. Who will protect them now? High Garden, replied the reader. Soon enough all the power of the reach will be marshaled against us, Barber, and then you may learn that some roses have steel thorns. Drum nodded, one hand on the hilt of his red rein. Lord Tarley bears the great sword Hartsbane, forged of Valyrian steel, and he is always in Lord Tyrell's van. Victorian's hunger flared. Let him come. I will take his sword for mine own, as your own forebear took red rain. Let them all come, and bring the Lannisters as well. A lion may be fierce enough on land, but at sea the kraken rules supreme. He would give half his teeth for the chance to try his axe against the Kingslayer or the Knight of Flowers. That was the sort of battle that he understood. The Kinslayer was accursed in the eyes of gods and men, but the warrior was honored and revered. Have no fear, Lord Captain, said the reader. They will come. His grace desires it. Why else would he have commanded us to let Hewitt's ravens fly? You read too much and fight too little, Newt said. Your blood is milk. But the reader made as if he had not heard. A riotous feast was in progress when Victorian entered the hall. Iron-born filled at the tables, drinking and shouting and jostling each other, boasting of the men that they had slain, the deeds that they had done, the prizes they had won. Many were bedecked with plunder. Left-hand Lucas Codd and Quellen Humble had torn tapestries off the walls to serve as cloaks. German Botley wore a rope of pearls and garnets over his gilded Lannister breastplate. Andrick the Unsmiling staggered by with a woman under each arm. Though he remained unsmiling, he had rings on every finger. Instead of trenchers carved from old stale bread, the captains were eating off solid silver platters. Newt the barber's face grew dark with anger as he looked about. The Crozai sends us forth to face the longships, whilst his own men take the castles and the villages and grab all the loot and women. What has he left for us? We have the glory. Glory is good, 
said Newt, but gold is better. Victorian shrugged. The crow's eye says we shall have all of Westeros. The arbor, Old Town, High Garden, that's where you'll find your gold. But enough talk, I'm hungry. By right of blood, Victorian might have claimed a seat on the dais, but he did not care to eat with Euron and his creatures. Instead, he chose a place by Ralph the Limper, the captain of the Lord Quillen. A great victory, Lord Captain, said the Limper. A victory worthy of a lordship. You should have an island. Lord Victorian. Aye, and why not? It might not be the sea stone chair, but it would be something. Hotho Harlaw was across the table, sucking meat off a bone. He flicked it aside and hunched forward. The knight's to have Grey Shield. My cousin. Did you hear? No. Victorian looked across the hall to where Sir Harris Harlaw sat drinking wine from a golden cup. A tall man, long faced and austere. Why would Euron give that one an island? Hotho held out his empty wine cup, and a pale young woman in a gown of blue velvet and gilt lace refilled it for him. The knight took Grimston by himself. He planted his standard beneath the castle and defied the Grims to face him. One did, and then another, and another. He slew them all. Well, near enough. Two yielded. When the seventh man went down, Lord Grimm's septon decided the gods had spoken and surrendered the castle. Otho laughed. He'll be the lord of Grayshield, and welcome to it. With him gone, I am the reader's heir. He thumped his wine cup against his chest. Otho the humpback, lord of Harlaw. Seven, you say? Victorian wondered how nightfall would fare against his axe. He had never fought a man armed with a Valyrian steel blade, though he had thrashed young Harris Harlaw many a time when both of them were young. As a boy, Harlaw had been fast friends with Balan's eldest son, Roderick, who had died beneath the walls of Seaguard. The feast was good, the wine was of the best, and there was roast ox, rare and bloody, and stuffed ducks as well and buckets of fresh crabs. The serving wenches wore fine woolens and plush velvets, the Lord Captain did not fail to note. He took them for scullions dressed up in the clothes of Lady Hewitt and her ladies, until Hotho told him they were Lady Hewitt and her ladies. It amused the crow's eye to make them wait and poor. There were eight of them, her ladyship herself still handsome, though grown somewhat stout, and seven younger women aged from twenty-five to ten, her daughters and good daughters. Lord Hewitt himself sat in his accustomed place upon the dais, dressed in all his heraldic finery. His arms and legs had been tied to his chair, and a huge white radish shoved between his teeth so he could not speak, though he could see and hear. The crow's eye had claimed the place of honor at his lordship's right hand. A pretty, buxom girl of seventeen or eighteen years was in his lap, barefoot and disheveled, her arms around his neck. "'Who is that?' Victorian asked the men around him. "'His lordship's bastard daughter,' laughed Hotho. Before Euron took the castle, she was made to wait at table on the rest and take her own meals with the servants. Euron put his blue lips to her throat, and the girl giggled and whispered something in his ear. Smiling, he kissed her throat again. Her white skin was covered with red marks where his mouth had been. They made a rosy necklace about her neck and shoulders. Another whisper in his ear, and this time the crow's eye laughed aloud, then slammed his wine cup down for silence. "'Good ladies!' he called out to his high-born serving women. "'Fania is concerned for your fine gowns. She would not have them stained with grease and wine and dirty groping fingers, since I have promised that she may choose her own clothes from your wardrobes after the feast. So you had best disrobe. A roar of laughter washed over the great hall, and Lord Hewitt's face turned so red that Victorian thought his head might burst. The women had no choice but to obey. The youngest one cried a little, but her mother comforted her, and helped undo the laces down her back. Afterward, 
they continued to serve as before, moving along the tables with flagons full of wine to fill each empty cup. Only now they did so naked. He shames Hewitt as he once shamed me. The captain thought, remembering how his wife had sobbed as he was beating her. The men of the four shields oft married one another, he knew, just as the ironborn did. One of these naked serving wenches might well be Sir Talbot Serry's wife. It was one thing to kill a foe, another to dishonor him. Victorian made a fist. His hand was bloody where his wound had soaked through the linen. On the dais, Euron pushed aside his slattern and climbed upon the table. The captains began to bang their cups and stamp their feet upon the floor. Euron! they shouted. Euron! 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 It was the king's moot come again. I swore to give you Westeros, the Crozai said when the tumult died away. And here is your first taste. A morsel, nothing more. But we shall feast before the fall of night. The torches along the walls were burning bright, and so was he. Blue lips, blue eye, and all. What the kraken grasps, it does not loose. These isles were once ours, and now they are again. But we need strong men to hold them. So rise, Sir Harris Harlaw, Lord of Greyshield. The knight stood, one hand upon nightfall's moonstone pommel. Rise, Andric the unsmiling, Lord of Southshield. Andric shoved away his women and lurched to his feet like a mountain rising sudden from the sea. Rise, Marin Volmark, Lord of Greenshield. A beardless boy of six and ten years, Volmark stood hesitantly, looking like the Lord of Rabbits. And rise, Newt the Barber, Lord of Oakenshield. Newt's eyes grew weary, as if he feared he was the butt of some cruel jape. A lord, he croaked. Victorian had expected the crow's eye to give the lordships to his own creatures, Stonehand and the Red Oarsman, and left-hand Lucas Codd. The king must needs be open-handed, he tried to tell himself, but another voice whispered, Euron's gifts are poisoned. When he turned it over in his head, he saw it plain. The knight was the reader's chosen heir, and Andric the Unsmiling, the strong right arm of Dunstan Drum. Thormark is a callow boy, but he has Black Heron's blood in him through his mother. And the barber? The tyrant grabbed him by the forearm. Refuse him! Newt looked at him as if he had gone mad. Refuse him? Lands and lordship? Will you make me a lord? He wrenched his arm away and stood basking in the cheers. And now he steals my men away, Victorian thought. King Euron called to Lady Hewitt for a fresh cup of wine and raised it high above his head. Captains and kings, lift your cups to the lords of the four shields. Victorian drank with the rest. There is no wine so sweet as wine taken from a foe. Someone had told him that once, his father or his brother Balin. One day I shall drink your wine, crows I, and take from you all that you hold dear. But was there anything your own held dear? On the morrow we prepare once more to sail, the king was saying. Fill our casks anew with spring water, Take every sack of grain and cask of beef, and as many sheep and goats as we can carry. The wounded, who are still hale enough to pull an oar, will row. The rest shall remain here, to help hold these isles for their new lords. Torvald and the Red Oarsmen will soon be back with more provisions. Our decks will stink of pigs and chickens on the voyage east, but we'll return with dragons. When? The voice was Lord Roderick's. When shall we return, Your Grace? A year? Three years? Five? Your dragons are a world away, and autumn is upon us. The reader walked forward, sounding all the hazards. 
Galleys guard the red wine straits. The Dornish coast is dry and bleak. Four hundred leagues of whirlpools, cliffs, and hidden shoals with hardly a safe landing anywhere. Beyond wait the stepstones, with their storms and their nests of Lycine and Mirish pirates. If a thousand ships set sail, three hundred may reach the far side of the narrow sea. And then what? Bliss will not welcome us, nor will Volantis. Where will you find fresh water, food? The first storm will scatter us across half the earth. A smile played across Euron's blue lips. I am the storm, my lord, the first storm and the last. I have taken the silence on longer voyages than this, and ones far more hazardous. Have you forgotten? I have sailed the smoking sea and seen Valyria. Every man there knew that the doom still ruled Valyria. The very sea there boiled and smoked, and the land was overrun with demons. It was said that any sailor who so much as glimpsed the fiery mountains of Valyria rising above the waves would soon die a dreadful death. Yet the crow's eye had been there and returned. Have you? the reader asked so softly. Euron's blue smile vanished. Reader, he said into the quiet, you would do well to keep your nose in your books. Victorian could feel the unease in the hall. He pushed himself to his feet. Brother, he boomed, you have not answered Harlaw's questions. Euron shrugged. The price of slaves is rising. We will sell our slaves in Lys and Volantis. That and the plunder we have taken here will give us sufficient gold to buy provisions. Are we slavers now? asked the reader. And for what? Dragons that no man here has seen? Shall we chase some drunken sailor's fancy to the far ends of the earth? His words do mutters of assent. "'Slaver's Bay is too far,' called out Ralph the Limper. "'And too close to Valyria,' shouted Quillen Humble. Fraleg the Strong said, "'My garden's close. I say, look for dragons there, the golden kind.' Alvin Sharp said, "'Why sail the world when the mander lies before us?' Red Ralph Stonehouse bounded to his feet. "'Old Town is richer, and the arbor richer still.' Red Wine's fleet is off away. We need only reach out our hand to pluck the ripest fruit in Westeros. Fruit? The king's eye looked more black than blue. Only a craven would steal a fruit when he could take the orchard. It is the arbor we want, said Red Ralph, and other men took up the cry. The crow's eye let the shouts wash over him. Then he leapt down from the table, grabbed his slattern by the arm, and pulled her from the hall. Fled like a dog. Neuron's hold upon the sea stone chair suddenly did not seem as secure as it had a few moments before. They will not follow him to Slaver's Bay. Perhaps they are not such dogs and fools as I had feared. That was such a merry thought that Victorian had to wash it down. He drained a cup with the barber to show him that he did not begrudge him his lordship, even if it came from Euron's hand. Outside the sun went down. Darkness gathered beyond the walls, but inside the torches burned with a ruddy orange glow, and their smoke gathered under the rafters like a gray cloud. Drunken men began to dance the finger dance. At some point left-hand Lucas Codd decided he wanted one of Lord Hewitt's daughters, so he took her on a table whilst her sisters screamed and sobbed. Victorian felt a tap on his shoulder. One of Euron's mongrel sons stood behind him, a boy of ten with woolly hair and skin the color of mud. My father wishes words with you. Victorian rose unsteadily. He was a big man with a large capacity for wine, but even so he had drunk too much. I beat her to death with mine own hands, he thought, 
but the crow's eye killed her when he shoved himself inside her. I had no choice. He followed the bastard boy from the hall and up a winding stone stair. The sounds of rape and revelry diminished as they climbed until there was only the soft scrape of boots on stone. The crow's eye had taken Lord Hewitt's bedchamber along with his bastard daughter. When he entered, the girl was sprawled naked on the bed, snoring softly. Huron stood by the window, drinking from a silver cup. He wore the sable cloak he took from Black Tide, his red leather eye patch, and nothing else. When I was a boy, I dreamt that I could fly, he announced. When I woke, I couldn't, or so the maester said. But what if he lied? Victorian could smell the sea through the open window, though the room stank of wine and blood and sex. The cold salt air helped to clear his head. What do you mean? Huron turned to face him, his bruised blue lips curled in a half-smile. Perhaps we can fly, all of us. How will we ever know unless we leap from some tall tower? The wind came gusting through the window and stirred his sable cloak. There was something obscene and disturbing about his nakedness. No man ever truly knows what he can do unless he dares to leap. There's the window. Leap! Victorian had no patience for this. His wounded hand was troubling him. What do you want? The world! Firelight glimmered in Euron's eye. His smiling eye. Will you take a cup of Lord Hewitt's wine? There is no wine half so sweet as wine taken from a beaten foe. No. Victorian glanced away. Cover yourself. Euron seated himself and gave his cloak a twitch, so it covered his private parts. I had forgotten what a small and noisy folk they are, my ironborn. I would bring them dragons, and they shout out for grapes. Grapes are real. A man can gorge himself on grapes. Their juice is sweet, and they make wine. What do dragons make? Whoa! The crow's eye sipped from his silver cup. I once held a dragon's egg in this hand, brother. This mirish wizard swore he could hatch it if I gave him a year and all the gold that he required. When I grew bored with his excuses, I slew him. As he watched his entrails sliding through his fingers, he said, But it has not been a year. He laughed. Craghorns died, you know. Who? The man who blew my dragon horn. When the maester cut him open, his lungs were charred as black as soot. Victorian shuddered. Show me this dragon's egg. I threw it in the sea during one of my dark moods. Huron gave a shrug. It comes to me that the reader was not wrong. Too large a fleet could never hold together over such a distance. The voyage is too long, too perilous. Only our finest ships and crews could hope to sail to Slaver's Bay and back. The Iron Fleet. The Iron Fleet is mine, Victorian thought. He said nothing. The crow's eye filled two cups with a strange black wine that flowed as thick as honey. Drink with me, brother. Have a taste of this. He offered one of the cups to Victorian. The captain took the cup Euron had not offered, sniffed at its contents suspiciously. Seen up close, it looked more blue than black. It was thick and oily, with a smell like rotted flesh. He tried a small swallow and spit it out at once. Foul stuff! Do you mean to poison me? I mean to open your eyes. Euron drank deep from his own cup and smiled. Shade of the evening, the wine of the warlocks. I came upon a cask of it when I captured a certain gallius out of Carth, along with some cloves and nutmeg, forty bolts of green silk, and four warlocks who told a curious tale. One presumed to threaten me, so I killed him and fed him to the other three. They refused to eat of their friend's flesh at first, 
but when they grew hungry enough, they had a change of heart. Men are meat. Balan was mad. Aaron is madder, and Euron is maddest of them all. Victarion was turning to go when the crow's eye said, A king must have a wife to give him heirs. Brother, I have need of you. Will you go to Slaver's Bay and bring my love to me? I had a love once, too. Victarion's hands coiled into fists, and a drop of blood fell to patter on the floor. I should beat you raw and red and feed you to the crabs, the same as I did her. You have sons, he told his brother, base-born mongrels, born of whores and weepers. They are of your body. So are the contents of my chamber pot. None is fit to sit the sea-stone chair, much less the iron throne. No, to make an heir that's worthy of him, I need a different woman. When the crocken weds the dragon, brother, let all the world beware. What dragon? said Victorian, frowning. The last of her line. They say she is the fairest woman in the world. Her hair is silver gold, and her eyes are amethysts. But you need not take my word for it, brother. Go to Slaver's Bay, behold her beauty, and bring her back to me. Why should I? Victorian demanded. For love, for duty, because your king commands it. Huron chuckled. And for the sea stone chair. It is yours once I claim the iron throne. You shall follow me as I follow Balan, and your own true born sons shall one day follow you. My own sons. But to have a true born son, a man must first have a wife. Victorian had no luck with wives. Huron's gifts are poisoned he reminded himself. But still. The choice is yours, brother. Live a thrall, or die a king. Do you dare to fly? Unless you take the leap, you'll never know. Your unsmiling eye was bright with mockery. Or do I ask too much of you? It is a fearsome thing to sail beyond Valyria. I could sail the Iron Fleet to hell if need be. When Victorian opened his hand, his palm was red with blood. I'll go to Slaver's Bay, aye. I'll find this dragon woman, and I'll bring her back. But not for you. You stole my wife and despoiled her. So I'll have yours. The fairest woman in the world. For me. Jamie the fields outside the walls of Darry were being tilled once more. The burned crops had been ploughed under, and Sir Adam's scouts reported seeing women in the furrows pulling weeds, whilst a team of oxen broke new ground on the edge of a nearby wood. A dozen bearded men with axes stood guard over them as they worked. By the time Jamie and his column reached the castle, all of them had fled within the walls. He found Darry close to him, just as Harrenhal had been. A chilly welcome from mine own blood. Sound the horn, he commanded. Sir Canis of Case unslung the horn of Herrick and let it wind. As he waited for a response from the castle, Jamie eyed the banner floating brown and crimson above his cousin's barbican. Lancel had taken to quartering the lion of Lannister with a dairy plowman, it would seem. He saw his uncle's hand in that, as in Lancel's choice of bride. House Darry had ruled these lands since the Andals cast down the first men. No doubt Sir Kevin realized that his son would have an easier time of it if the peasants saw him as a continuation of the old line, holding these lands by right of marriage rather than royal decree. Kevin should be Tommen's hand. Harris Swift is a toad, and my sister is a fool if she thinks elsewise. The castle gates swung open slowly. My cuz will not have room to accommodate a thousand men, Jamie told Strongbore. We'll make camp beneath the western wall. 
I want the perimeters ditched and staked. There are still bands of outlaws in these parts. They'd need to be mad to attack a force as strong as ours. Mad or starving. Until he had a better notion of these outlaws and their strength, Jamie was not inclined to take any risks with his defenses. Ditched and staked, he said again, before spurring honor toward the gate. Sir Dermot rode beside him with the royal stag and lion, and Sir Hugo Vance with the white standard of the King's Guard. Jamie had charged Red Ronnet with the task of delivering Willis Manderley to Maidenpool, so he would not need to look on him henceforth. Pia rode with Jamie's squires on the gelding Peck had found for her. It's like some toy castle, Jamie heard her say. She's known no home but Harrenhal, he reflected. Every castle in the realm will seem small to her, except the rock. Josmond Peckleton was saying the same thing. You must not judge by Harrenhal. Black Harren built too big. Pia listened as solemnly as a girl of five being lessened by her scepter. That's all she is, a little girl in a woman's body, scarred and scared. Peck was taken with her, though. Jamie suspected that the boy had never known a woman, and Pia was still pretty enough so long as she kept her mouth closed. There's no harm in him betting her, I suppose, so long as she's willing. One of the mountain's men had tried to rape the girl at Harrenhal, and it seemed honestly perplexed when Jamie commanded Illin Payne to take his head off. I had her before a hundred times, he kept saying as they forced him to his knees. A hundred times, my lord, we all had her. When Sir Illin presented Pia with his head, she had smiled through her ruined teeth. Darry had changed hands several times during the fighting, and its castle had been burned once and sacked at least twice. But Lancel had seemingly wasted little time setting things to rights. The castle gates were newly hung, raw oaken planks reinforced with iron studs. A new stable was going up where an older one had been put to the torch. The steps to the keep had been replaced, and the shutters on many of the windows. Blackened stones showed where the flames had licked, but time and rain would fade those. Within the walls, crossbowmen walked the ramparts, some in crimson cloaks and lion-crested helms, others in the blue and gray of House Frey. As Jamie trotted across the yard, chickens ran out from under Honor's hoofs. Sheep bleated, and peasants stared at him with sullen eyes. Armed peasants, he did not fail to note. Some had scythes, some staves, some hoes sharpened to cruel points. There were axes in evidence as well, and he spied several bearded men with red seven-pointed stars sewn onto ragged, filthy tunics. More bloody sparrows! Where do they all come from? Of his uncle Kevin he saw no sign, nor of Lancel. Only a maester emerged to greet him, with a grey robe flapping about his skinny legs. Lord Commander, Derry is honoured by this, uh, unexpected visit. You must forgive our lack of preparations. We had been given to understand that you were bound for River Run. Darry was on my way, lied Jamie. River Run will keep. And if perchance the siege had ended before he reached the castle, he would be spared the need to take up arms against House Tully. Dismounting, he handed honour to a stable boy. Will I find my uncle here? He did not supply a name. Sir Kevin was the only uncle he had left, the last surviving son of Titus Lannister. No, my lord. Sir Kevin took his leave of us after the wedding. The maester pulled at the chain collar as if it had grown too tight for him. I know Lord Lancel will be pleased to see you, and, and all your gallant knights, though it pains me to confess that Derry cannot feed so many. We have our own provisions. You are Maester Ottermore, if it please, my lord. Lady Amorine wished to welcome you herself, but she is seeing to the preparation of a feast in your honour. It is her hope that you and your chief knights and captains will join us at table this evening. A hot meal would be most welcome. 
The days have been cold and wet. Jamie glanced about the yard at the bearded faces of the sparrows. Too many. And too many frays as well. Where will I find Hardstone? We had a report of outlaws beyond the trident. Sir Harwin took five knights and twenty archers and went to deal with them. And Lord Lancel? He is at his prayers. His lordship has commanded us never to disturb him when he is praying. He and Sir Bonifer should get on well. Very well. There would be time enough to talk with his cousin later. Show me to my chambers and have a bath brought up. If it please, my lord, we have put you in the plowman's keep. I will show you there. I know the way. Jamie was no stranger to this castle. He and Circe had been guests here twice before, once on their way to Winterfell with Robert, and again on the way back to King's Landing. Though small as castles went, it was larger than an inn, with good hunting along the river. Robert Baratheon had never been loath to impose upon the hospitality of his subjects. The keep was much as he recalled it. The walls are still bare, Jamie observed as the maester led him down a gallery. Lord Lancel hopes one day to cover them with hangings, said Ottomore. Scenes of piety and devotion. Piety and devotion. It was all he could do not to laugh. The walls had been bare on his first visit, too. Terin had pointed out the squares of darker stone where tapestries had once hung. Sir Raymond could remove the hangings, but not the marks they'd left. Later the imp had slipped a handful of stags to one of Darry's serving men for the key to the cellar where their missing tapestries were hidden. He showed them to Jamie by the light of a candle, grinning. Woven portraits of all the Targaryen kings, from the first Aegon to the second Aenus. If I tell Robert, mayhaps he'll make me Lord of Darry, the dwarf said, chortling. Maester Ottomore led Jamie to the top of the keep. I trust you will be comfortable here, my lord. There is a privy, when nature calls. Your window looks out upon the god's wood. The bedchamber adjoins her ladyship's with a servant cell between. These were Lord Darry's own apartments. Yes, my lord. My cousin is too kind. I did not intend to put Lancel out of his own bedchamber. Lord Lancel has been sleeping in the sept. Sleeping with the mother and the maiden, when he has a warm wife just through that door? Jamie did not know whether to laugh or weep. Maybe he is praying for his cock to harden. In King's Landing it had been rumored that Lancel's wounds had left him incapable. Still, he ought to have sense enough to try. His cousin's hold on his new lands would not be secure until he fathered a son on his half-dairy wife. Jamie had begun to rule the impulse that had brought him here. He gave thanks to Ottomore, reminded him about the bath, and had Peck see him out. The Lord's bedchamber had changed since his last visit, and not for the better. Old, stale rushes covered the floor in place of the fine, mirish carpet that had been there previously, and all the furnishings were new and crudely made. Sir Raymond Darry's bed had been large enough to sleep six, with brown velvet draperies and oakwood posts carved with vines and leaves. Lancel's was a lumpy straw pallet, placed beneath the window where the first light of day would be sure to wake him. The other bed had no doubt been burned or smashed or stolen, but even so. When the tub arrived, little Lou pulled off Jamie's boots and helped remove his golden hand. Pack and Garrett hauled water, and Pierre found him something clean to sup in. The girl glanced at him shyly as she shook his doublet out. Jamie was uncomfortably aware of the curve of hip and breast beneath her rough-spun brown dress. He found himself remembering the things that Pierre had whispered to him at Harrenhal, the night that Kyburn sent her to his bed. Sometimes when I'm with some man, she'd said, I close my eyes and pretend it's you on top of me. He was grateful when the bath was deep enough to conceal his arousal. As he lowered himself into the steaming water, he recalled another bath, the one he'd shared with Brienne. He had been feverish and weak from loss of blood, 
and the heat had made him so dizzy he found himself saying things better left unsaid. This time he had no such excuse. Remember your vows. Pia is more fit for Tyrion's bed than yours. Fetch me soap and a stiff brush, he told Peck. Pia, you may leave us. I, my lord. Thank you, my lord. She covered her mouth when she spoke to hide her broken teeth. Do you want her? Jamie asked Peck when she was gone. The squire turned beet red. If she'll have you, take her. She'll teach you a few things you'll find useful on your wedding night, I don't doubt. And you're not like to get a bastard by her. Pia had spread her legs for half his father's army and never quickened. Most like the girl was barren. If you better, though, be kind to her. Kind, my lord? How, how would I? Sweet words, gentle touches. You don't want to wed her, but so long as you're abed, treat her as you would your bride. The lad nodded. My lord, I... Where should I take her? There's never a place to... to... To be alone? Jamie grinned. We'll be at supper several hours. The straw looks lumpy, but it should serve. Peck's eyes grew wide. His lordship's bed? You'll feel annoyed yourself when you're done, if Pia knows her business. And someone ought to make some use of that miserable straw mattress. When he descended for the feast that night, Jamie Lannister wore a doublet of red velvet slashed with cloth of gold and a golden chain studded with black diamonds. He had strapped on his golden hand as well, polished to a fine bright sheen. This was no fit place to wear his whites. His duty awaited him at River Run. A darker need had brought him here. Darius Great Hall was great only by courtesy. Trestle tables crowded it from wall to wall, and the ceiling rafters were black with smoke. Jamie had been seated on the dais, to the right of Lancel's empty chair. "'Will my cousin not be joining us for supper?' he asked as he sat down. "'My lord prefers to fast,' said Lancel's wife, the Lady Amari. "'He's sick with grief for the poor High Septon.' She was a long-legged, full-breasted, strapping girl of some eight and ten years, a healthy wench to look at her, though her pinched, chinless face reminded Jamie of his late and unlamented cousin Cleos, who had always looked somewhat like a weasel. Fasting? He is an even bigger fool than I suspected. His cousin should be busy fathering a little weasel-faced heir on his widow instead of starving himself to death. He wondered what Sir Kevin might have had to say about his son's new fervor. Could that be the reason for his uncle's abrupt departure? Over bowls of bean and bacon soup, Lady Amari told Jamie how her first husband had been slain by Sir Gregor Clegane when the Freys were still fighting for Rob Stark. I begged him not to go, but my pate was also very brave, and swore he was the man to slay that monster. He wanted to make a great name for himself. We all do. When I was a squire, I told myself I'd be the man to slay the smiling knight. The smiling knight? She sounded lost. Who was that? The mountain of my boyhood. Half as big, but twice as mad. An outlaw, long dead. No one who need concern your ladyship. Amorai's lip trembled. Tears rolled from her brown eyes. "'You must forgive my daughter,' said an older woman. Lady Amari had brought a score of phrase to Darry with her, a sister, an uncle, a half-uncle, various cousins, and her mother, who had been born a Darry. She still grieves for her father. "'Outlaws kill him,' sobbed Lady Amari. "'Father had only gone out to ransom Peter Pimple. He brought them the gold they asked for, but they hung him anyway.' Hanged, Amy. Your father was not a tapestry. Lady Maria turned back to Jamie. I believe you knew him, sir. We were squires together once at Craig Hall. He would not go so far as to claim they had been friends. When Jamie had arrived, Merritt Frey 
had been the castle bully, lording it over all the younger boys. Then he tried to bully me. He was very strong. It was the only praise that came to mind. Merritt had been slow and clumsy and stupid, but he was strong. You fought against the Kingswood Brotherhood together, sniffed Lady Amorai. Father used to tell me stories. Father used to boast and lie, you mean. We did. Frey's chief contributions to the fight had consisted of contracting the pox from a camp follower and getting himself captured by the White Fawn. The outlaw queen burned her sigil into his arse before ransoming him back to Sumner Craig Hall. Merritt had not been able to sit down for a fortnight, though Jamie doubted that the red-hot iron was half so nasty as the kettles of shit his fellow squires made him eat once he was returned. Boys are the cruelest creatures on the earth. He slipped his golden hand around his wine cup and raised it up. To Merritt's memory, he said. It was easier to drink to the man than to talk of him. After the toast, Lady Amorai stopped weeping, and the table talk turned to wolves of the four-footed kind. Sir Daniel Frey claimed there were more of them about than even his grandfather could remember. They've lost all fear of men. Packs of them attacked our baggage train on our way down from the twins. Our archers had to feather a dozen before the others fled. Sir Adam Marbrand confessed that their own column had faced similar troubles on their way up from King's Landing. Jimmy concentrated on the fair before him, tearing off chunks of bread with his left hand and fumbling at his wine cup with his right. He watched Adam Marbrand charm the girl beside him, watched Stephen Swift refight the Battle for King's Landing with bread and nuts and carrots. Sir Kenneth pulled a serving girl into his lap, urging her to stroke his horn, whilst Sir Dermot regaled some squires with tales of knight errantry in the rainwood. Farther down the table, Hugo Vance had closed his eyes. Brooding on the mysteries of life, thought Jamie, that or napping between courses. He turned back to Lady Maria. The outlaws who killed your husband, was it Lord Berwick's band? So he thought at first. Though Lady Maria's hair was streaked with grey, she was still a handsome woman. The killers scattered when they left Old Stones. Lord Viprin tracked one band to Fairmarket, but lost them there. Black Walter led hounds and hunters into Hagsmire after the others. The peasants denied seeing them, but when questioned sharply they sang a different song. They spoke of a one-eyed man and another who wore a yellow cloak, and a woman cloaked and hooded. A woman? He would have thought that the white fawn would have taught Merritt to stay clear of outlaw winches. There was a woman in the Kingswood Brotherhood as well. I know of her. How not? Her tone suggested when she left her mark upon my husband. The white fawn was young and fair, they say. This hooded woman is neither. The peasants would have us believe that her face was torn and scarred, and her eyes terrible to look upon. They claim she led the outlaws. Led them? Jamie found that hard to believe. Beric Dondarrion and the Red Priest were not seen. Lady Maria sounded certain. Dondarrion's dead, said Strongbore. The mountain drove a knife through his eye. We have men with us who saw it. That's one tale, said Adam Arbrand. Others will tell you that Lord Beric can't be killed. Sir Harwin says those tales are lies. Lady Amorai wound a braid around her finger. He has promised me Lord Beric's head. He's very gallant. She was blushing beneath her tears. Jamie thought back on the head he'd given to Pia. He could almost hear his little brother chuckle. Whatever became of giving women flowers? Tyrion might have asked. He would have had a few choice words for Harwin Plum as well, though Gallant would not have been one of them. Plum's brothers were big, fleshy fellows, with thick necks and red faces, loud and lusty, 
quick to laugh, quick to anger, quick to forgive. Harmon was a different sort of plum, hard-eyed and taciturn, unforgiving, and deadly, with his hammer in his hand. A good man to command a garrison, but not a man to love. Although, Jamie gazed at Lady Amari. The serving men were bringing out the fish course, a river pike baked in a crust of herbs and crushed nuts. Lancel's lady tasted it, approved, and commanded that the first portion be served to Jamie. As they set the fish before him, she leaned across her husband's place to touch his golden hand. You could kill Lord Berwick, Sir Jamie. You slew the smiling knight. Please, my lord, I beg you, stay and help us with Lord Berwick and the hound. Her pale fingers caressed his golden ones. Does she think I can feel that? The sword of the morning slew the smiling knight, my lady. Sir Arthur Dane, a better knight than me. Jamie pulled back his golden fingers and turned once more to Lady Maria. How far did Black Walter track this hooded woman and her men? His hounds picked up their scent again, north of Hagsmire, the older woman told him. He swears that he was no more than half a day behind them when they vanished into the neck. Let them rot there, declared Sir Kenneth cheerfully. If the gods are good, they'll be swallowed up in quicksand or gobbled down by lizard lions. Or taken in by frog eaters, said Sir Danwell Frey. I would not put it past the Cranach men to shelter outlaws. Would that it were only them, said Lady Maria. Some of the river lords are hand in glove with Lord Berwick's men as well. The small folk, too, sniffed her daughter. Sir Harwin says they hide them and feed them, and when he asks where they have gone, they lie. They lie to their own lords. Have their tongues out, urged Strongbore. Good luck getting answers then, said Jamie. If you want their help, you need to make them love you. That was how Arthur Dane did it, when he wrote against the Kingswood Brotherhood. He paid the small folk for the food we ate, brought their grievances to King Eris, expanded the grazing lands around their villages, even won them the right to fell a certain number of trees each year and take a few of the king's deer during the autumn. The forest folk had looked to Toyne to defend them, but Sir Arthur did more for them than the Brotherhood could ever hope to do, and won them to our side. After that, the rest was easy. The Lord Commander speaks wisely, said Lady Maria. We shall never be rid of these outlaws until the small folk come to love Lancel as much as they once loved my father and grandfather. Jimmy glanced at his cousin's empty place. Lancel will never win their love by praying, though. Lady Amari put on a pout. Sir Jamie, I pray you, do not abandon us. My lord has need of you, and so do I. These are such fearful times. Some nights I can hardly sleep for fear. My place is with the king, my lady. I'll come, offered Strongbore. Once we're done at River Run, I'll be itching for another fight. Not that Beric Dondarrion is like to give me one. I recall the man from Turney's past. A comely lad in a pretty cloak he was, slight and callow. That was before he died, said young Sir Arwood Frey. Death changed him, the small folk say. You can kill him, but he won't stay dead. How do you find a man like that? And there's the hound as well. He slew twenty men at salt pans. Strongbore guffawed. Twenty fat innkeeps, maybe. Twenty serving men pissing in their britches. Twenty begging brothers armed with bowls. Not twenty knights. Not me. There is a knight at salt pans, Sir Arwood insisted. He hid behind his walls whilst Clegane and his mad dogs ravaged through his town. You have not seen the things he did, sir. I have. When the reports reached the twins, I rode down with Harris Hay and his brother Donal and half a hundred men, archers and men-at-arms. We thought it was Lord Berwick's work and hoped to find his trail. 
All that remains of Salt Pans is the castle. And old Sir Quincy, so frightened, he would not open his gates, but shouted down at us from his battlements. The rest is bones and ashes. A whole town. The hound put the buildings to the torch, and the people to the sword, and rode off laughing. The women, you would not believe what he did to some of the women. I will not speak of it at table. It made me sick to see. I cried when I heard, said Lady Amorai. Jamie sipped his wine. What makes you certain it was the hound? What they were describing sounded more like Gregor's work than Sandor's. Sandor had been hard and brutal, yes, but it was his big brother who was the real monster in House Clegane. He was seen, Sir Arwood said. That helm of his is not easily mistaken, nor forgotten, and there were a few who survived to tell the tale. The girl he raped, some boys who hid, a woman we found trapped beneath a blackened beam, the fisherfolk who watched the butchery from their boats. Do not call it butchery, Lady Maria said softly. That gives insult to honest butchers everywhere. Saltpans was the work of some fell beast in human skin. This is a time for beasts, Jamie reflected, for lions and wolves and angry dogs, for ravens and carrion crows. Evil work! Strongbore filled his cup again. Lady Maria, Lady Amorai, your distress has moved me. You have my word. Once River Run has fallen, I shall return to hunt down the hound and kill him for you. Dogs do not frighten me. This one should. Both men were large and powerful, but Sandor Clegane was much quicker, and fought with a savagery that Lyle Craighall could not hope to match. Lady Amorai was thrilled, however. You are a true knight, Sir Lyle, to help a lady in distress. At least she did not call herself a maiden. Jamie reached for his cup and knocked it over. The linen tablecloth drank the wine. As the red stain spread, his companions all pretended not to notice. High table courtesy, he told himself, but it tasted just like pity. He rose abruptly. My lady, pray excuse me. Lady Amrai looked stricken. Would you leave us? There's venison to come, and capons stuffed with leeks and mushrooms. Very fine, no doubt, but I could not eat another bite. I need to see my cousin. Bowing, Jamie left them to their food. Men were eating in the yard as well. The sparrows had gathered round a dozen cook fires to warm their hands against the chill of dusk and watch fat sausages split and sizzle above the flames. There had to be a hundred of them. Useless mouths. Jamie wondered how many sausages his cousin had laid by, and how he intended to feed the sparrows once they were gone. They will be eating rats by winter, unless they can get a harvest in. This late in autumn, the chances of another harvest were not good. He found the sept off the castle's inner ward, a windowless, seven-sided, half-timbered building with carved wood doors and a tiled roof. Three sparrows sat upon its steps. When Jamie approached, they rose. "'Where are you going, my lord?' asked one. He was the smallest of the three, but he had the biggest beard. "'Inside. His lordship's in there praying. His lordship is my cousin.' "'Well, then, my lord,' said a different sparrow, a huge bald man with a seven-pointed star painted over one eye. "'You won't want to bother your cousin at his prayers.' "'Lord Lancel is asking the father above for guidance,' said the third sparrow, the beardless one. A boy, Jamie had thought, but her voice marked her for a woman, dressed in shapeless rags and a shirt of rusted mail. "'He is praying for the soul of the High Septon and all the others who have died.' "'They'll still be dead tomorrow,' Jamie told her. "'The father above has more time than I do. "'Do you know who I am?' "'Some lord,' said the big man with the starry eye. "'Some cripple,' said the small one with the big beard. "'The kingslayer,' said the woman. "'But we're no kings, 
just poor fellows. And you can't go in unless his lordship says you can. She hefted a spiked club, and the small man raised an axe. The doors behind them opened. Let my cousin pass in peace, friends, Ansel said softly. I have been expecting him. The sparrows moved aside. Lancel looked even thinner than he had at King's Landing. He was barefoot and dressed in a plain, rough-spun tunic of untied wool that made him look more like a beggar than a lord. The crown of his head had been shaved smooth, but his beard had grown out a little. To call it peach fuzz would have given insult to the peach. It went queerly with the white hair around his ears. "'Cousin,' said Jamie, when they were alone within the sept, have you lost your bloody wits? I prefer to say I've found my faith. Where is your father? Gone. We quarreled. Lancel knelt before the altar of his other father. Will you pray with me, Jamie? If I pray nicely, will the father give me a new hand? No, but the warrior will give you courage, the smith will lend you strength, and the crone will give you wisdom. It's a hand I need. The seven gods loomed above carved altars, the dark wood gleaming in the candlelight. A faint smell of incense hung in the air. You sleep down here? Each night I make my bed beneath a different altar, and the seven send me visions. Bela the Blessed once had visions, too, especially when he was fasting. How long has it been since you've eaten? My faith is all the nourishment I need. Faith is like porridge, better with milk and honey. I dreamed that you would come. In the dream you knew what I had done, how I'd sinned. You killed me for it. You're more like to kill yourself with all this fasting. Didn't Bela the Blessed fast himself onto a beer? Our lives are candle flames, says the seven-pointed star. Any errant puff of wind can snuff us out. Death is never far in this world, and seven hells await sinners who do not repent their sins. Pray with me, Jamie. If I do, will you eat a bowl of porridge? When his cuz did not answer, Jamie sighed. You should be sleeping with your wife, not with a maid. You need a son with dairy blood if you want to keep this castle. A pile of cold stones. I never asked for it. I never wanted it. I only wanted— Ansel shuddered. Seven saved me, but I wanted to be you. Jamie had to laugh. Better me than blessed Baylor. Darry needs a lion, cuz. So does your little Frey. She gets moist between the legs every time someone mentions hard stone. If she hasn't bedded him yet, she will soon. If she loves him— I wish them joy of one another. A lion shouldn't have horns. You took the girl to wife. I said some words and gave her a red cloak, but only to please father. Marriage requires consummation. King Baylor was made to wed his sister Dana, but they never lived as man and wife, and he put her aside as soon as he was crowned. The rum would have been better served if he had closed his eyes and fucked her. I know enough history to know that. In any case, you're not like to be taken for Baylor the Blessed. No, Lancel allowed. He was a rare spirit, pure and brave and innocent, untouched by all the evils of the world. I am a sinner, with much and more to atone for. Jamie put his hand on his cousin's shoulder. What do you know of sin, cuz? I killed my king. The brave man slays with a sword, the craven with a wineskin. We are both kingslayers, sir. Robert was no true king. Some might even say that a stag is a lion's natural prey. Jamie could feel the bones beneath his cousin's skin. And something else as well. Lancel was wearing a hair shirt underneath his tunic. What else did you do to require so much atonement? Tell me. His cousin bowed his head, tears running down his cheeks. 
Those tears were all the answer Jamie needed. You killed the king, he said. Then you fucked the queen. I never... Lay with my sweet sister. Say it, say it. Never spilled my seed in, in her... Cunt, suggested Jamie. Womb, Lancel finished. It is not treason unless you finish inside. I gave her comfort after the king died. You were a captive. Your father was in the field. And your brother? She was afraid of him, and with good reason. He made me betray her. Did he? Lancel and Sir Osmond, and how many more? Was the part about Moon Boy just a jibe? Did you force her? No. I loved her. I wanted to protect her. You wanted to be me. His phantom fingers itched. The day his sister had come to White Sword Tower to beg him to renounce his vows, she had laughed after he refused her, and boasted of having lied to him a thousand times. Jamie had taken that for a clumsy attempt to hurt him as he'd hurt her. It may have been the only true thing that she ever said to me. Do not think ill of the Queen, Lancel pleaded. All flesh is weak, Jamie. No harm came of our sin. No, no bastard. No, bastards are seldom made upon the belly. He wondered what his cousin would say if he were to confess his own sins the three treasons Circe had named Joffrey, Toman, and Marcella. I was angry with her grace after the battle, but the High Septon said I must forgive her. You confessed your sins to His High Holiness, did you? He prayed for me when I was wounded. He was a good man. He's a dead man. They rang the bells for him. He wondered if his cousin had any notion what fruit his words had borne. Lancel? You're a bloody fool. You are not wrong, said Lancel, but my folly is behind me, sir. I have asked the Father above to show me the way, and he has. I am renouncing this lordship and this wife. Hearthstone is welcome to the both of them, if he likes. On the morrow I will return to King's Landing and swear my sword to the new High Septon and the Seven. I mean to take vows and join the warrior's sons. The boy was not making sense. The warrior's sons were proscribed three hundred years ago. The new High Septon has revived them. He sent out a call for worthy knights to pledge their lives and swords to the service of the Seven. The poor fellows are to be restored as well. Why would the Iron Throne allow that? One of the early Targaryen kings had fought for years to suppress the two military orders, Jamie recalled though he did not remember which. Mega, perhaps, or the first Jaehaerys. Tyrion would have known. His High Holiness writes that King Tommen has given his consent. I will show you the letter, if you like. Even if this is true, you are a lion of the rock, a lord. You have a wife, a castle, lands to defend, people to protect. If the gods are good, you will have sons of your blood to follow you. Why would you throw all that away for, for some vow? Why did you? asked Lancel softly. For honor, Jamie might have said, for glory. That would have been a lie, though. Honor and glory had played their parts, but most of it had been for Circe. A laugh escaped his lips. Is it the high septon you're running to? or my sweet sister. Pray on that one, cuz. Pray hard. Will you pray with me, Jamie? He glanced about the sept, at the gods. The mother, full of mercy. The father, stern in judgment. The warrior, one hand upon his sword. The stranger in the shadows, his half-human face concealed beneath a hooded mantle. I thought that I was the warrior and Circe was the maid. But all the time she was the stranger, hiding her true face from my gaze. Pray for me if you like, he told his cousin. I've forgotten all the words. The sparrows were still fluttering about the steps when Jamie stepped back out into the night. Thank you, 
he told them. I feel ever so much holier now. He went and found Sir Illyn and a pair of swords. The castle yard was full of eyes and ears. To escape them, they sought out Darry's God's Wood. There were no sparrows there, only trees bare and brooding, their black branches scratching at the sky. A mat of dead leaves crunched beneath their feet. Do you see that window, sir? Jamie used a sword to point. That was Raymond Darry's bedchamber, where King Robert slept on our return from Winterfell. Ned Stark's daughter had run off after her wolf-savaged Joff, you'll recall. My sister wanted the girl to lose a hand, the old penalty for striking one of the blood royal. Robert told her she was cruel and mad. They fought for half the night. Well, Circe fought, and Robert drank. Past midnight the queen summoned me inside. The king was passed out, snoring on the mirish carpet. I asked my sister if she wanted me to carry him to bed. She told me I should carry her to bed, and shrugged out of her robe. I took her on Raymond Darry's bed after stepping over Robert. If his grace had woken, I would have killed him there and then. He would not have been the first king to die upon my sword. But you know that story, don't you? He slashed at a tree branch, shearing it in half. As I was fucking her, Circe cried, I want! I thought that she meant me. But it was the Stark girl that she wanted, maimed or dead. The things I do for love. It was only by chance that Stark's own men found the girl before me. If I had come on her first— The pockmarks on Sir Illyn's face were black holes in the torchlight, as dark as Jamie's soul. He made that clacking sound. He is laughing at me, realized Jamie Lannister. For all I know, you fucked my sister too, you pock-faced bastard, he spat out. Well, shut your bloody mouth, and kill me if you can. Brienne The Septry stood upon an upthrust island half a mile from the shore, where the wide mouth of the trident widened further still to kiss the Bay of Crabs. Even from shore its prosperity was apparent. Its slope was covered with terraced fields, with fish ponds down below and a windmill above, its wooden sailcloth blades turning slowly in the breeze off the bay. Brienne could see sheep grazing on the hillside and storks wading in the shallow waters around the ferry landing. Chalk Pans is just across the water, said Septon Maribald, pointing north across the bay. The brothers will ferry us over on the morning tide, though I fear what we shall find there. Let us enjoy a good hot meal before we face that. The brothers always have a bone to spare for Dog. Dog barked and wagged his tail. The tide was going out now, and swiftly. The water that separated the island from the shore was receding, leaving behind a broad expanse of glistening brown mud flats dotted by tidal pools that glittered like golden coins in the afternoon sun. Brienne scratched the back of her neck, where an insect had bitten her. She had pinned her hair up, and the sun had warmed her skin. "'Why do they call it the Quiet Isle?' asked Podrick. "'Those who dwell here are penitents, who seek to atone for their sins through contemplation, prayer, and silence.' Only the elder brother and his proctors are permitted to speak, and the proctors only for one day of every seven. The silent sisters never speak, said Padrick. I heard they don't have any tongues. Septon Maribald smiled. Mothers have been cowing their daughters with that tale since I was your age. There was no truth to it then, and there is none now. A vow of silence is an act of contrition a sacrifice by which we prove our devotion to the seven above. For a mute to take a vow of silence would be akin to a legless man giving up the dance. He led his donkey down the slope, beckoning them to follow. If you would sleep beneath a roof tonight, you must climb off your horses and cross the mud with me. The path of faith, we call it. Only the faithful may cross safely. 
The wicked are swallowed by the quicksands or drowned when the tide comes rushing in. None of you are wicked, I hope. Even so, I would be careful where I set my feet. Walk only where I walk, and you shall reach the other side. The path of faith was a crooked one. Brienne could not help but note. Though the island seemed to rise to the northeast of where they left the shore, Septim Maribald did not make directly for it. Instead, he started due east, toward the deeper waters of the bay, which shimmered blue and silver in the distance. The soft brown mud squished up between his toes. As he walked, he paused from time to time to probe ahead with his quarterstaff. Dog stayed near his heels, sniffing at every rock, shell, and clump of seaweed. For once he did not bound ahead or stray. Brienne followed, taking care to keep close to the line of prints left by the dog, the donkey, and the holy man. Then came Padrick, and last of all, Sir Hyle. A hundred yards out, Maribald turned abruptly toward the south, so his back was almost to the septry. He proceeded in that direction for another hundred yards, leading them between two shallow tidal pools. Dog stuck his nose in one and yelped when a crab pinched it with his claw. A brief but furious struggle ensued before the dog came trotting back, wet and mud-spattered, with a crab between his jaws. "'Isn't that where we want to go?' Sir Hyle called out from behind them, pointing at the sceptre. "'We seem to be walking every way but toward it.' Faith, urged Septon Maribald, believe, persist, and follow, and we shall find the peace we seek. The flats shimmered wetly all about them, mottled in half a hundred hues. The mud was such a dark brown, it appeared almost black, but there were swathes of golden sand as well, upthrust rocks both grey and red, and tangles of black and green seaweed. Storks, stalked through the tidal pools and left their footprints all around them, and crabs scuttled across the surface of shallow waters. The air smelled of brine and rot, and the ground sucked at their feet and let them go only reluctantly with a pop and a squelchy sigh. Septon Maribald turned and turned again and yet again. His footprints filled up with water as soon as he moved on. By the time the ground grew firmer and began to rise beneath the feet, they had walked at least a mile and a half. Three men were waiting for them as they clambered up the broken stones that ringed the isle's shoreline. They were clad in the brown and dun robes of brothers with wide bell sleeves and pointed cowls. Two had wound lengths of wool about the lower halves of their faces as well, so all that could be seen of them were their eyes. The third brother was the one to speak. Septon Maribald, he called. It has been nigh upon a year. You are welcome, your companions as well. Dog wagged his tail, and Maribald shook mud from his feet. Might we beg your hospitality for a night? Yes, of course. There's to be fish stew this evening. Will you require the ferry in the morning? If it is not too much to ask. Maribald turned to his fellow travellers. Brother Narbert is a proctor of the order, so he is allowed to speak one day of every seven. Brother, these good folk helped me on my way. Sir Hyle Hunt is a gallant from the Reach. The lad is Padrick Payne, late of the Westerland. And this is Lady Brienne, known as the Maid of Tarth. Brother Narbert drew up short. A woman? Yes, brother. Brienne unpinned her hair and shook it out. Do you have no women here? Not at present, said Narbert. Those women who do visit come to us sick or hurt or heavy with child. The seven have blessed our elder brother with healing hands. He has restored many a man to health that even the maesters could not cure, and many a woman too. I am not sick or hurt or heavy with child. Lady Brienne is a warrior maid, confided Septon Mirabold, hunting for the hound. I? Norbert seemed taken aback. To what end? 
Rieni touched Oathkeeper's hilt. His, she said. The proctor studied her. You are brawny for a woman, it is true, but mayhaps I should take you up to Elder Brother. He will have seen you crossing the mud. Come. Norbert led them along a pebbled path and through a grove of apple trees to a whitewashed stable with a peaked thatch roof. You may leave your animals here. Brother Gillum will see that they are fed and watered. The stable was more than three-quarters empty. At one end were half a dozen mules, being tended by a bandy-legged little brother whom Brienne took for Gillum. Way down at the far end, well away from the other animals, a huge black stallion trumpeted at the sound of their voices and kicked at the door of his stall. Sir Hyde gave the big horse an admiring look as he was handing his reins to Brother Gillum. A handsome beast! Brother Norbert sighed. The seven send us blessings, and the seven send us trials. Handsome he may be, but Driftwood was surely whelped in hell. When we sought to harness him to a plough, he kicked Brother Ronnie and broke his shinbone in two places. We had hoped Gelding might improve the beast's ill temper, but Brother Gillum, will you show them? Brother Gillum lowered his cowl. Underneath he had a mop of blonde hair, a tonsured scalp, and a blood-stained bandage where he should have had an ear. Padrick gasped. The horse bit off your ear? Gillum nodded and covered his head again. Forgive me, brother, said Sir Hyle, but I might take the other ear if you approached me with a pair of shears. The jest did not sit well with Brother Norbert. You are a knight, sir. Driftwood is a beast of burden. The smith gave men horses to help them in their labors. He turned away. If you will, Elder Brother will no doubt be waiting. The slope was steeper than it had looked from across the mudflats. To ease it, the brothers had erected a flight of wooden steps that wandered back and forth across the hillside and amongst the buildings. After a long day in the saddle, Brienne was glad for a chance to stretch her legs. They passed a dozen brothers of the order on the way up, cowled men in dun and brown, who gave them curious looks as they went by, but spoke no word of greeting. One was leading a pair of milk cows toward a low barn roofed in sod. Another worked a butter churn. On the upper slopes they saw three boys driving sheep, and higher still they passed a lich yard where a brother bigger than Brienne was struggling to dig a grave. From the way he moved it was plain to see that he was lame. As he flung a spade full of the stony soil over one shoulder, some chanced to spatter against their feet. "'Be more watchful there,' chided Brother Norbert. "'Septon Maribold might have gotten a mouthful of dirt.' The gravedigger lowered his head. When Dog went to sniff him, he dropped his spade and scratched his ear. "'A novice,' explained Norbert. "'Who is the grave for?' asked Sir Hyle, as they resumed their climb up the wooden steps. "'Brother Clement, may the father judge him justly.' "'Was he old?' asked Padrick Payne. "'If you consider eight and forty old, aye. But it was not the years that killed him. He died of wounds he got at salt pans. He had taken some of our mead to the market there, on the day the outlaws descended on the town.' "'The hound?' said Brienne. "'Another, just as brutal. "'He cut poor Clement's tongue out when he would not speak. "'Since he had taken a vow of silence, "'the raider said he had no need of it. "'The elder brother will know more. "'He keeps the worst of the tidings from outside to himself, "'so as not to disturb the tranquillity of the sceptre. "'Many of our brothers came here to escape the horrors of the world, "'not to dwell upon them. "'Brother Clement was not the only wounded man amongst us. Some wounds do not show. Brother Norbert gestured to their right. There lies our summer arbor. The grapes are small and tart, but make a drinkable wine. We brew our own ale as well, and our mead and cider are far famed. The war has never come here, Brienne said. 
Not this war, praise the seven. Our prayers protect us. And your tides, suggested Maribald. Dog barked agreement. The brow of the hill was crowned by a low wall of unmortared stone encircling a cluster of large buildings. The windmill, its sails creaking as they turned, the cloisters where the brothers slept, and the common hall where they took their meals, a wooden sept for prayer and meditation. The sept had windows of leaded glass, wide doors carved with likenesses of the mother and the father, and a seven-sided steeple with a walk on top. Behind it was a vegetable garden where some older brothers were pulling weeds. Brother Norbert led the visitors around a chestnut tree to a wooden door set in the side of the hill. A cave with a door, Sir Hyle said, surprised. Septim Maribald smiled. It is called the Hermit's Hole. The first holy man to find his way here lived therein, and worked such wonders that others came to join him. That was two thousand years ago, they say. The door came somewhat later. Perhaps two thousand years ago the Hermit's Hole had been a damp, dark place, floored with dirt and echoing to the sounds of dripping water, but no longer. The cave that Brienne and her companions entered had been turned into a warm, snug sanctum. Woolen carpets covered the ground, tapestries the walls. Tall beeswax candles gave more than ample light. The furnishings were strange, but simple. A long table, a settle, a chest, several tall cases full of books and chairs. All were made from driftwood, oddly shaped pieces, cunningly joined together, and polished till they shone a deep gold in the candlelight. The elder brother was not what Brienne had expected. He could hardly be called elder for a start, whereas the brothers weeding in the garden had had the stooped shoulders and bent backs of old men, he stood straight and tall, and moved with the vigor of a man in the prime of his years. Nor did he have the gentle, kindly face she expected of a healer. His head was large and square, his eyes shrewd, his nose veined and red. Though he wore a tonsure, his scalp was as stubbly as his heavy jaw. He looks more like a man made to break bones than to heal one, thought the maid of Tarth, as the elder brother strode across the room to embrace Septon Maribald and Pat Dog. It is always a glad day when our friends Maribald and Dog honor us with another visit, he announced before turning to his other guests. And new faces are always welcome. We see so few of them. Maribald performed the customary courtesies before seating himself upon the settle. Unlike Septon Norbert, the elder brother did not seem dismayed by Brienne's sex, but his smile did flicker and fade when the Septon told him why she and Sir Hyle had come. "'I see,' was all he said before he turned away with, "'You must be thirsty. Please have some of our sweet cider to wash the dust of travel from your throats.' He poured for them himself. The cups were carved from driftwood, too, no two the same. When Brienne complimented them, he said, "'My lady is too kind. All we do is cut and polish the wood. We are blessed here. But the river meets the bay, the currents and the tides wrestle one against the other, and many strange and wondrous things are pushed toward us to wash up on our shores. Driftwood is the least of it. We have found silver cups and iron pots.' sacks of wool and bolts of silk, rusted helms and shining swords, ay, and rubies. That interested Sir Hyle. Rager's rubies? It may be. Who can say? The battle was long leagues from here, but the river is tireless and patient. Six have been found. We are all waiting for the seventh. "'Better rubies than bones,' Septon Maribald was rubbing his foot, the mud flaking off beneath his finger. "'Not all the river's gifts are pleasant. The good brothers collect the dead as well. Drowned cows, drowned deer, dead pigs swollen up to half the size of horses. Ay, and corpses. Too many corpses these days. 
the elder brother sighed. Our gravedigger knows no rest. Rivermen, westermen, northmen, all wash up here. Knights and knaves alike. We bury them side by side, Stark and Lannister, Blackwood and Bracken, Frey and Darry. That is the duty the river asks of us in return for all its gifts, and we do it as best we can. Sometimes we find a woman, though, or worse, a little child. Those are the cruelest gifts. He turned to Septon Maribald. I hope that you have time to absolve us of our sins. Since the raiders slew old Septon Bennett, we have had no one to hear confession. I shall make time, said Maribald, though I hope you have some better sins than the last time I came through. Dog barked. You see, even Dog was bored. Padrick Payne was puzzled. I thought no one could talk. Well, not no one. The brothers. The other brothers. Not you. We are allowed to break silence when confessing, said the elder brother. It is hard to speak of sin with signs and nods. Did they burn the sept at salt pans? asked Hyle Hunt. The smile vanished. They burned everything at salt pans, save the castle. Only that was made of stone, though it had as well been made of suet for all the good it did the town. It fell to me to treat some of the survivors. The fisher folk brought them across the bay to me after the flames had gone out, and they deemed it safe to land. One poor woman had been raped a dozen times, and her breasts— My lady, you wear man's mail, so I shall not spare you these horrors. Her breasts had been torn and chewed and eaten, as if by some cruel beast. I did what I could for her, though that was little enough. As she lay dying, her worst curses were not for the men who had raped her, nor the monster who devoured her living flesh, but for Sir Quincy Cox, who barred his gates when the outlaws entered the town, and sat safe behind stone walls as his people screamed and died. Sir Quincy is an old man, said Septon Maribald gently. His sons and good sons are far away or dead. His grandsons are still boys, and he has two daughters. What could he have done, one man against so many? He could have tried, Brienne thought. He could have died. Old or young, a true knight is sworn to protect those who are weaker than himself, or die in the attempt. True words and wise, the elder brother said to Septon Maribald. When you cross the salt pans, no doubt Sir Quincy will ask you for forgiveness. I am glad that you are here to give it. I could not. He put aside the driftwood cup and stood. The supper bell will sound soon. My friends, will you come with me to the sept to pray for the souls of the good folk of salt pans before we sit down to break bread and share some meat and mead? Gladly, said Maribald. Dog barked. Their supper in the sceptre was as strange a meal as Brienne had ever eaten though not at all unpleasant. The food was plain, but very good. There were loaves of crusty bread, still warm from the ovens, crocks of fresh churned butter, honey from the septry's hives, and a thick stew of crabs, mussels, and at least three different kinds of fish. Septon Maribald and Sir Hyle drank the mead the brothers made, and pronounced it excellent, whilst she and Padrick contented themselves with more sweet cider. Nor was the meal a somber one. Maribald pronounced a prayer before the food was served, and whilst the brothers ate at four long trestle tables, one of their number played for them on the high harp, filling the hall with soft, sweet sounds. When the elder brother excused the musician to take his own meal, Brother Norbert and another proctor took turns reading from the seven-pointed star. By the time the readings were completed, the last of the food had been cleared away by the novices whose task it was to serve. Most were boys near Padrick's age or younger, but there were grown men as well, 
amongst them the big grave-digger they had encountered on the hill, who walked with the awkward lurching gait of one half-crippled. As the hall emptied, the elder brother asked Norbert to show Padrick and Sir Hyle to their pallets in the cloisters. "'You will not mind sharing a cell, I hope. It is not large, but you will find it comfortable.' "'I want to stay with Sir,' said Padrick. "'I mean, my lady.' "'What you and Lady Brienne may do elsewhere is between you and the seven, said Brother Norbert. "'But on the quiet isle, men and women do not sleep beneath the same roof unless they are wed. "'We have some modest cottages set aside for the women who visit us, "'be they noble ladies or common village girls,' said the elder brother. "'They are not oft used, but we keep them clean and dry.' Lady Brienne, would you allow me to show you the way? Yes, thank you. Padrick, go with Sir Hyle. We are guests of the Holy Brothers here. Beneath their roof, their rules. The women's cottages were on the east side of the isle. Looking out over a broad expanse of mud and the distant waters of the Bay of Crabs. It was colder here than on the sheltered side, and wilder. The hill was steeper, and the path meandered back and forth through weeds and briars, wind-carved rocks, and twisted, thorny trees that clung tenaciously to the stony hillside. The elder brother brought a lantern to light their way down. At one turn he paused. On a clear night you could see the fires of salt pans from here, across the bay, just there. He pointed. There's nothing. Brienne, he said. Only the castle remains. Even the fisherfolk are gone, the fortunate few who were out on the water when the raiders came. They watched their houses burn and listened to screams and cries float across the harbor, too fearful to land their boats. When at last they came ashore, it was to bury friends and kin. What is there for them at salt pans now but bones and bitter memories? They have moved to Maidenpool or other towns. He gestured with a lantern, and they resumed their descent. Saltpans was never an important port, but ships did call there from time to time. That was what the raiders wanted, a galley or a cog to carry them across the narrow sea. When none was at hand, they took their rage and desperation out upon the townsfolk. I wonder, my lady, what do you hope to find there? A girl, she told him, a high-born maid of three and ten, with a fair face and auburn hair. Sansa Stark, the name was softly said. You believe this poor child is with the hound? The Dornishman said that she was on her way to River Run. Timion, he was a sellsword, one of the brave companions, a killer and a raper and a liar, but I do not think he died about this. He said that the hound stole her and carried her away. I see. The path turned, and there were the cottages ahead of them. The elder brother had called them modest. That they were. They looked like beehives made of stone, low and rounded, windowless. This one, he said, indicating the nearest cottage, the only one with smoke rising from the smoke hole in the center of its roof. Brienne had to duck when entering to keep from banging her head against the lintel. Inside she found a dirt floor, a straw pallet, furs and blankets to keep her warm, a basin of water, a flagon of cider, some bread and cheese, a small fire, and two low chairs. The elder brother sat in one and put the lantern down. "'May I stay a while?' I feel that we should talk. If you wish. Brienne undid her sword belt and hung it from the second chair, then sat cross-legged on the pallet. Your Dornishman did not lie, the elder brother began, but I fear you did not understand him. You are chasing the wrong wolf, my lady. Edward Stark had two daughters. It was the other one that Sander Clegane made off with, the younger one. Arya Stark? Brienne stared, open-mouthed, astonished. 
You know this? Lady Sansa's sister is alive? Then, said the elder brother, now I do not know. She may have been amongst the children slain at salt pans. The words were a knife in her belly. No, Brienne thought. No, that would be too cruel. May have been. Meaning that you are not certain? I am certain that the child was with Sandra Clegane at the inn beside the crossroads. The one old Masha Heddle used to keep, before the lions hanged her. I am certain they were on their way to salt pans. Beyond that? No. I do not know where she is, or even if she lives. There is one thing I do know, however. The man you hunt is dead. That was another shock. How did he die? By the sword, as he had lived. You know this for a certainty? I buried him myself. I can tell you where his grave lies, if you wish. I covered him with stones to keep the carrion-eaters from digging up his flesh, and set his helm atop the cairn to mark his final resting place. That was a grievous error. Some other wayfarer found my marker and claimed it for himself. The man who raped and killed at salt pans was not Sander Clegane, though he may be as dangerous. The Riverlands are full of such scavengers. I will not call them wolves. Wolves are nobler than that. And so are dogs, I think. I know a little of this man, Sander Clegane. He was Prince Joffrey's sworn shield for many a year. And even here we would hear tell of his deeds, both good and ill. If even half of what we heard was true, this was a bitter, tormented soul, a sinner who mocked both gods and men. He served, but found no pride in service. He fought, but took no joy in victory. He drank to drown his pain in a sea of wine. He did not love, nor was he loved himself. It was hate that drove him. Though he committed many sins, he never sought forgiveness. Where other men dream of love or wealth or glory, this man, Sander Clegane, dreamed of slaying his own brother, a sin so terrible it makes me shudder just to speak of it. Yet that was the bread that nourished him, the fuel that kept his fires burning. Ignoble as it was, the hope of seeing his brother's blood upon his blade was all this sad and angry creature lived for. And even that was taken from him. When Prince Oberyn of Dorne stabbed Sir Gregor with a poisoned spear. You sound as if you pity him, said Brienne. I did. You would have pitied him as well if you had seen him at the end. I came upon him by the trident, drawn by his cries of pain. He begged me for the gift of mercy, but I am sworn not to kill again. Instead, I bathed his favored brow with river water and gave him wine to drink and a poultice for his wound. But my efforts were too little and too late. The hound died there, in my arms. You may have seen a big black stallion in our stables. That was his war-horse, Stranger. A blasphemous name. We prefer to call him Driftwood, as he was found beside the river. I fear he has his former master's nature. The horse. She had seen the stallion, had heard it kicking, but she had not understood. Destriers were trained to kick and bite. In war they were a weapon, like the men who rode them, like the hound. It is true, then, she said dully. Sander Clegane is dead. He is at rest. The elder brother paused. You are young, child. I have counted four and forty name days, which makes me more than twice your age, I think. Would it surprise you to learn that I was once a knight? No. You look more like a knight than you do a holy man. It was written in his chest and shoulders, and across that thick, square jaw. Why would you give up knighthood? I never chose it. My father was a knight, and his before him. So were my brothers. Every one. 
I was trained for battle since the day they deemed me old enough to hold a wooden sword. I saw my share of them, and did not disgrace myself. I had women, too, and there I did disgrace myself, for some I took by force. There was a girl I wished to marry, the younger daughter of a petty lord, but I was my father's third-born son, and had neither land nor wealth to offer her. Only a sword, a horse, a shield. All in all, I was a sad man. When I was not fighting, I was drunk. My life was writ in red, in blood and wine. When did it change? asked Brienne. When I died in the Battle of the Trident. I fought for Prince Rhaegar, though he never knew my name. I could not tell you why, save that the lord I served served a lord who served a lord who had decided to support the dragon rather than the stag. Had he decided elsewise, I might have been on the other side of the river. The battle was a bloody thing. The singers would have us believe it was all Rhaegar and Robert struggling in the stream for a woman both of them claimed to love. But I assure you, other men were fighting too, and I was one. I took an arrow through the thigh and another through the foot, and my horse was killed from under me. Yet I fought on. I can still remember how desperate I was to find another horse, for I had no coin to buy one, and without a horse I would no longer be a knight. That was all that I was thinking of, if truth be told. I never saw the blow that felled me. I heard hooves behind my back and thought, a horse! But before I could turn, something slammed into my head and knocked me back into the river, where by rights I should have drowned. Instead, I woke here, upon the quiet isle. The elder brother told me I had washed up on the tide. Naked is my name day. I can only think that someone found me in the shallows, stripped me of my armor, boots, and breeches, and pushed me back out into the deeper water. The river did the rest. We are all born naked, so I suppose it was only fitting that I come into my second life the same way. I spent the next ten years in silence. I see. Brienne did not know why he was telling her all of this, or what else she ought to say. Do you? He leaned forward, his big hands on his knees. If so, give up this quest of yours. The hound is dead, and in any case he never had your senses, Stark. As for this beast who wears his helm, he will be found and hanged. The wars are ending, and these outlaws cannot survive the peace. Randall Tarley is hunting them from Maidenpool, and Walder Frey from the Twins. And there is a new young lord in Derry, a pious man who will surely set his lands to rights. Go home, child. You have a home, which is more than many can say in these dark days. You have a noble father who must surely love you. Consider his grief if you should never return. Perhaps they will bring your sword and shield to him after you have fallen. Perhaps he will even hang them in his hall and look on them with pride. But if you were to ask him, I know he would tell you that he would sooner have a living daughter than a shattered shield. A daughter? Brienne's eyes filled with tears. He deserves that. A daughter who could sing to him and grace his hall and bear him grandsons. He deserves a son, too, a strong and gallant son to bring honor to his name. Galadon drowned when I was four, and he was eight, though, and Alisanne and Ariane died still in the cradle. I am the only child the gods let him keep, the freakish one, not fit to be a son or daughter. All of it came pouring out of Brienne then, like black blood from a wound, the betrayals and betrothals, Red Ronnet and his rose, Lord Renly dancing with her, the wager for her maidenhead, the bitter tears she shed the night her king wed Marjorie Tyrrell, the melee at Bitterbridge, the rainbow cloak that she had been so proud of, the shadow in the king's pavilion, Renly dying in her arms, River Run and Lady Caitlin, the voyage down the trident, dueling Jamie in the woods, the bloody mummers, 
Jamie crying, Sapphires! Jamie in the tub at Harren Hall with steam rising from his body. The taste of Vargo Holt's blood when she bit down on his ear. The bear pit. Jamie leaping down under the sand, the long ride to King's Landing, Sansa Stark, the vow she'd sworn to Jamie, the vow she'd sworn to Lady Caitlin, Oathkeeper, Duskendale, Maidenpool, Nimble Dick and Cracklaw, and the whispers, the men she'd killed. I have to find her, she finished. There are others looking, all wanting to capture her and sell her to the Queen. I have to find her first. I promised Jamie. Oathkeeper, he named the sword. I have to try to save her or die in the attempt. Circe A thousand ships! The little queen's brown hair was tousled and uncombed, and the torchlight made her cheeks look flushed, as if she had just come from some man's embrace. Your grace, this must be answered fiercely. Her last word rang off the rafters and echoed through the cavernous throne room. Seated on her gold and crimson high seat beneath the iron throne, Circe could feel a growing tightness in her neck. Must, she thought. She dares say must to me. She itched to slap the Tyrell girl across the face. She should be on her knees, begging for my help. Instead, she presumes to tell her rightful queen what she must do. A thousand ships, Sir Harris Swift was wheezing. Surely not. No lord commands a thousand ships. Some frightened fool has counted double agreed Orton Merriweather. That, or Lord Tyrell's bannermen are lying to us, puffing up the numbers of the foe, so we will not think them lax. The torches on the back wall threw the long, barbed shadow of the iron throne halfway to the doors. The far end of the hall was lost in darkness, and Circe could not but feel that the shadows were closing around her, too. My enemies are everywhere, and my friends are useless. She had only to glance at her counselors to know that. Only Lord Kyburn and Orain Waters seemed awake. The others had been roused from bed by Marjorie's messengers pounding on their doors, and stood there rumpled and confused. Outside, the night was black and still. The castle and the city slept. Boris Blount and Marin Trant seemed to be sleeping too, albeit on their feet. Even Osmond Kettleblack was yawning. Not Loris, though. Not our knight of flowers. He stood behind his little sister, a pale shadow with a long sword on his hip. Half as many ships would still be five hundred, my lord, Waters pointed out to Orton Merriweather. Only the arbor has enough strength at sea to oppose a fleet that size. What of your new dromons? asked Sir Harris. The longships of the Iron Men cannot stand before our Drummonds, surely. King Robert's hammer is the mightiest warship in all Westeros. She was, said Waters. Sweet Circe will be her equal, once complete, and Lord Tywin will be twice the size of either. Only half are fitted out, however, and none is fully crewed. Even when they are, the numbers would be greatly against us. The common longship is small compared to our galleys, this is true, but the ironmen have larger ships as well. Lord Balan's great kraken and the warships of the iron fleet were made for battle, not for raids. They are the equal of our lesser war galleys in speed and strength, and most are better crewed and captained. The ironmen live their whole lives at sea. Robert should have scoured the isles after Balan Greyjoy rose against him, Cersei thought. He smashed their fleet, burned their towns, and broke their castles. But when he had them on their knees, he let them up again. He should have made another island of their skulls. That was what her father would have done. But Robert never had the stomach that a king requires if he hopes to keep peace in the realm. The Iron Men have not dared raid the Reach since Dagon Greyjoy sat the sea stone chair, she said. Why would they do so now? What has emboldened them? 
Their new king. Kyben stood with his hands, hidden up his sleeves. Lord Balan's brother. The crow's eye, he is called. Carrion crows make their feasts upon the carcasses of the dead and dying, said Grand Maester Pissell. They do not descend upon hale and healthy animals. Lord Euron will gorge himself on gold and plunder, aye, but as soon as we move against him, he will back to Pike, as Lord Dagon was wont to do in his day. You are wrong, said Marjorie Tyrell. Reavers do not come in such strength. A thousand ships? Lord Hewitt and Lord Chester are slain, as well as Lord Ceres' son and heir. Ceres has fled to High Garden with what few ships remain him, and Lord Grimm is a prisoner in his own castle. Willis says that the Iron King has raised up four lords of his own in their places. Willis, Cersei thought, the cripple. He is to blame for this. That oaf Mace Tyrell left the defense of the Reach in the hands of a hapless weakling. It is a long voyage from the Iron Isles to the Shields, she pointed out. How could a thousand ships come all that way without being seen? Willis believes that they did not follow the coast, said Marjorie. They made the voyage out of sight of land, sailing far out into the sunset sea and swooping back in from the west. More like the cripple did not have his watchtowers manned, and now he fears to have us know it. The little queen is making excuses for her brother. Circe's mouth was dry. I need a cup of arbor gold. If the ironmen decided to take the arbor next, the whole realm might soon be going thirsty. Stannis may have had a hand in this. Balin Greyjoy offered my lord father an alliance. Perhaps his son has offered one to Stannis. Bissell frowned. What would Lord Stannis gain by— He gains another foothold. And plunder, that as well. Stannis needs gold to pay his cell swords. By raiding in the west, he hopes he can distract us from Dragonstone and Storm's End. Lord Merriweather nodded. A diversion. Stannis is more cunning than we knew. Your grace is clever to have seen through his ploy. Lord Stannis is striving to win the Northmen to his cause, said Pissell. If he befriends the Ironborn, he cannot hope. The Northmen will not have him, said Circe, wondering how such a learned man could be so stupid. Lord Manderley hacked the head and hands off the Onion Knight. We have that from the phrase, and half a dozen other northern lords have rallied to Lord Bolton. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Where else can Stannis turn but to the Iron Men and the Wildlings, the enemies of the North? But if he thinks that I am going to walk into his trap, he is a bigger fool than you. She turned back to the little queen. The Shield Islands belong to the Reach. Grim and Sere and the rest are sworn to Highgarden. It is for Highgarden to answer this. Highgarden shall answer, said Marjorie Tyrell. Willis has sent word to Leighton Hightower in Old Town, so he can see to his own defenses. Garland is gathering men to retake the Isles. The best part of our power remains with my lord father, though. We must send word to him at Storm's End, at once. And lift the siege? Circe did not care for Marjorie's presumption. She says, at once, to me. Does she take me for her handmaid? I have no doubt that Lord Stannis would be pleased by that. Have you been listening, my lady? If he can draw our eyes away from Dragonstone and Storm's End to these rocks. Rocks? gasped Marjorie. Did your grace say rocks? The Knight of Flowers put a hand upon his sister's shoulder. If it please your grace, from those rocks the Iron Men threatened Old Town and the Arbor. From strongholds on the shields, raiders can sail up the Mander into the very heart of the Reach, as they did of old. With enough men, they might even threaten Highgarden. Truly, said the Queen, all innocence. Why, then, your brave brothers had best rouse them off those rocks. 
and quickly. How would the Queen suggest they accomplish that, without sufficient ships? asked Sir Loras. Willis and Garland can raise ten thousand men within a fortnight, and twice that in a moon's turn, but they cannot walk on water, Your Grace. High Garden sits above the Mander, so she reminded him. You and your vassals command a thousand leagues of coast. Are there no fisherfolk along your shores? Do you have no pleasure barges, no ferries, no river galleys, no skiffs? Many and more, Sir Loris admitted. Such should be more than sufficient to carry a host across a little stretch of water, I would think. And when the long ships of the Ironborn descend upon our ragtag fleet as it is making its way across this little stretch of water, what would your grace have us do then? Drown, thought Circe. High Garden has gold as well. You have my leave to hire sell sails from beyond the narrow sea. Pirates out of mere and less, you mean? Laura said with contempt. The scum of the free cities? He is as insolent as his sister. Sad to say, all of us must deal with scum from time to time, she said with poisonous sweetness. Perhaps you have a better notion? Only the arbor has sufficient galleys to retake the mouth of the mander from the ironmen and protect my brothers from their longships during their crossing. I beg your grace, send word to Dragonstone and command Lord Redwine to raise his sails at once. At least he has the sense to beg. Paxter Redwine owned two hundred warships and five times as many merchant carracks, wine cogs, trading galleys, and whalers. Red wine was encamped beneath the walls of Dragonstone, however, and the greater part of his fleet was engaged in ferrying men across Blackwater Bay for the assault on that island stronghold. The remainder prowled Shipbreaker Bay to the south, where only their presence prevented Storm's End from being resupplied by sea. Orain Waters bristled at Sir Loris's suggestion. If Lord Redwine sails his ships away, how will we to supply our men on Dragonstone? Without the arbor's galleys, how will we maintain the siege of Storm's End? The siege can be resumed later, after— Circe cut him off. Storm's End is a hundred times more valuable than the shields and Dragonstone. So long as Dragonstone remains in the hands of Stannis Baratheon, it is a knife at my son's throat. We will release Lord Redwine and his fleet when the castle falls. The queen pushed herself to her feet. This audience is at an end. Can Maester Pissell a word? The old man started, as if her voice had woken him from some dream of youth. But before he could answer, Loris Tyrell strode forward, so swiftly that the queen drew back in alarm. She was about to shout for Sir Osmond to defend her, when the Knight of Flowers sank to one knee. Your Grace, let me take Dragonstone. His sister's hand went to her mouth. Loras, no! Sir Loras ignored her plea. It would take half a year or more to starve Dragonstone into submission, as Lord Paxter means to do. Give me the command, Your Grace. The castle will be yours within a fortnight, if I have to tear it down with my bare hands. No one had given Circe such a lovely gift since Sansa Stark had run to her to divulge Lord Eddard's plans. She was pleased to see that Marjorie had gone pale. "'Your courage takes my breath away, Sir Loras,' Circe said. "'Lord Waters, are any of the new Drummonds fit to put to sea?' "'Sweet Circe is, Your Grace. "'A swift ship, and as strong as the queen she's named for. "'Splendid. "'Let sweet Circe carry our knight of flowers to Dragonstone at once. "'Sir Loras, the command is yours. "'Swear to me that you shall not return until Dragonstone is Tomans.' I shall, Your Grace. He rose. Circe kissed him on both cheeks. She kissed his sister, too, and whispered, You have a gallant brother. Neither Marjorie did not have the grace to answer, or fear had stolen all her words. Dawn was still several hours away when Circe slipped out the king's door behind the iron throne. Sir Osmond went before her with a torch, and Kyburn strolled along beside her. 
Pissell had to struggle to keep up. If it please your grace, he puffed, young men are overbold, and think only of the glory of battle, and never of its dangers. Sir Loris, this plan of his is fraught with peril. To storm the very walls of Dragonstone is very brave. Brave, yes, but I have no doubt that our knight of flowers will be the first man to gain the battlements, and perhaps the first to fall. The pox-scarred bastard that Stannis had left to hold his castle was no callow tourney champion, but a seasoned killer. If the gods were good, he would give Sir Loris the glorious end he seemed to want. Assuming the boy does not drown on the way. There had been another storm last night, a savage one. The rain had come down in black sheets for hours. And wouldn't that be sad? The queen mused. Drowning is ordinary. Sir Loris lusts for glory as real men lust for women. The least the gods can do is grant him a death worthy of a song. No matter what befell the boy on Dragonstone, however, the queen would be the winner. If Loris took the castle, Stannis would suffer a grievous blow, and the red wine fleet could sail off to meet the Iron Men. If he failed, she would see to it that he had the lion's share of the blame. Nothing tarnishes a hero as much as failure. And if he should come home on his shield, covered in blood and glory, Sir Rosny will be there to console his grieving sister. The laugh would not be contained any longer. It burst from Cersei's lips and echoed down the hall. Your Grace! Grand Maester Pissell blinked, his mouth sagging open. Why? Why would you laugh? Why? she had to say. Elsewise I might weep. My heart is bursting with love for our Sir Loris and his valor. She left the Grand Maester on the serpentine steps. That one has outlived any usefulness he ever had. The Queen decided. All Pissell ever seemed to do of late was plague her with cautions and objections. He had even objected to the understanding she had reached with the High Septon, gaping at her with dim and roomy eyes when she commanded him to prepare the necessary papers, and babbling about old dead history until Circe cut him off. King Mager's day is done, and so are his decrees, she said firmly. This is King Toman's day, and mine. I would have done better to let him perish in the black cells. Should Sir Loris fall, your grace will need to find another worthy for the king's guard, Lord Kyburn said, as they crossed over the spiked moat that girded Magers hold fast. Someone splendid, she agreed. Someone so young and swift and strong that Toman will forget all about Sir Loris. A bit of gallantry would not be amiss, but his head should not be full of foolish notions. Do you know of such a man? Alas, no, said Kyburn. I had another sort of champion in mind. What he lacks in gallantry, he will give you tenfold in devotion. He will protect your son, kill your enemies, and keep your secrets, and no living man will be able to withstand him. So you say. Words are wind. When the hour is ripe, you may produce this paragon of yours, and we will see if he is all that you have promised. They will sing of him, I swear it. Lord Kyburn's eyes crinkled with amusement. Might I ask about the armor? I have placed your order. The armorer thinks that I am mad. He assures me that no man is strong enough to move and fight in such a weight of plate. Circe gave the chainless maester a warning look. Play me for a fool, and you will die screaming. You are aware of that, I trust? Always, your grace. Good. Say no more of this. The queen is wise. These walls have ears. So they do. At night, Circe sometimes heard soft sounds, even in her own apartments. Mice in the walls, she would tell herself. No more than that. A candle was burning by her bedside, but the hearth fire had gone out, 
and there was no other light. The room was cold as well. Circe undressed and slipped beneath the blankets, leaving her gown to puddle on the floor. Across the bed, Tina stirred. "'Your Grace,' she murmured softly, "'what hour is it?' "'The hour of the owl,' the Queen replied. Though Circe often slept alone, she had never liked it. Her oldest memories were of sharing a bed with Jamie, when they had still been so young that no one could tell the two of them apart. Later, after they were separated, she'd had a string of bedmaids and companions, most of them girls of an age with her, the daughters of her father's household knights and bannermen. None had pleased her, and few lasted very long. Little sneaks, the lot of them, vapid, weepy creatures, always telling tales and trying to worm their way between me and Jamie. Still there had been nights deep within the black bowels of the rock when she had welcomed their warmth beside her. An empty bed was a cold bed. Here, most of all, there were chills in this room, and her wretched royal husband had died beneath this canopy. Robert Baratheon, the first of his name, may there never be a second, a dim, drunken brute of a man. Let him weep in hell. Tina warmed the bed as well as Robert ever had, and never tried to force Circe's legs apart. Of late she had shared the Queen's bed more often than Lord Merriweather's. Orton did not seem to mind, or if he did, he knew better than to say so. I was concerned when I woke and found you gone, murmured Lady Merriweather, sitting up against the pillows, the coverlets tangled about her waist. Is aught amiss? No, said Circe. All is well. On the morrow, Sir Loris will sail for Dragonstone, to win the castle, loose the red wine fleet, and prove his manhood to us all. She told the mirish woman all that had occurred beneath the shifting shadow of the Iron Throne. Without her valiant brother, our little queen is next to naked. She has her guards, to be sure, but I have their captain here and there about the castle, a garrulous old man with a squirrel on his surcoat. Squirrels run from lions. He does not have it in him to defy the Iron Throne. Marjorie has other swords about her, cautioned Lady Merriweather. She has made many friends about the court, and she and her young cousins all have admirers. A few suitors do not concern me, Circe said. The army at Storm's End, however. What do you mean to do, Your Grace? Why do you ask? The question was a little too pointed for Circe's taste. I do hope you are not thinking of sharing my idle musings with our poor little queen. Never. I am not that girl, Sunel. Circe did not care to think about Sunel. She repaid my kindness with betrayal. Santa Stark had done the same. So had Malara Heatherspoon and fat Janie Farman when the three of them were girls. I would never have gone into that tent if not for them. I would never have allowed Maggie the Frog to taste my morrows in a drop of blood. I would be very sad if you ever betrayed my trust, Tena. I would have no choice but to give you to Lord Kyburn. But I know that I should weep. I will never give you cause to weep, Your Grace. If I do, say the word, and I will give myself to Kyburn. I want only to be close to you, to serve you, however you require. And for this service, what reward will you expect? Nothing. It pleases me to please you. Tana rolled onto her side, her olive skin shining in the candlelight. Her breasts were larger than the Queen's, and tipped with huge nipples, black as horn. She is younger than I am. Her breasts have not begun to sag. Circe wondered what it would feel like to kiss another woman, not lightly on the cheek, as was common courtesy amongst ladies of high birth, but full upon the lips. Tana's lips were very full. She wondered what it would feel like to suckle on those breasts, to lay the mirish woman on her back, and push her legs apart, and use her as a man would use her, the way Robert would use her, when the drink was in him, 
and she was unable to bring him off with hand or mouth. Those had been the worst nights, lying helpless underneath him as he took his pleasure, stinking of wine and grunting like a boar. Usually he rolled off and went to sleep as soon as it was done, and was snoring before his seed could dry upon her thighs. She was always sore afterward, raw between the legs, her breasts painful from the mauling he would give them. The only time he'd ever made her wet was on their wedding night. Robert had been handsome enough when they first married, tall and strong and powerful, but his hair was black and heavy, thick on his chest and coarse around his sex. The wrong man came back from the trident. The queen would sometimes think, as he was ploughing her. In the first few years, when he mounted her more often, she would close her eyes and pretend that he was Rager. She could not pretend that he was Jamie. He was too different, too unfamiliar. Even the smell of him was wrong. For Robert, those nights never happened. Come morning, he remembered nothing, or so he would have had her believe. Once during the first year of their marriage, Circe had voiced her displeasure the next day. "'You hurt me,' she complained. He had the grace to look ashamed. "'It was not me, my lady,' he said in a sulky, sullen tone, like a child caught stealing apple cakes from the kitchen. "'It was the wine. I drink too much wine.' To wash down his admission, he reached for his horn of ale. As he raised it to his mouth, she smashed her own horn in his face, so hard she chipped a tooth. Years later, at a feast, she heard him telling a serving wench how he'd cracked the tooth in a melee. Well, our marriage was a melee, she reflected, so he did not lie. The rest had all been lies, though. He did remember what he did to her at night. She was convinced of that. She could see it in his eyes. He only pretended to forget. It was easier to do that than to face his shame. Deep down, Robert Baratheon was a coward. In time, the assaults did grow less frequent. During the first year, he took her at least once a fortnight. By the end, it was not even once a year. He never stopped completely, though. Sooner or later, there would always come a night when he would drink too much and want to claim his rights. What shamed him in the light of day gave him pleasure in the darkness. "'My queen,' said Tana Merriweather, "'you have a strange look in your eyes. Are you unwell?' "'I was just remembering.' Her throat was dry. "'You are a good friend, Tana. I have not had a true friend in—' Someone hammered at the door. "'Again?' The urgency of the sound made her shiver. Have another thousand ships descended on us? She slipped into a bedrobe and went to see who it was. Beg pardon for disturbing you, Your Grace, the guardsman said, but Lady Stokeworth is below, begging audience. At this hour, snapped Circe, has Phallus lost her wits? Tell her I have retired. Tell her that small folk on the shields are being slaughtered. Tell her that I have been awake for half the night. I will see her on the morrow. The guard hesitated. If it please your grace, she's, she's not in a good way, if you take my meaning. Circe frowned. She had assumed Phallus was here to tell her that Bronn was dead. Very well. I shall need to dress. Take her to my solar and have her wait. When Lady Merriweather made to rise and come with her, the queen demurred. No, stay. One of us should get some rest, at least. I shan't be long. Lady Fallis's face was bruised and swollen, her eyes red from her tears. Her lower lip was broken, her clothing soiled and torn. God be good, sir, she said, as she ushered her into the solar and closed the door. What has happened to your face? Pallas did not seem to hear the question. He killed him, she said in a quavery voice. Mother, have mercy. He, he, she broke down sobbing, her whole body trembling. 
Sissy poured a cup of wine and took it to the weeping woman. Drink this. The wine will calm you. That's it. A little more now. Stop that weeping and tell me why you're here. It took the rest of the flagon before the queen was finally able to coax the whole sad tale out of Lady Fallis. Once she had, she did not know whether to laugh or rage. Single combat? She repeated. Is there no one in the Seven Kingdoms that I can rely upon? Am I the only one in Westeros with a pinch of wits? You are telling me Sir Balman challenged Bronn to single combat? He said it would be so simple. The lance is a knight's weapon, he said. And Bronn was no two knight. Balman said he would unhorse him and finish him as he lay st st stunned. Bronn was no knight, that was true. Bronn was a battle-hardened killer. Your cretin of a husband wrote his own death warrant. A splendid plan. Dare I ask how it went awry? The Bronn drove his lance through the chest of Bauman's poor h h h horse. Bauman, he... His legs were crushed when the beast fell. He screamed so piteously. Cell swords have no pity. Cersei might have said, I asked you to arrange a hunting mishap. An arrow gone astray, a fall from a horse, an angry boar. There are so many ways a man can die in the woods, none of them involving lances. Pallas did not seem to hear her. When I tried to run to my bowman, he, he, he struck me in the face. He made my lord c c confess. Bowman was crying out for Maester Franken to attend him, but the sellsword, he, he, he... Confess? Cersei did not like that word. I trust our brave Sir Bowman held his tongue. Bron put a dagger in his eye and told me I had best be gone from Stokeworth before the sun went down or I'd get the same. He said he'd pass me around to the g -g garrison if any of them would have me. When I ordered Bron seized, one of his knights had the insolence to say that I should do as Lord Stokeworth said. He called him Lord Stokeworth. Lady Fallis clutched at the queen's hand. Your grace must give me knights, a hundred knights and crossbowmen, to take my castle back. Stokeworth is mine. They would not even permit me to gather up my clothes. Bron said, they were his wife's clothes now, all my silks and velvets. Your rags are the least of your concern. The queen pulled her fingers free of the other woman's clammy grasp. I asked you to snuff out a candle to help protect the king. Instead, you heaved a pot of wildfire at it. Did your witness Balman bring my name into this? Tell me he did not. Phallus licked her lips. He, he was in pain. His legs were broken. Bron said he would show him mercy, but what will happen to my poor m m mother? I imagine she will die. What do you think? Lady Tanter might well be dead already. Bron did not seem the sort of man who would expend much effort nursing an old woman with a broken hip. You have to help me. Where am I to go? What will I do? Perhaps you might wed Moon Boy, Cersei almost said. He is nigh as big a fool as your late husband. She could not risk a war on the very doorstep of King's Landing. Not now. The Silent Sisters are always glad to welcome widows, she said. Theirs is a serene life, a life of prayer and contemplation and good works. They bring solace to the living and peace to the dead. And they do not talk. She could not have the woman running about the Seven Kingdoms spreading dangerous tales. Pallas was deaf to good sense. All we did, we did in service to your grace. Proud to be faithful. You said... I recall. Cersei forced a smile. You shall stay here with us, my lady. 
until such time as we find a way to win your castle back. Let me pour you another cup of wine. It will help you sleep. You are weary and sick of heart. That's plain to see. My poor dear Phallus. That's it. Drink up. As her guest was working on the flagon, Circe went to the door and called her maids. She told Dorcas to find Lord Kyburn for her and bring him here at once. Jocelyn Swift she dispatched to the kitchens. Bring bread and cheese, a meat pie and some apples, and wine. We have a thirst. Kyburn arrived before the food. Lady Phallus had put down three more cups by then, and was beginning to nod, though from time to time she would rouse and give another sob. The queen took Kyburn aside and told him of Sir Balmond's folly. I cannot have Phallus spreading tales about the city. Her grief has made her witless. Do you still need women for your work? I do, Your Grace. The puppeteers are quite used up. Take her, and do with her as you will, then. But once she goes down into the black cells, need I say more? No, Your Grace. I understand. Good. The Queen donned her smile once again. Sweet Phallus, Maester Kyburn's here. He'll help you rest. Oh, said Phallus vaguely. Oh, good. When the door closed behind them, Circe poured herself another cup of wine. I am surrounded by enemies and imbeciles, she said. She could not even trust to her own blood and kin, nor Jamie, who had once been her other half. He was meant to be my sword and shield, my strong right arm. Why does he insist on vexing me? Ron was no more than an annoyance, to be sure. She had never truly believed that he was harboring the imp. Her twisted little brother was too clever to allow Lollis to name her wretched, ill-begotten bastard after him, knowing it was sure to draw the Queen's wrath down upon her. Lady Merriweather had pointed that out, and she was right. The mockery was almost certainly the cell sword's doing. She could picture him watching his wrinkled red stepson sucking on one of Lawless's swollen dugs, a cup of wine in his hand and an insolent smile on his face. Grin all you wish, Sir Bron. You'll be screaming soon enough. Enjoy your lackwit lady and your stolen castle whilst you can. When the time comes I shall swat you as if you were a fly. Perhaps she would send Loris Tyrell to do the swatting, if the Knight of Flowers should somehow return alive from Dragonstone. That would be delicious. If the gods were good, each of them would kill the other, like Sir Eric and Sir Eric. As for Stokeworth, no, she was sick of thinking about Stokeworth. Tana had drifted back to sleep by the time the Queen returned to the bedchamber, her head spinning too much wine and too little sleep, she told herself. It was not every night that she was awakened twice with such desperate tidings. At least I could awaken. Robert would have been too drunk to rise, let alone rule. It would have fallen to John Arryn to deal with all of this. It pleased her to think that she made a better king than Robert. The sky outside the window was already beginning to lighten, Circe sat on the bed beside Lady Merriweather, listening to her soft breathing, watching her breasts rise and fall. Does she dream of Mir? she wondered. Or is it her lover with the scar, the dangerous dark-haired man who would not be refused? She was quite certain Tana was not dreaming of Lord Orton. Circe cupped the other woman's breast, softly at first, hardly touching feeling the warmth of it beneath her palm, the skin as smooth as satin. She gave it a gentle squeeze, then ran her thumbnail lightly across the big, dark nipple, back and forth and back and forth, until she felt it stiffen. When she glanced up, Tana's eyes were open. "'Does that feel good?' she asked. "'Yes.' 
said Lady Merriweather. And this? Circe pinched the nipple now, pulling on it hard, twisting it between her fingers. The Mirish woman gave a gasp of pain. You're hurting me! It's just the wine. I had a flagon with my supper, and another with the widow Stokeworth. I had to drink to keep her calm. She twisted Tana's other nipple, too, pulling until the other woman gasped. I am the queen. I mean to claim my rights. Do what you will. Tana's hair was as black as Robert's, even down between her legs. And when Circe touched her there, she found her hair all sopping wet. Where Roberts had been coarse and dry. Please, the Mirish woman said, go on, my queen. Do as you will with me. I'm yours. But it was no good. She could not feel it, whatever Robert felt on the nights he took her. There was no pleasure in it, not for her. For Tana, yes. Her nipples were two black diamonds, her sex slick and steamy. Robert would have loved you for an hour. The queen slid a finger into that mirish swamp, then another, moving them in and out. But once he spent himself inside you, he would have been hard-pressed to recall your name. She wanted to see if it would be as easy with a woman as it had always been with Robert. Ten thousand of your children perished in my palm, Your Grace, she thought, slipping a third finger into mirror. Whilst you snored, I would lick your sons off my face and fingers one by one, all those pale, sticky princes. You claimed your rights, my lord, but in the darkness I would eat your heirs. Tana gave a shudder. She gasped some words in a foreign tongue, then shuddered again, and arched her back, and screamed. She sounds as if she is being gored, the queen thought. For a moment she let herself imagine that her fingers were a boar's tusks, ripping the mirish woman apart from groin to throat. It was still no good. It had never been any good with anyone but Jamie. When she tried to take her hand away, Tana caught it and kissed her fingers. Sweet queen, how shall I pleasure you? She slid her hand down Circe's side and touched her sex. Tell me what you would have of me, my love. Leave me. Circe rolled away and pulled up the bedclothes to cover herself, shivering. Dawn was breaking. It would be morning soon, and all of this would be forgotten. It had never happened. Jamie. The trumpets made a brazen blare and cut the still blue air of dusk. Josmond Peckleton was on his feet at once, scrambling for his master's sword belt. The boy has good instincts. Outlaws don't blow trumpets to herald their arrival, Jamie told him. I shan't need my sword. I will be my cousin, the Warden of the West. The riders were dismounting when he emerged from his tent half a dozen knights, and two score mounted archers and men-at-arms. "'Jamie!' roared a shaggy man clad in gilded ringmail and a fox fur cloak. "'So gaunt, and all in white, and bearded, too! "'This? Mere stubble against that mane of yours, cuz. "'Sir David's bristling beard and bushy moustache grew into side-whiskers as thick as a hedgerow, and those— into the tangled yellow thicket atop his head, matted down by the helm he was removing. Somewhere in the midst of all that hair lurked a pug nose and a pair of lively hazel eyes. Did some outlaw steal your razor? I vowed I would not let my hair be cut until my father was avenged. For a man who looked so leonine, David Lannister sounded oddly sheepish. The young wolf got to Karstack first, though. Robbed me of my vengeance. He handed his helm to a squire and pushed his fingers through his hair where the weight of the steel had crushed it down. I like a bit of hair. The nights grow colder, and a little foliage helps to keep your face warm. Aye, 
and Aunt Jenna always said I had a brick for a chin. He clasped Jamie by the arms. We feared for you after the whispering wood. Hurt Stark's dire wolf tore out your throat. Did you weep bitter tears for me, cause? Half of Lannisport was mourning, the female half. Sir David's gaze went to Jamie's stump. So it's true. The bastards took your sword hand. I have a new one made of gold. There's much to be said for being one-handed. I drink less wine for fear of spilling, and am seldom inclined to scratch my arse at court. Aye, there's that. Maybe I should have mine off as well. His cousin laughed. Was it Caitlin Stark who took it? Vargo Holt. Where do these tales come from? The Cahoric, Sir David spat. That's for him and all his brave companions. I told your father I would forage for him, but he refused me. Some tasks are fit for lions, he said, but foraging is best left for goats and dogs. Lord Tymon's very words, Jamie knew. He could almost hear his father's voice. Come inside, cuz. We need to talk. Garrett had lit the braziers, and their glowing coals filled Jamie's tent with a ruddy heat. Sir Davin shrugged out of his cloak and tossed it at little Lou. You a piper, boy, he growled. You have a runty look to you. I'm Lewis Piper, if it please my lord. I beat your brother bloody in a melee once. The runty little fool took offense when I asked him if that was his sister dancing naked on his shield. She's the sigil of our house. We don't have a sister. More's the pity. Your sigil has nice teats. What sort of man hides behind a naked woman, though? Every time I thumped your brother's shield I felt unchivalrous. Enough, said Jamie, laughing. Leave him be. Pia was mulling wine for them, stirring the kettle with a spoon. I need to know what I can expect to find at River Run. His cousin shrugged. The siege drags on. The blackfish sits inside the castle. We sit outside in our camps. Bloody boring, if you want the truth. Sir David seated himself upon a camp stool. Tully ought to make a sortie, to remind us all we're still at war. Be nice if he called some phrase, too. Ryman for a start. The man's drunk more off than not. Oh, and Edwin, not as thick as his father, but as full of hate as a boil's full of pus. And our own Sir Emmon, no, Lord Emmon. Seven Sabus must not forget his new title. Our Lord of Riveron does not but try to tell me how to run this siege. He wants me to take the castle without damaging it, since it is now his lordly seat. Is that wine hot yet? Jamie asked Pia. Yes, my lord. The girl covered her mouth when she spoke. Peck served the wine on a golden platter. Sir Devon pulled off his gloves and took a cup. Thank you, boy. Who might you be? Jossman Peckledon, if it please, my lord. Peck was a hero on the Blackwater, Jamie said. He slew two knights and captured two more. You must be more dangerous than you look, lad. Is that a beard, or did you forget to wash the dirt off your face? Stannis Baratheon's wife has a thicker mustache. How old are you? Fifteen, sir. Sir David snorted. You know the best thing about heroes, Jamie? They all die young and leave more women for the rest of us. He tossed the cup back to the squire. Fill that full again and I'll call you hero, too. I have a thirst. Jamie lifted his own cup left-handed and took a swallow. The warmth spread through his chest. You were speaking of the phrase you wanted dead. Ryman, Edwin, Emmon, and Walter Rivers, Davin said, that horse son. Hates that he's a bastard, and hates everyone who's not. Sir Perwin seems a decent fellow, though. Might as well spare him. The women, too. I'm to marry one, I hear. Your father might have seen fit to consult with me about this marriage, by the by. My own father was treating with Paxter Redwine before Oxcross, 
Did you know? Redwine has a nicely dowered daughter. Desmara, Jamie laughed. How well do you like freckles? If my choice is phrase or freckles, well, half of Lord Walter's brood looked like stoats. Only half? Be thankful. I saw Lancel's bride at Derry. Gatehouse Amy, gods be good. I couldn't believe that Lancel picked that one. What's wrong with that boy? He's grown pious, said Jamie. But it wasn't him who did the picking. Lady Amorai's mother is a Derry. Our uncle thought she'd help Lancel win the Derry small folk. How? By fucking them? You know why they call her Gatehouse Amy. She raises her portcullis for every knight who happens by. Lancel had best find an armorer to make him a horned helm. That won't be necessary. Our cuz is off to King's Landing to take vows as one of the High Septon's swords. Sir Davin could not have looked more astonished if Jamie had told him that Lancel had decided to become a mummer's monkey. Not truly. You are japing with me. Gatehouse Amy must be more stoutish than I'd heard if she could drive the boy to that. When Jamie had taken his leave of Lady Amorai, she had been weeping softly at the dissolution of her marriage, whilst letting Lyle Craighall console her. Her tears had not troubled him half so much as the hard looks on the faces of her kin as they stood about the yard. "'I hope you do not intend to take vows as well, cuz,' he said to Davin. "'The phrase are prickly where marriage contracts are concerned. I would hate to disappoint them again.' Sir David snorted. How wet in bed my stoat, never fear. I know what happened to Rob Stark. From what Edwin tells me, though, I'd best pick one who hasn't flowered yet, or I'm like to find that Black Walter has been there first. I'll wager he's had Gatehouse Amy, and more than thrice. Maybe that explains Lancel's godliness and his father's mood. You have seen Sir Kevin? Aye. He passed here on his way west. I asked him to help us take the castle, but Kevin would have none of it. He brooded the whole time he was here. Courteous enough, but chilly. I swore to him that I never asked to be made warden of the west, that the honor should have gone to him, and he declared that he held no grudge against me, but you would never have known it from his tone. He stayed three days, and hardly said three words to me. Would that he'd remained, I could have used his counsel. Our friends of Frey would not have dared vex Sir Kevin the way that they've been vexing me. Tell me, said Jamie. I would, but where to begin? Whilst I've been building rams and siege towers, Ryman Frey has raised a gibbet. Every day at dawn he brings forth Edmure Tully, drapes a noose around his neck, and threatens to hang him unless the castle yields. The blackfish pays his mummer's show no mind. So come evenfall, Lord Edmure is taken down again. His wife's with child, did you know? He hadn't. Edmure betted her after the red wedding? He was betting her during the red wedding. Rawson's a pretty little thing, hardly stoutish at all, and fond of Edmure, queerly. Purin tells me she's praying for a girl. Jamie considered that a moment. Once Edmure's son is born, Lord Walter will have no more need of Edmure. That's how I see it, too. Our good uncle M, uh, Lord Emmon, that is, he wants Edmure hanged at once. The presence of a Tully, Lord of Riverun, distresses him almost as much as the prospective birth of yet another. Daily he beseeches me to make Sir Ryman dangle Tully, never mind how. Meanwhile, I have Lord Gawain Westerling tugging at my other sleeve. The blackfish has his lady wife inside the castle, along with three of his snot-nosed whelps. His lordship fears Tully will kill them if the phrase hang Edmore. One of them is the young wolf's little queen. Jamie had met Janey Westerling, he thought though he could not recall what she looked like. She must be fair indeed to have been worth a kingdom. 
Sir Brendan won't kill children, he assured his cousin. He's not as black a fish as that. He was beginning to grasp why River Run had not yet fallen. Tell me of your dispositions, cuz. We have the castle well encircled. Sir Ryman and the Freys are north of the Tumblestone. South of Red Fork sits Lord Emmon, with Sir Forley Prester, and with what remains of your old host, plus the river lords who came over to us after the Red Wedding. A sullen lot, I don't mind saying. Good for sulking in their tents, but not much more. My own camp is between the rivers, facing the moat and River Run's main gates. We've thrown a boom across the Red Fork downstream of the castle. Manfred Yew and Reynard Rudiger have charge of its defense, so no one can escape by boat. I gave them nets as well, to fish. It helps keep us fed. Can we starve the castle out? Sir David shook his head. The blackfish expelled all the useless mouths from River Run and picked this country clean. He has enough stores to keep man and horse alive for two full years. And how well are we provisioned? So long as there are fish in the rivers, we won't starve, though I don't know how we're going to feed the horses. The Freys are hauling food and fodder down from the twins, but Sir Raymond claims he does not have enough to share, so we must forage for ourselves. Half the men I send off to look for food do not return. Some are deserting, others we find ripening under trees with ropes about their necks. We came on some the day before last, said Jamie. Adam Marbrand's scouts had found them, hanging black-faced beneath a crabapple tree. The corpses had been stripped naked, and each man had a crabapple shoved between his teeth. None bore any wounds. Plainly, they had yielded. Strongbore had grown furious at that, vowing bloody vengeance on the heads of any man who would truss up warriors to die like suckling pigs. It might have been outlaws, Sir David said when Jamie told the tale, or not. There are still bands of Northmen about, and these lords of the Trident may have bent their knees, but methinks their hearts are still wolfish. Jamie glanced at his two younger squires, who were hovering near the braziers pretending not to listen. Lewis Piper and Garrett Page were both the sons of river lords. He had grown fond of both of them, and would hate to have to give them to Sir Illyn. The ropes suggest Dondarrion to me. Your lightning lord's not the only man who knows how to die a noose. Don't get me started on Lord Berwick. He's here, he's there, he's everywhere, but when you send men after him, he melts away like dew. The river lords are helping him, never doubt it. A bloody marcher lord, if you can believe it. One day you hear the man is dead, the next they're saying how he can't be killed. Sir David put his wine cup down. My scouts report fires in the high places at night. Signal fires, they think, as if there were a ring of watchers all around us. And there are fires in the villages as well. Some new god. No, an old one. Thoros is with Dondarrion, the fat Mirish priest who used to drink with Robert. His golden hand was on the table. Jamie touched it and watched the gold glimmer in the sullen light of the braziers. We'll deal with Dondarrion if we have to, but the blackfish must come first. He has to know his cause is hopeless. Have you tried to treat with him? Sir Ryman did. Rode up to the castle gates half drunk and blustering, making threats. The blackfish appeared on the ramparts long enough to say, that he would not waste fair words on foul men. Then he put an arrow in the rump of Ryman's palfrey. The horse reared, Frey fell into the mud, and I laughed so hard I almost pissed myself. If it had been me inside the castle, I would have put that arrow through Ryman's lying throat. I'll wear a gorget when I treat with them, said Jamie with a half-smile. I mean to offer him generous terms. If he could end this siege without bloodshed, then it could not be said that he had taken up arms against House Tully. "'You are welcome to try, my lord, but I doubt that words will win the day. We need to storm the castle.' There had been a time, not so long ago, 
when Jamie would doubtless have urged the same course. He knew he could not sit here for two years to starve the blackfish out. Whatever we do needs to be done quickly, he told Sir David. My place is back at King's Landing with the King. I, his cousin said, I don't doubt your sister needs you. Why did she send off Kevin? I thought she'd make him hand. He would not take it. He was not as blind as I was. Kevin should be the warden of the West, or you. It's not that I'm not grateful for the honor, mind you, but our uncle's twice my age and has more experience of command. I hope he knows I never asked for this. He knows. How is Circe? As beautiful as ever? Radiant. Fickle. Golden. False as fool's gold. Last night he dreamed he'd found her fucking moon boy. He'd killed the fool and smashed his sister's teeth to splinters with his golden hand, just as Gregor Clegain had done to poor Pia. In his dreams, Jamie always had two hands. One was made of gold, but it worked just like the other. The sooner we are done with River Run, the sooner I'll be back at Circe's side. What Jamie would do then, he did not know. He talked with his cousin for another hour before the Warden of the West finally took his leave. When he was gone, Jamie donned his gold hand and brown cloak to walk amongst the tents. If truth be told, he liked this life. He felt more comfortable amongst soldiers in the field than he ever had at court, and his men seemed comfortable with him as well. At one cook fire, three crossbowmen offered him a share of a hare they'd caught. At another, a young knight asked his counsel on the best way to defend against a war hammer. Down beside the river, he watched two washerwomen jousting in the shallows, mounted on the shoulders of a pair of men at arms. The girls were half drunk and half naked, laughing and snapping rolled up cloaks at one another as a dozen other men urged them on. Jamie bet a copper star on the blonde girl riding Raph the Sweetling, and lost it when the two of them went down, splashing amongst the reeds. Across the river, wolves were howling, and the wind was gusting through a stand of willows, making their branches writhe and whisper. Jamie found Sir Illin Payne alone outside his tent, honing his great sword with a whetstone. Come, he said, and the silent knight rose, smiling thinly. He enjoys this, he realized. It pleases him to humiliate me nightly. It might please him even more to kill me. He liked to believe that he was getting better, but the improvement was slow, and not without cost. Underneath his steel and wool and boiled leather, Jamie Lannister was a tapestry of cuts and scabs and bruises. A sentry challenged them as they led their horses from the camp. Jamie clapped the man's shoulder with his golden hand. Stay vigilant. There are wolves about. They rode back along the Red Fork to the ruins of a burned village they had passed that afternoon. It was there they danced their midnight dance, amongst blackened stones and old cold cinders. For a little while Jamie had the better of it. Perhaps his old skill was coming back, he allowed himself to think. Perhaps tonight it would be Payne who went to sleep bruised and bloody. It was as if Sir Ellen heard his thoughts. He parried Jamie's last cut lazily and launched a counterattack that drove Jamie back into the river, where his boot slipped out from under him in the mud. He ended on his knees with a silent knight's sword at his throat, and his own lost in the reeds. In the moonlight the pockmarks on Payne's face were large as craters. He made that clacking sound that might have been a laugh, and drew his sword up Jamie's throat till the point came to rest between his lips. Only then did he step back and sheathe his steel. I would have done better to challenge Raph the sweetling with a whore upon my back. Jamie thought, as he shook mud off his gilded hand. Part of him wanted to tear the thing off and fling it in the river. It was good for nothing, and the left was not much better. Sir Illin had gone back to the horses, leaving him to find his own feet. At least I still have two of those. The last day of their journey was cold and gusty. 
The wind rattled amongst the branches in the bare brown woods and made the river reeds bow low along the red fork. Even mantled in the winter wool of the king's guard, Jamie could feel the iron teeth of that wind as he rode beside his cousin Davin. It was late afternoon when they sighted River Run, rising from the narrow point where the tumblestone joined the Red Fork. The Tully Castle looked like a great stone ship, with its prow pointed down river. Its sandstone walls were drenched in red-gold light, and seemed higher and thicker than Jamie had remembered. This nut will not crack easily, he thought gloomily. If the blackfish would not listen, he would have no choice but to break the vow he'd made to Caitlin Stark, the vow he'd sworn his king came first. The boom across the river and the three great camps of the besieging army were just as his cousin had described. Sir Ryman Frey's encampment, north of the Tumblestone, was the largest and the most disorderly. A great grey gallows loomed above the tents, as tall as any trebuchet. On it stood a solitary figure with a rope about his neck. Edmure Tully. Jamie felt a stab of pity. To keep him standing there day after day, with that noose around his neck, better to have his head off and be done with it. Behind the gallows, tents and cook fires spread out in ragged disarray. The fray lordlings and their knights had raised their pavilions comfortably upstream of the latrine trenches. Downstream were muddy hovels, wains, and ox carts. Sir Ryman don't want his boys getting bored, so he gives them whores and cockfights and boar baiting, Sir Davin said. He's even got himself a bloody singer. Our aunt brought White Smile Watt from Lannisport, if you can believe it. So Ryman had to have a singer, too. Couldn't we just dam the river and drown the whole lot of them, cause? Jamie could see archers moving behind the Merlins on the castle ramparts. Above them streamed the banners of House Tully, the silver trout defiant on its striped field of red and blue. But the highest tower flew a different flag, a long white standard emblazoned with the dire wolf of Stark. The first time I saw a river run, I was a squire green as summer grass, Jamie told his cousin. Old Sumner Craighall sent me to deliver a message, one he swore could not be entrusted to a raven. Lord Hoster kept me for a fortnight, whilst mulling his reply, and sat me beside his daughter Lysa at every meal. Small wonder you took the white. I'd have done the same. Oh, Lysa was not so fearsome as all that. She had been a pretty girl, in truth, dimpled and delicate, with long auburn hair. Timid, though, prone to tongue-tied silences and fits of giggles, with none of Circe's fire. Her older sister had seemed more interesting, though Caitlin was promised to some northern boy, the heir of Winterfell. But at that age no girl interested Jamie half so much as Hoster's famous brother, who had won renown fighting the ninepenny kings upon the stepstones. At table he had ignored poor Lysa, whilst pressing Brynden Tully for tales of Melis the Monstrous and the Ebon Prince. Sir Brynden was younger then than I am now, Jamie reflected, and I was younger than Peck. The nearest ford across the Red Fork was upstream of the castle. To reach Sir David's camp they had to ride through Emmon Frey's, past the pavilions of the river lords who had bent their knees and been accepted back into the king's peace. Jamie noted the banners of Lichester and Vance, of Root and Goodbrook, the acorns of House Smallford and Lord Piper's Dancing Maiden, but the banners he did not see gave him pause. The silver eagle of Malister was nowhere in evidence nor the red horse of Bracken, the willow of the Rigers, the twining snakes of Page. Though all had renewed their fealty to the Iron Throne, none had come to join the siege. The Brackens were fighting the Blackwoods, Jamie knew, which accounted for their absence. But as for the rest, our new friends are no friends at all. 
Their loyalty goes no deeper than their skins. River Run had to be taken, and soon. The longer the siege dragged on, the more it would hearten other recalcitrants, like Titus Blackwood. At the ford, Sir Canis of Case blew the horn of Herrick. That should bring the blackfish to the battlements. Sir Hugo and Sir Dermot led Jamie's way across the river, splashing through the muddy red-brown waters with the white standard of the King's Guard and Toman's stag and lion streaming in the wind. The rest of the column followed hard behind them. The Lannister camp rang to the sound of wooden hammers where a new siege tower was rising. Two other towers stood completed, half covered with raw horsehide. Between them sat a rolling ram, a tree trunk with a fire-hardened point suspended on chains beneath a wooden roof. My cause has not been idle, it would seem. My lord, Peck asked, where do you want your tent? There, upon that rise, he pointed with his golden hand, though it was not well suited to that task. Baggage there, horse lines there. We'll use the latrines my cousin has so kindly dug for us. Sir Adam, inspect our perimeter with an eye for any weaknesses. Jamie did not anticipate an attack, but he had not anticipated the whispering wood either. Shall I summon the stoats for a war council? Davin asked. Not until I've spoken to the blackfish. Jamie beckoned to beardless John Betley. Shake out a peace banner and bear a message to the castle. Inform Sir Brendan Tully that I would have words with him at first light on the morrow. I will come to the edge of the moat and meet him on his drawbridge. Peck looked alarmed. My lord, the bowmen could— They won't. Jamie dismounted. Raise my tent and plant my standards. And we'll see who comes running and how quickly. It did not require long. Pierre was fussing at a brazier, trying to light the coals. Peck went to help her. Of late, Jamie oft went to sleep to the sound of them fucking in a corner of the tent. As Garrett was undoing the clasps on Jamie's greaves, the tent flapped open. "'Here at last, are you?' boomed his aunt. She filled the door with her fray husband peering out from behind her. "'Past time! Have you no hug for your old fat aunt?' She held out her arms and left him no choice but to embrace her. Jenna Lannister had been a shapely woman in her youth, always threatening to overflow her bodice. Now the only shape she had was square. Her face was broad and smooth, her neck a thick pink pillar, her bosom enormous. She carried enough flesh to make two of her husband. Jamie hugged her dutifully and waited for her to pinch his ear. She had been pinching his ear for as long as he could remember, but today she forbore. Instead, she planted soft and sloppy kisses on his cheeks. I am sorry for your loss. I had a new handmaid, of gold, he showed her. Very nice. Will they make you a gold father, too? Lady Jenna's voice was sharp. Tywin was the loss I meant. A man such as Tywin Lannister comes but once in a thousand years, declared her husband. Emmon Frey was a fretful man, with nervous hands. He might have weighed ten stone, but only wet, and clad in mail. He was a weed in wool, with no chin to speak of, a flaw that the prominence of the apple in his throat made even more absurd. Half his hair had been gone before he turned thirty. Now he was sixty, and only a few white wisps remained. Some queer tales have been reaching us of late, Lady Jenna said after Jamie dismissed Pia and his squires. A woman hardly knows what to believe. Can it be true that Tyrion slew Tywin? Or is that some calumny your sister put about? It's true enough. The weight of his golden hand had grown irksome. He fumbled at the straps that secured it to his wrist. For a son to raise his hand against a father, Sir Emmon said, Monstrous! These are dark days in Westeros. I fear for us all, with Lord Tywin gone. You feared for us all when he was here. 
Jenna settled her ample rump upon a camp stool, which creaked alarmingly beneath her weight. Nephew, speak to us of our son's Cleos and the manner of his death. Jamie undid the last fastening and set his hand aside. We were set upon by outlaws. Sir Cleos scattered them, but it cost his life. The lie came easy. He could see that it pleased them. The boy had courage. I always said so. It was in his blood. A pinkish froth glistened on Sir Emmon's lips when he spoke. Courtesy of the sour leaf he liked to chew. His bones should be interred beneath the rock, in the Hall of Heroes, Lady Jenna declared. Where was he laid to rest? Nowhere. The bloody mummers stripped his corpse and left his flesh to feast the carrion crows. Beside a stream, he lied. When this war is done, I will find the place and send him home. Bones were bones. These days nothing was easier to come by. This war... Lord Emmon cleared his throat, the apple in his throat moving up and down. You will have seen the siege machines. Rams, trebuchets, towers. It will not serve, Jamie. David means to break my walls. Smash in my gates. He talks of burning pitch, of setting the castle afire. My castle. He reached up one sleeve, brought out a parchment, and thrust it at Jamie's face. I have the decree, signed by the king, by Toman. See? The royal seal, the stag and lion. I am the lawful lord of River Run, and I will not have it reduced to a smoking ruin. Oh, put that fool thing away, his wife snapped. So long as the blackfish sits inside River Run, you can wipe your arse with that paper for all the good it does us. Though she had been a fray for fifty years, Lady Jenna remained very much a Lannister. Quite a lot of Lannister. Jamie will deliver you the castle. To be sure, Lord Emmon said. Sir Jamie, your lord father's faith in me was well placed, you shall see. I mean to be firm but fair with my new vassals. Blackwood and Bracken, Jason Malister, Vance and Piper, they shall learn that they have a just overlord in Emmon Frey. My father as well, yes. He is the lord of the crossing, but I am the lord of River Run. A son has a duty to obey his father, true, but a mannerman must obey his overlord. Oh, gods be good. You are not his overlord, sir. Read your parchment. You are granted River Run with its lands and incomes no more. Peter Badish is the lord paramount of the trident. River Run will be subject to the rule of Harrenhal. That did not please Lord Emmon. Harrenhal is a ruin, haunted and accursed, he objected. And Baelish? The man is a coin counter. No proper lord. His birth. If you are unhappy with the arrangements, go to King's Landing and take it up with my sweet sister. Cersei would devour Emmon Frey and pick her teeth with his bones, he did not doubt. That is, if she's not too busy fucking Osmond Kettleblack. Lady Jenna gave a snort. There is no need to trouble her grace with such nonsense. Em, why don't you step outside and have a breath of air? A breath of air? Or a good long piss, if you prefer. My nephew and I have family matters to discuss. Lord Emmon flushed. Yes, it is warm in here. I will wait outside, my lady. Sir. His lordship rolled up his parchment, sketched a bow toward Jamie, and tottered from the tent. It was hard not to feel contemptuous of Emmon Frey. He had arrived at Casterly Rock in his fourteenth year to wed a lioness half his age. Tyrion used to say that Lord Tywin had given him a nervous belly for a wedding gift. Jenna has played her part as well. Jamie remembered many a feast where Emmon sat poking at his food sullenly, whilst his wife made ribald jests with whatever household knight had been seated to her left, their conversations punctuated by loud bursts of laughter. 
She gave Frey four sons, to be sure. At least she says they are his. No one in Casterly Rock had the courage to suggest otherwise, least of all Sir Emmon. No sooner was he gone than his lady wife rolled her eyes. My lord and master, what was your father thinking to name him Lord of River Run? I imagine he was thinking of your sons. I think of them as well, and will make a wretched lord. Time may do better, if he has the sense to learn from me and not his father. She looked about the tent. Do you have wine? Jamie found a flagon and poured for her, one-handed. Why are you here, my lady? You should have remained at Casterly Rock until the fighting's done. Once M heard he was a lord, he had to come at once to claim his seat. Lady Jenna took a drink and wiped her mouth on her sleeve. Your father should have granted us Darry. Cleos married one of the plowman's daughters, you will recall. His grieving widow is furious that her sons were not granted her lord father's lands. Gatehouse Amy is Darry only on her mother's side. My good daughter Janie is her aunt, a full sister to Lady Maria. A younger sister, Jamie reminded her. And Ty will have River Run, a greater prize than Darry. A poisoned prize. House Darry is extinguished in the male line. House Tully is not. That muttonhead Sir Ryman puts a noose around Edmure's neck, but will not hang him. And Roslyn Frey has a trout growing in her belly. My grandsons will never be secure in River Run so long as any Tully heir remains alive. She was not wrong, Jamie knew. If Rosin has a girl, she can wed Ty, provided old Lord Walter will consent. Yes, I've thought of that. A boy is just as likely, though, and his little cock would cloud the issue. And if Sir Brynden should survive this siege, he might be inclined to claim River Run in his own name, or in the name of young Robert Arryn. Jamie remembered little Robert from King's Landing, still sucking on his mother's teats at four. Amron won't live long enough to breed. And why should the Lord of the Eyrie need River Run? Why does a man with one pot of gold need another? Men are greedy. Tywin should have granted River Run to Kevin and Darry to M. I would have told him so if he had troubled to ask me. But when did your father ever consult with anyone but Kevin? She sighed deeply. I do not blame Kevin for wanting the safer seat for his own boy, mind you. I know him too well. What Kevin wants and what Lancel wants appear to be two different things. He told her of Lancel's decision to renounce wife and lands and lordship to fight for the holy faith. If you still want Darry, write to Circe and make your case. Lady Jenna waved her cup in dismissal. No, that horse has left the yard. M has it in his pointed head that he will rule the riverlands. And Lancel? I suppose we should have seen this coming from afar. A life protecting the High Septon is not so different from a life protecting the King, after all. Kevin will be wroth, I fear, as wroth as Tywin was when you got it in your head to take the white. At least Kevin still has Martin for an heir. He can marry him to Gatehouse Amy in Lancel's place. Seven save us all. His aunt gave a sigh. And speaking of the seven, why would Circe permit the faith to arm again? Jamie shrugged. I am certain she had reasons. Reasons? Lady Jenna made a rude noise. They had best be good reasons. The swords and stars troubled even the Targaryens. The conqueror himself tread carefully with the faith, so they would not oppose him. And when Aegon died and the lords rose up against his sons, both orders were in the thick of that rebellion. The more pious lords supported them, and many of the small folk. King Mega finally had to put a bounty on them. He paid a dragon for the head of any unrepentant warrior's son, and a silver stag for the scalp of a poor fellow, if I recall my history. Thousands were slain, but nigh as many still roamed the realm, defiant, until the Iron Throne slew Mager, and King Jehiris agreed to pardon all those who would set aside their swords. I'd forgotten most of that, Jamie confessed. 
You and your sister both. She took another swallow of her wine. Is it true that Tywin was smiling on his beer? He was rotting on his beer. It made his mouth twist. Was that all it was? That seemed to sadden her. Men say that Tywin never smiled. But he smiled when he wed your mother, and when Eris made him hand. When Tarbeck Hall came crashing down on Lady Ellen, that scheming bitch. Tyg claimed he smiled then. And he smiled at your birth, Jamie. I saw that with mine own eyes. You and Circe, pink and perfect, as alike as two peas in a pod. Well, except between the legs. What lungs you had! Hear us roar! Jamie grinned. Next you'll be telling me how much you like to laugh. No. Tywin mistrusted laughter. He heard too many people laughing at your grandsire. She frowned. I promise you this mummer's farce of a siege would not have amused him. How do you mean to end it, now that you're here? Treat with the blackfish? That won't work. I mean to offer him good terms. Terms require trust. The phrase murdered guests beneath their roof. And you, well, I mean no offense, my love, but you did kill a certain king you had sworn to protect. And I'll kill the blackfish if he does not yield. His tone was harsher than he'd intended, but he was in no mood for having Aerys Targaryen thrown in his face. How? With your tongue? Her voice was scornful. I may be an old fat woman, but I do not have cheese between my ears, Jamie. Neither does the blackfish. Empty threats won't daunt him. What would you counsel? She gave a ponderous shrug. M wants Edmure's head off. For once he may be right. Sir Ryman has made us a laughing stock with that gibbet of his. You need to show Sir Brendan that your threats have teeth. Killing Edmure might harden Sir Brendan's resolve. Resolve is one thing Brendan Blackfish never lacked for. Hoster Tully could have told you that. Lady Jenna finished her wine. Well, I would never presume to tell you how to fight a war. I know my place, unlike your sister. Is it true that Circe burned the Red Keep? Only the Tower of the Hand. His aunt rolled her eyes. She would have done better to leave the Tower and burn her hand. Harris Swift? If ever a man deserved his arms, it is Sir Harris. And Giles Rosby. Seven save us. I thought he died years ago. Merriweather? Your father used to call his grandsire the Chuckler, I'll have you know. Tywin claimed the only thing Merriweather was good for was chuckling at the king's witticisms. His lordship chuckled himself right into exile, as I recall. Cersei has put some bastard on the council, too, and a kettle in the king's guard. She has the Faith arming and the Bravosi calling in loans all over Westeros, none of which would be happening if she'd had the simple sense to make your uncle the king's hand. Sir Kevin refused the office. So he said. He did not say why. There was much he did not say, would not say. Lady Jenna made a face. Kevin always did what was asked of him. It is not like him to turn away from any duty. Something is awry here. I can smell it. He said that he was tired. He knows, Circe had said, as they stood above their father's corpse. He knows about us. Tired? His aunt pursed her lips. I suppose he has a right to be. It has been hard for Kevin, living all his life in Tywin's shadow. It was hard for all my brothers. That shadow Tywin cast was long and black, and each of them had to struggle to find a little son. Tiget tried to be his own man, but he could never match your father, and that just made him angrier as the years went by. Geryon made japes. Better to mock the game than to play and lose. But Kevin saw how things stood early on, 
so he made himself a place by your father's side. And you? Jamie asked her. It was not a game for girls. I was my father's precious princess, and Tywin's too, until I disappointed him. My brother never learned to like the taste of disappointment. She pushed herself to her feet. I've said what I came to say. I shan't take any more of your time. Do what Tywin would have done. Did you love him? Jamie heard himself ask. His aunt looked at him strangely. I was seven when Walder Frey persuaded my lord father to give my hand to M, his second son, not even his heir. Father was himself a third-born son, and younger children craved the approval of their elders. Frey sensed that weakness in him, and father agreed for no better reason than to please him. My betrothal was announced at a feast with half the West in attendance. Ellen Tarback laughed, and the red line went angry from the hall. The rest sat on their tongues. Only Tywin dared speak against the match. A boy of ten. Father turned as white as mare's milk, and Walter Frey was quivering. She smiled. How could I not love him after that? That is not to say that I approved of all he did, or much enjoyed the company of the man that he became. But every little girl needs a big brother to protect her. Tywin was big even when he was little. She gave a sigh. Who will protect us now? Jamie kissed her cheek. He left a son. Aye, he did. That is what I fear the most, in truth. That was a queer remark. Why should you fear? Jamie, she said, tugging on his ear. Sweetling, I have known you since you were a babe at Joanna's breast. You smile like Geryon and fight like Tig, and there's some of Kevin in you, else you would not wear that cloak. But Tyrion is Tywin's son, not you. I said so once to your father's face, and he would not speak to me for half a year. Men are such thundering great fools, even the sort who come along once in a thousand years. Cat of the Canals. She woke before the sun came up, in the little room beneath the eaves that she shared with Brusco's daughters. Cat was always the first to awaken. It was warm and snug under the blankets with Talia and Brea. She could hear the soft sounds of their breath. When she stirred, sitting up and fumbling for her slippers, Brea muttered a sleepy complaint and rolled over. The chill off the gray stone walls gave Cat goose prickles. She dressed quickly in the darkness. As she was slipping her tunic over her head, Talia opened her eyes and called out, Cat, be a sweet and bring my clothes for me. She was a gawky girl, all skin and bones and elbows, always complaining she was cold. Cat fetched her clothes for her, and Talia squirmed into them underneath the blankets. Together they pulled her big sister from the bed as Brea muttered sleepy threats. By the time the three of them climbed down the ladder from the room beneath the eaves, Brusco and his sons were out in the boat on the little canal behind the house. Brusco barked at the girls to hurry, as he did every morning. His sons helped Talia and Brea onto the boat. It was Cat's task to untie them from the piling, toss the rope to Brea, and shove the boat away from the dock with a booted foot. Rusko's sons leaned into their poles. Cat ran and leapt across the widening gap between dock and deck. After that, she had nothing to do but sit and yawn for a long while as Brusco and his sons pushed them through the pre-dawn gloom, wending down a confusion of small canals. The day looked to be a rare one, crisp and clear and bright. Bravos only had three kinds of weather. Fog was bad, Rain was worse, and freezing rain was worst. But every so often would come a morning when the dawn broke pink and blue and the air was sharp and salty. 
Those were the days that Cat loved best. When they reached the broad, straight waterway that was the Long Canal, they turned south for the fish market. Cat sat with her legs crossed, fighting a yawn and trying to recall the details of her dream. I dreamed I was a wolf again. She could remember the smells best of all, trees and earth, her pack brothers, the scents of horse and deer and man, each different from the others, and the sharp acrid tang of fear, always the same. Some nights the wolf dreams were so vivid that she could hear her brothers howling even as she woke, and once Brea had claimed that she was growling in her sleep as she thrashed beneath the covers. She thought that was some stupid lie, till Talia said it too. I should not be dreaming wolf dreams, the girl told herself. I am a cat now, not a wolf. I am cat of the canals. The wolf dreams belonged to Arya of House Stark. Try as she might, though, she could not rid herself of Arya. It made no difference whether she slept beneath the temple or in the little room beneath the eaves with Brusco's daughters. The wolf dreams still haunted her by night, and sometimes other dreams as well. The wolf dreams were the good ones. In the wolf dreams she was swift and strong, running down her prey with her pack at her heels. It was the other dream she hated, the one where she had two feet instead of four. In that one she was always looking for her mother, stumbling through a wasted land of mud and blood and fire. It was always raining in that dream, and she could hear her mother screaming, but a monster with a dog's head would not let her go save her. In that dream she was always weeping, like a frightened little girl. Cats never weep, she told herself, no more than wolves do. It's just a stupid dream. The Long Canal took Busco's boat beneath the green copper domes of the Palace of Truth and the tall square towers of the Prestanes and Antarians before passing under the immense grey arches of the Sweetwater River to the district known as Silty Town, where the buildings were smaller and less grand. Later in the day the canal would be choked with serpent boats and barges, but in the pre-dawn darkness they had the waterway almost to themselves. Brusco liked to reach the fish market just as the titan roared to herald the coming of the sun. The sound would boom across the lagoon, faint with distance, but still loud enough to wake the sleeping city. By the time Brusco and his sons tied up by the fish market, it was swarming with herring sellers and cod wives, oystermen, clam diggers, stewards, cooks, small wives, and sailors off the galleys all haggling loudly with one another as they inspected the morning catch. Brusco would walk from boat to boat, having a look at all the shellfish, and from time to time tapping a cask or crate with his cane. This one, he would say, yes, tap, tap. This one, tap, tap. No, not that. Here, tap. He was not much one for talking, Talia said her father was as grudging with his words as with his coins. Oysters, clams, crabs, mussels, cockles, sometimes prawns. Brusco bought it all, depending on what looked best each day. It was for them to carry the crates and casks that he tapped back to the boat. Brusco had a bad back and could not lift anything heavier than a tankard of brown ale. Cat always stank of brine and fish by the time they pushed off for home again. She had grown so used to it that she hardly even smelled it any more. She did not mind the work. When her muscles ached from lifting or her back got sore from the weight of a cask, she told herself that she was getting stronger. Once all the casks were loaded, Brusco shoved them off again, and his sons pulled them back up the long canal. Brea and Talia sat at the front of the boat, whispering to one another. Cat knew that they were talking about Brea's boy, the one she climbed up on the roof to meet after her father was asleep. Learn three new things before you come back to us, the kindly man had commanded Cat when he sent her forth into the city. She always did. 
Sometimes it was no more than three new words of the Bravosi tongue. Sometimes she brought back sailors' tales of strange and wondrous happenings from the wide and wet world beyond the Isles of Bravos, wars and rains of toads and dragons hatching. Sometimes she learned three new japes, or three new riddles, or tricks of this trade or the other, and every so often she would learn some secret. Bravos was a city made for secrets, a city of fogs and masks and whispers, its very existence had been a secret for a century, the girl had learned. Its location had been hidden thrice that long. The nine free cities are the daughters of Valyria that was, the kindly man taught her. But Bravos is the bastard child who ran away from home. We are a mongrel folk, the sons of slaves and whores and thieves. Our forebears came from half a hundred lands to this place of refuge, to escape the dragon lords who had enslaved them. Half a hundred gods came with them, but there is one god all of them shared in common. Him of many faces. And many names, the kindly man had said. In Kohor he is the black goat. In Yiti the lion of night. In Westeros the stranger. All men must bow to him in the end, no matter if they worship the Seven, or the Lord of Light, the Moon Mother, or the Drowned God, or the Great Shepherd. All mankind belongs to him. Else somewhere in the world would be a folk who lived forever. Do you know of any folk who live forever? No, she would answer. All men must die. Cat would always find the kindly man waiting for her when she went creeping back to the temple on the knoll on the night the moon went black. What do you know that you did not know when you left us? He would always ask her. I know what blind Becco puts in the hot sauce he uses on his oysters, she would say. I know the mummers at the Blue Lantern are going to do the Lord of the Woeful Countenance, and the mummers at the ship mean to answer with seven drunken oarsmen. I know the bookseller Lotho Lornell sleeps in the house of tradesman Captain Moreto Prestain whenever the honorable tradesman Captain is away on a voyage and moves out whenever the vixen comes home. It is good to know these things. And who are you? No one. You lie. You are cat of the canals. I know you well. Go and sleep, child. On the morrow you must serve. All men must serve. And so she did, three days of every thirty. When the moon was black, she was no one, a servant of the many-faced God in a robe of black and white. She walked beside the kindly man through the fragrant darkness, carrying her iron lantern. She washed the dead, went through their clothes, and counted out their coins. Some days she still helped Uma cook, chopping big white mushrooms and boning fish. But only when the moon was black. The rest of the time she was an orphan girl in a pair of battered boots too big for her feet and a brown cloak with a ragged hem, crying mussels and cockles and clams as she wheeled her barrow through the ragman's harbor. The moon would be black tonight, she knew. Last night it had been no more than a sliver. What do you know that you did not know when you left us? The kindly man would ask as soon as he saw her. I know that Brusco's daughter Brea meets a boy on the roof when her father is asleep. She thought. Brea lets him touch her, Talia says, even though he's just a roof rat, and all the roof rats are supposed to be thieves. That was only one thing, though. Cat would need two more. She was not concerned. There were always new things to learn down by the ships. When they returned to the house, Cat helped Brusco's sons unload the boat. Brusco and his daughters divided the shellfish amongst three barrows, arranging them on layered beds of seaweed. Come back when all is sold, Brusco told the girls, just as he did every morning. And they set forth to cry the catch. 
Brea would wheel her barrel to the Purple Harbor to sell to the Bravosi sailors whose ships were anchored there. Talia would try the alleys around the moon pool or sell amongst the temples on the Isle of the Gods. Cat headed for the Ragman's Harbor as she did nine days of every ten. Only Bravosi were permitted use of the Purple Harbor from the drowned town and the Sea Lord's Palace. Ships from her sister cities and the rest of the wide world had to use the Ragman's Harbor, a poorer, rougher, dirtier port than the Purple. It was noisier as well, as sailors and traders from half a hundred lands crowded its wharves and alleys, mingling with those who served and preyed on them. Cat liked it best of any place in Bravos. She liked the noise and the strange smells, and seeing what ships had come in on the evening tide and what ships had departed. She liked the sailors, too. The boisterous Tairoshi, with their booming voices and dyed whiskers. The fair-haired Lisseni, always trying to niggle down her prices. The squat, hairy sailors from the port of Ibn, growling curses and low, raspy voices. Her favorites were the summer islanders, with their skins as smooth and dark as teak. They wore feathered cloaks of red and green and yellow, and the tall masts and white sails of their swan ships were magnificent. And sometimes there were Westerosi, too. Oarsmen and sailors off Carracks out of Old Town, trading galleys out of Duskendale, King's Landing, and Gull Town, big-bellied wine cogs from the arbor, Cat knew the bravosi words for mussels and cockles and clams, but along the Ragman's Harbor she cried her wares in the trade tongue, the language of the wharves and docks and sailors' taverns, a coarse jumble of words and phrases from a dozen languages, accompanied by hand signs and gestures, most of them insulting. Those were the ones that Cat liked best. Any man who bothered her was apt to see the fig, or hear himself described as an ass's pizzle, or a camel's cunt. Maybe I never saw a camel, she would tell them, but I know a camel's cunt when I smell one. Once in a great while, that would make somebody angry. But when it did, she had her finger knife. She kept it very sharp, and knew how to use it, too. Red Rago showed her one afternoon at the happy port while he was waiting for Lana to come free. He taught her how to hide it up her sleeve and slip it out when she had need of it, and how to slice a purse so smooth and quick the coins would all be spent before their owner ever missed them. That was good to know. Even the kindly man agreed, especially at night, when the bravos and roof rats were abroad. Cat had made friends along the wharves, porters and mummers, rope makers and sail menders, taverners, brewers and bakers and beggars and whores. They bought clams and cockles from her, told her two tales of bravos and lies about their lives, and laughed at the way she talked when she tried to speak bravosi. She never let that trouble her. Instead, she showed them all the fig, and told them they were camel cunts, which made them roar with laughter. Gailora Dothair taught her filthy songs, and his brother Gaileno told her the best places to catch eels. The mummers off the ship showed her how a hero stands, and taught her speeches from the Song of the Roin, the Conqueror's Two Wives, and the Merchant's Lusty Lady. Quill, the sad-eyed little man who made up all the bawdy farces for the ship, offered to teach her how a woman kisses, but Taganaro smacked him with a codfish and put an end to that. Cosimo the Conjurer instructed her in sleight of hand. He could swallow mice, and pull them from her ears. It's magic, he'd say. It's not, Cat said. The mouse was up your sleeve the whole time. I could see it moving. Oysters, clams, and cockles were Cat's magic words, and like all good magic words, they could take her almost anywhere. She had boarded ships from Lys and Old Town and the port of Ibn, and sold her oysters right on deck. Some days she rolled her barrow past the towers of the mighty to offer baked clams to the guardsmen at their gates. Once she cried her catch on the steps of the Palace of Truth, and when another peddler tried to run her off, she turned his cart over 
and sent his oysters skittering across the cobbles. Customs officers from the checky port would buy from her, and paddlers from the drowned town, whose sunken domes and towers poked up from the green waters of the lagoon. One time when Brea took to her bed with her moon blood, Cat had pushed her barrow to the purple harbor to sell crabs and prawns to oarsmen off the Sea Lord's pleasure barge, covered stem to stern with laughing faces. Other days she followed the Sweetwater River to the moon pool. She sold to swaggering bravos in striped satin, and to key holders and justiciers in drab coats of brown and gray. But she always returned to the Ragman's Harbor. Oysters, clams, and cockles, the girl shouted as she pushed her barrow along the wharves. Mussels, prawns, and cockles. A dirty orange cat came padding after her, drawn by the sound of her call. Farther on, a second cat appeared, a sad bedraggled gray thing with a stubbed tail. Cats liked the smell of cat. Some days she would have a dozen trailing after her before the sun went down. From time to time the girl would throw an oyster at them and watch to see who came away with it. The biggest toms would seldom win, she noticed. Oft as not, the prize went to some smaller, quicker animal, thin and mean and hungry. Like me, she told herself. Her favorite was a scrawny old tom with a chewed ear, who reminded her of a cat that she'd once chased all around the Red Keep. No, that was some other girl, not me. Two of the ships that had been here yesterday were gone, Cat saw, but five new ones had docked, a small carrack called the Brazen Monkey, a huge Ibanese whaler that reeked of tar and blood and whale oil, two battered cogs from Pentos, and a lean green galley up from old Volantis. Cat stopped at the foot of every gangplank to cry her clams and oysters, once in the trade talk and again in the common tongue of Westeros. A crewman on the whaler cursed at her so loudly that he scared away her cats, and one of the Pentoshi oarsmen asked how much she wanted for the clam between her legs, but she fared better at the other ships. A mate on the green galley wolfed half a dozen oysters and told her how his captain had been killed by the Lysine pirates who had tried to board them near the stepstones. That bastard San it was, with old mother's son and his big Valyrian. We got away, but just. The little brazen monkey proved to be from Gulltown, with a Restorosi crew who were glad to talk to someone in the common tongue. One asked how a girl from King's Landing came to be selling mussels on the docks of Bravos, so she had to tell her tale. "'We're here four days and four long nights,' another told her. "'Where's a man to go to find a bit of sport?' "'The mummers at the ship are doing seven drunken oarsmen,' Cat told them. "'And there's eel fights in the spotted cellar, down by the gates of drowned town. "'Or if you want... You can go by the moon pool, where the bravos duel at night. Aye, that's good, another sailor said. But what Watt was really wanting was a woman. The best whores are at the happy port, down by where the mummer's ship is moored. She pointed. Some of the dockside whores were vicious, and sailors fresh from the sea ever knew which ones. Sveroni was the worst, Everyone said she had robbed and killed a dozen men, rolling the bodies into the canals to feed the eels. The drunken daughter could be sweet when sober, but not with wine in her. And Canker Janie was really a man. Ask for Mary. Marilyn is her true name, but everyone calls her Mary, and she is. Mary bought a dozen oysters every time Cat came by the brothel and shared them with her girls. She had a good heart, everyone agreed. That and the biggest pair of teats in all of Bravos, Mary herself was fond of boasting. Her girls were nice as well, blushing Bethany and the sailor's wife, one-eyed Ina, who could tell your fortune from a drop of blood, pretty little Lana, even Asadora, the Ebenezer woman with the moustache. They might not be beautiful, but they were kind to her. 
The happy port is where all the porters go, Cat assured the men of the brazen monkey. The boys unload the ships, Mary says, and my girls unload the lads who sail them. What about them fancy whores the singers sing about? asked the youngest monkey, a red-haired boy with freckles who could not have been much more than six and ten. Are they as pretty as they say? Where would I get one of them? His shipmates looked at him and laughed. Seven hells, boy, said one of them. Might be the captain could get himself a courtesan, but only if he sold the bloody ship. That sort of cunts for lords and such, not for the likes of us. The courtesans of Bravos were famed across the world. Singers sang of them. Goldsmiths and jewelers showered them with gifts. Craftsmen begged for the honor of their custom. Merchant princes paid royal ransoms to have them on their arms at balls and feasts and mummer shows. And Bravos slew each other in their names. As she pushed a barrow along the canals, Cat would sometimes glimpse one of them floating by, on her way to an evening with some lover. Every courtesan had her own barge, and servants to pull her to her trysts. The poetess always had a book to hand, and Moonshadow wore only white and silver, and the Merlin Queen was never seen without her mermaids, four young maidens in the blush of their first flowering, who held her train and did her hair. Each courtesan was more beautiful than the last. Even the veiled lady was beautiful, though only those she took as lovers ever saw her face. I sold three cockles to a courtesan, Cat told the sailors. She called to me as she was stepping off her barge. Brusco had made it plain to her that she was never to speak to a courtesan unless she was spoken to first. But the woman had smiled at her and paid her in silver ten times what the cockles had been worth. Which one was this now? The Queen of Cockles, was it? The Black Pearl, she told them. Mary claimed the Black Pearl was the most famous courtesan of all. She's descended from the dragons, that one. The woman had told Cat. The first Black Pearl was a pirate queen. A Westerosi prince took her for a lover and got a daughter on her who grew up to be a courtesan. Her own daughter followed her, and her daughter after her, until you get to this one. What did she say to you, Cat? She said, I'll take three cockles, and do you have some hot sauce, little one? The girl had answered. And what did you say? I said, No, my lady, and don't call me little one. My name is Cat. I should have hot sauce, Becco does, and he sells three times as many oysters as Brusco. Cat told the kindly man about the Black Pearl, too. Her true name is Belegiri Otheris, she informed him. It was one of the three things that she had learned. It is, the priest said softly. Her mother was Bellonara, but the first Black Pearl was a Belegiri as well. Cat knew that the men off the brazen monkey would not care about the name of a courtesan's mother, though. Instead, she asked them for tidings of the Seven Kingdoms and the war. War? laughed one of them. What war? There is no war. Not in Gulltown, said another. Not in the Vale. The little lords kept us out of it, same as his mother did. Same as his mother did. The Lady of the Vale was her own mother's sister. Lady Lysa, she said, is she dead? Finished the freckled boy, whose head was full of courtesans. Aye, murdered by her own singer. Oh, it's not to me. Cat of the Canals never had an aunt. She never did. Cat lifted her barrow and wheeled away from the brazen monkey, bumping over cobblestones. Oysters, clams, and cockles, she called. Oysters, clams, and cockles. She sold most of her clams to the porters, offloading the big wine cog from the arbor, and the rest to the men repairing a mirish trading galley that had been savaged by the storms. Farther down the docks, she came on Taganaro, sitting with his back against the piling, next to Caso, 
king of seals. He bought some mussels from her, and Caso barked and let her shake his flipper. You come work with me, cat, urged Taganaro, as he was sucking mussels from their shells. He had been looking for a new partner ever since the drunken daughter put her knife through little Narbo's hand. I give you more than Brusco, and you would not smell like fish. Caso likes the way I smell, she said. The king of seals barked as if to agree. Is Narbo's hand no better? Three fingers do not bend, complained Taganaro between muscles. What good is a cut purse who cannot use his fingers? Norbo was good at picking pockets, not so good at picking whores. Mary says the same. Cat was sad. She liked little Narbo, even if he was a thief. What will he do? Pull an oar, he says. Two fingers are enough for that, he thinks, and the sea lord's always looking for more oarsmen. I tell him, Narbo, no. That sea is colder than a maiden and crueler than a whore. Better you should cut off the hand and beg. Casso knows I am right. Don't you, Casso? The seal barked, and Cat had to smile. She tossed another cockle his way before she went off on her own. The day was nearly done by the time Cat reached the happy port across the alley from where the ship was anchored. Some of the mummers sat atop the listing hulk, passing a skin of wine from hand to hand, but when they saw Cat's barrow, they came down for some oysters. She asked them how it went with seven drunken oarsmen. Joss, the gloom, shook his head. Quince finally came on Aliquo abed with Slowy. They went at one another with mummer swords, and both of them have left us. We'll only be five drunken oarsmen tonight, it would seem. We shall strive to make up in drunkenness what we lack in oarsmen, declared Mermello. I, for one, am equal to the task. Little Narbo wants to be an oarsman, Cat told them. If you got him, you'd have six. You had best go see Mary, Joss told her. You know how sour she gets without her oysters. When Cat slipped inside the brothel, though, she found Mary sitting in the common room with her eyes shut, listening to Darian play his wood harp. Ina was there, too, braiding Lana's fine long golden hair. Another stupid love song. Lana was always begging the singer to play her stupid love songs. She was the youngest of the whores, only ten and four. Mary asked three times as much for her as for any of the other girls, Cat knew. It made her angry to see Darian sitting there so brazen, making eyes at Lana as his fingers danced across the harp strings. The whores called him the Black Singer, but there was hardly any black about him now. With the coin his singing brought him, the crow had transformed himself into a peacock. Today he wore a plush purple cloak lined with vair, a striped white and lilac tunic, and the party-colored breeches of a bravo. But he owned a silken cloak as well, and one made of burgundy velvet that was lined with cloth of gold. The only black about him was his boots. Cat had heard him tell Lana that he'd thrown all the rest in a canal. "'I am done with darkness,' he had announced. "'He is a man of the night's watch,' she thought, as he sang about some stupid lady throwing herself off some stupid tower because her stupid prince was dead. The lady should go kill the ones who killed her prince, and the singer should be on the wall. When Darian had first appeared at the happy port, Arya had almost asked if he would take her with him back to East Watch until she heard him telling Bethany that he was never going back. Hard beds, salt cod, and endless watches— that's the wall, he'd said. Besides, there's no one half as pretty as you at East Watch. How could I ever leave you? He had said the same thing to Lana, Cat had heard, and to one of the whores at the cattery, and even to the nightingale the night he played at the House of Seven Lamps. I wish I had been here the night the fat one hit him. Mary's whores still laughed about that. 
Ina said the fat boy had gone red as a beet every time she touched him, but when he started trouble, Mary had him dragged outside and thrown in the canal. Cat was thinking about the fat boy, remembering how she had saved him from Tero and Orbello, when the sailor's wife appeared beside her. He sings a pretty song, she murmured softly in the common tongue of Westeros. The gods must have loved him to give him such a voice, and that fair face as well. He is fair of face and foul of heart, thought Arya, but she did not say it. Darian had once wed the sailor's wife, who would only bed with men who married her. The happy port sometimes had three or four weddings a night. Often the cheerful, wine-soaked red priest, as Alino, performed the rites. Elsewise, it was Eustace, who had once been a septon at the sept beyond the sea. If neither priest nor septon was on hand, one of the whores would run to the ship and fetch back a mummer. Mary always claimed the mummers made much better priests than priests, especially Mermello. The weddings were loud and jolly, with a lot of drinking. Whenever Cat happened by with her barrow, the sailor's wife would insist that her new husband buy some oysters to stiffen him for the consummation. She was good that way, and quick to laugh as well, but Cat thought there was something sad about her, too. The other whores said that the sailor's wife visited the Isle of the Gods on the days when her flower was in bloom, and knew all the gods who lived there, even the ones that Bravos had forgotten. They said she went to pray for her first husband, her true husband, who had been lost at sea when she was a girl no older than Lana. She thinks that if she finds the right god, maybe he will send the winds and blow her old love back to her, said one-eyed Ina, who had known her longest. But I pray it never happens. Her love is dead. I could taste that in her blood. If he ever should come back to her, it will be a corpse. Darian's song was finally ending. As the last notes faded in the air, Lana gave a sigh, and the singer put his harp aside and pulled her up into his lap. He had just started to tickle her when Cat said loudly, There's oysters, if anyone is wanting some and Mary's eyes popped open. Good, the woman said. Bring them in, child. Ina, fetch some bread and vinegar. The swollen red sun hung in the sky behind the row of masts when Cat took her leave of the happy port, with a plump purse of coins and a barrel empty but for salt and seaweed. Darian was leaving, too. He had promised to sing at the Inn of the Green Eel this evening, he told her as they strolled along together. Every time I play the eel, I come away with silver, he boasted, and some nights there are captains there, and owners. They crossed a little bridge and made their way down a crooked back street as the shadows of the day grew longer. Soon I will be playing in the purple, and after that the Sea Lord's Palace, Darian went on. Cat's empty barrel clattered over the cobblestones, making its own sort of rattling music. Yesterday I ate herring with the whores, but within the year I'll be having emperor crab with courtesans. What happened to your brother? Cat asked. The fat one. Did he ever find a ship to Old Town? He said he was supposed to sail on the Lady Ushinora. We all were. Lord Snow's command. I told Sam, leave the old man, but the fat fool would not listen. The last light of the setting sun shone in his hair. Well, it's too late now. Just so, said Cat, as they stepped into the gloom of a twisted little alley. By the time Cat returned to Brusco's house, an evening fog was gathering above the small canal. She put away her barrow, found Brusco in his counting room, and thumped her purse down on the table in front of him. She thumped the boots down, too. Brusco gave the purse a pat. Good, but what's this? Boots. Good boots are hard to find, said Brusco, but these are too small for my feet. He picked one up to squint at it. The moon will be black tonight, she reminded him. Best you pray, then. Brusco shoved the boots aside and poured out the coins to count them. 
Bolar Doheris. Bolar Morgulis, she thought. Fog rose all around as she walked through the streets of Bravos. She was shivering a little by the time she pushed through the weirwood door into the house of black and white. Only a few candles burned this evening, flickering like fallen stars. In the darkness, all the gods were strangers. Down in the vaults, she untied Cat's threadbare cloak, pulled Cat's fishy brown tunic over her head, kicked off Cat's salt stained boots, climbed out of Cat's small clothes, and bathed in lemon water to wash away the very smell of Cat of the Canals. When she emerged, soaked and scrubbed pink with her brown hair plastered to her cheeks, Cat was gone. She donned clean robes and a pair of soft cloth slippers and padded to the kitchens to beg some food of Uma. The priests and acolytes had already eaten, but the cook had saved a piece of nice fried cod for her and some mashed yellow turnips. She wolfed it down, washed the dish, then went to help the waif prepare her potions. Her part was mostly fetching, scrambling up ladders to find the herbs and leaves the waif required. Sweet sleep is the gentlest of poisons, the waif told her as she was grinding some with a mortar and pestle. A few grains will slow a pounding heart and stop a hand from shaking and make a man feel calm and strong. A pinch will grant a night of deep and dreamless sleep. Three pinches will produce that sleep that does not end. The taste is very sweet, so it is best used in cakes and pies and honeyed wines. Here, you can smell the sweetness. She let her have a whiff, then sent her up the ladders to find a red glass bottle. This is a crueler poison, but tasteless and odorless, hence easier to hide. The tears of Lys, men call it, dissolved in wine or water, it eats at a man's bowels and belly and kills as a sickness of those parts. Smell. Aria sniffed and smelled nothing. The waif put the tears to one side and opened a fat stone jar. This paste is spiced with basilisk blood. It will give cooked flesh a savory smell, but if eaten, it produces violent madness in beasts as well as men. A mouse will attack a lion after a taste of basilisk blood. Aria chewed her lip. Would it work on dogs? On any animal with warm blood? The waif slapped her. She raised her hand to her cheek, more surprised than hurt. Why did you do that? It is Arya of House Stark who chews on her lip whenever she is thinking. Are you Arya of House Stark? I am no one. She was angry. Who are you? She did not expect the waif to answer, but she did. I was born the only child of an ancient house, my noble father's heir. The waif replied, My mother died when I was little. I have no memory of her. When I was six, my father wed again. His new wife treated me kindly until she gave birth to a daughter of her own. Then it was her wish that I should die, so her own blood might inherit my father's wealth. She should have sought the favor of the many-faced God, but she could not bear the sacrifice he would ask of her. Instead, she thought to poison me herself. It left me as you see me now, but I did not die. When the healers in the house of the Red Hands told my father what she had done, he came here and made sacrifice, offering up all his wealth and me. Him of many faces heard his prayer. I was brought to the temple to serve, and my father's wife received the gift. Arya considered her warily. Is that true? There is truth in it. And lies as well? There is an untruth and an exaggeration. She had been watching the wave's face the whole time she told her story, but the other girl had shown her no signs. The many-faced god took two-thirds of your father's wealth, not all. Just so. That was my exaggeration. Aria grinned, realizing she was grinning, and gave her cheek a pinch. Rule your face, she told herself. 
My smile is my servant. He should come at my command. What part was the lie? No part. I lied about the lie. Did you? Or are you lying now? But before the waif could answer, the kindly man stepped into the chamber, smiling. You have returned to us. The moon is black. It is. What three new things do you know that you did not know when last you left us? I know thirty new things, she almost said. Three of little Narbo's fingers will not bend. He means to be an oarsman. It is good to know this. And what else? She thought back on her day. Quince and Aliquo had a fight and left the ship, but I think that they'll come back. Do you only think, or do you know? I only think, she had to confess, even though she was certain of it. Mummers had to eat the same as other men, and Quince and Aliquo were not good enough for the Blue Lantern. Just so, said the kindly man. And the third thing? This time she did not hesitate. Darian is dead. The black singer who was sleeping at the happy port. He was really a deserter from the night's watch. Someone slit his throat and pushed him into a canal, but they kept his boots. Good boots are hard to find. Just so. She tried to keep her face still. Who could have done this thing, I wonder? Arya of House Stark? She watched his eyes, his mouth, the muscles of his jaw. That girl? I thought she had left Bravos. Who are you? No one. You lie. He turned to the waif. My throat is dry. Do me a kindness and bring a cup of wine for me and warm milk for our friend Arya, who has returned to us so unexpectedly. On her way across the city, Arya had wondered what the kindly man would say when she told him about Darian. Maybe he would be angry with her, or maybe he would be pleased that she had given the singer the gift of the many-faced god. She had played this talk out in her head half a hundred times, like a mummer in a show. But she had never thought warm milk. When the milk came, Arya drank it down. It smelled a little burnt and had a bitter aftertaste. Go to bed now, child, the kindly man said. On the morrow you must serve. That night she dreamed she was a wolf again, but it was different from the other dreams. In this dream she had no pack. She prowled alone, bounding over rooftops and padding silently beside the banks of a canal, stalking shadows through the fog. When she woke the next morning, she was blind. Samwell The cinnamon wind was a swan ship out of tall trees town on the summer isles, where men were black, women were wanton, and even the gods were strange. She had no septon aboard her to lead them in the prayers of passing, so the task fell to Samuel Tarley. Somewhere off the sun-scorched southern coast of Dorne. Sam donned his blacks to say the words, though the afternoon was warm and muggy with nary a breath of wind. He was a good man, he began, but as soon as he had said the words, he knew that they were wrong. No. He was a great man, a maester of the citadel, chained and sworn, and sworn brother of the Night's Watch, ever faithful. When he was born, they named him for a hero who had died too young. But though he lived a long, long time, his own life was no less heroic. No man was wiser or gentler or kinder. At the wall, a dozen lords' commander came and went during his years of service, but he was always there to counsel them. He counseled kings as well. He could have been a king himself, but when they offered him the crown, 
he told them they should give it to his younger brother. How many men would do that? Sam felt the tears welling in his eyes and knew he could not go on much longer. He was the blood of the dragon, but now his fire has gone out. He was Aemon Targaryen, and now his watch is ended. And now his watch is ended, Gilly murmured after him, rocking the babe in her arms. Kojomo echoed her in the common tongue of Westeros, then repeated the words in the summer tongue for Shondo and her father and the rest of the assembled crew. Sam hung his head and began to weep, his sobs so loud and wrenching that they made his whole body shake. Gilly came and stood beside him and let him cry upon her shoulder. There were tears in her eyes as well. The air was moist and warm and dead calm, and the cinnamon wind was adrift upon a deep blue sea far beyond the sight of land. Black Sam said good words, Shondo said. Now we drink his life. He shouted something in the summer tongue, and a cask of spiced rum was rolled up onto the afterdeck and breached, so those on watch might down a cup in the memory of the old blind dragon. The crew had known him only a short while, but Summer Islanders revered the elderly and celebrated their dead. Sam had never drunk rum before. The liquor was strange and heady, sweet at first, but with a fiery aftertaste that burned his tongue. He was tired, so tired. Every muscle he had was aching, and there were other aches in places where Sam hadn't known he had muscles. His knees were stiff, his hands covered with fresh new blisters, and raw sticky patches of skin where the old blisters had burst. Yet between them, rum and sadness seemed to wash his hurts away. If only we could have gotten him to Old Town, the Archmaesters might have saved him, he told Gilly as they sipped their rum on the cinnamon wind's high forecastle. The healers of the Citadel are the best in the Seven Kingdoms. For a while, I thought, I hoped. On Bravos, it had seemed possible that Aemon might recover. Shondo's talk of dragons had almost seemed to restore the old man to himself. That night he ate every bite Sam put before him. No one ever looked for a girl, he said. It was a prince that was promised, not a princess. Rager, I thought, the smoke was from the fire that devoured Summerhall on the day of his birth, the salt from the tears shed for those who died. He shared my belief when he was young, but later he became persuaded that it was his own son who fulfilled the prophecy, for a comet had been seen above King's Landing on the night Aegon was conceived, and Rhaegar was certain the bleeding star had to be a comet. What fools we were, who thought ourselves so wise. The error crept in from the translation. Dragons are neither male nor female. Barth saw the truth of that but now one and now the other, as changeable as flame. The language misled us all for a thousand years. Daenerys is the one, born amid salt and smoke. The dragons prove it. Just talking of her seemed to make him stronger. I must go to her. I must. Would that I was even ten years younger. The old man had been so determined that he had even walked up the plank onto the cinnamon wind on his own two legs, after Sam made arrangements for their passage. He had already given his sword and scabbard to Shondo to repay the big mate for the feathered cloak he'd ruined, saving Sam from drowning. The only things of value that still remained to them were the books they had brought from the vaults of Castle Black. Sam parted with them glumly. They were meant for the citadel, he said, when Shondo asked him what was wrong. When the mate translated those words, the captain laughed. Kuro Mo says the gray man will be having these books still, Shondo told him. 
only they will be buying them from Kuhuru Mo. The maesters give good silver for books they are not having, and sometimes red and yellow gold. The captain wanted Eamon's chain as well, but there Sam had refused. It was a great shame for any maester to surrender his chain, he had explained. Shondo had to go over that part three times before Kuhuro Mo accepted it. By the time the dealing was done, Sam was down to his boots and blacks and small clothes. And the broken horn John Snow had found on the fist of first men. I had no choice, he told himself. We could not stay on Bravos, and short of theft or beggary, there was no other way to pay for passage. He would have counted it cheap at thrice the price if only they had gotten Maester Eamon safe to Old Town. Their passage south had been a stormy one, however, and every gale took its toll on the old man's strength and spirits. At Pentos he asked to be brought up onto deck so Sam might paint a picture of the city for him with words, but that was the last time he left the captain's bed. Soon after that his wits began to wander once again. By the time the cinnamon wind swept past the bleeding tower into Tyrosh Harbor, Eamon no longer spoke of trying to find a ship to take him east. Instead, his talk turned back to Old Town and the archmaesters of the Citadel. "'You must tell them, Sam,' he said. "'The archmaesters. You must make them understand.' The men who were at the Citadel when I was have been dead for fifty years. These others never knew me. My letters. In Old Town they must have read like the ravings of an old man whose wits had fled. You must convince them where I could not. Tell them, Sam, tell them how it is upon the wall. The whites and the white walkers, the creeping cold. I will. Sam promised. I will add my voice to yours, Maester. We will both tell them, the two of us together. No, the old man said. It must be you. Tell them. The prophecy? My brother's dream. Lady Melisandre has misread the signs. Stannis. Stannis has some of the dragon blood in him, yes. His brothers did as well. Rael? Egg's little girl. She was how they came by it. Their father's mother. She used to call me Uncle Maester when she was a little girl. I remembered that, so I allowed myself to hope. Perhaps I wanted to. We all deceive ourselves when we want to believe. Melisandre most of all, I think. The sword is wrong. She has to know that. Light without heat. An empty glamour. The sword is wrong. And the false light can only lead us deeper into darkness, Sam. Daenerys is our hope. Tell them that at the Citadel. Make them listen. They must send her a maester. Daenerys must be counseled, taught, protected. For all these years I've lingered waiting, watching, and now that the day has dawned, I am too old. I am dying, Sam. Tears ran from his blind white eyes at that admission. Death should hold no fear for a man as old as me, but it does. Isn't that silly? It is always dark where I am. So why should I fear the darkness? Yet I cannot help but wonder what will follow when the last warmth leaves my body. Will I feast forever in the Father's golden hall, as the Septons say? Will I talk with Egg again, find Darian whole and happy, hear my sisters singing to their children? What if the horse lords have the truth of it? Will I ride through the night sky forever on a stallion made of flame? Or must I return again to this veil of sorrow? Who can say, truly? 
who has been beyond the wall of death to see. Only the whites, and we know what they are like. We know. There was little and less that Sam could say to that, but he had given the old man what little comfort he could. And Gilly came in afterward and sang a song for him, a nonsense song thing that she learned from some of Craster's other wives. It made the old man smile and helped him go to sleep. That had been one of his last good days. After that, the old man spent more time sleeping than awake, curled up beneath a pile of furs in the captain's cabin. Sometimes he would mutter in his sleep. When he woke, he'd call for Sam, insisting that he had to tell him something, but, oft as not, he would have forgotten what he meant to say by the time that Sam arrived. Even when he did recall, his talk was all a jumble. He spoke of dreams, and never named the dreamer, of a glass candle that could not be lit, and eggs that would not hatch. He said the Sphinx was the riddle, not the Riddler, whatever that meant. He asked Sam to read for him from a book by Septon Barth, whose writings had been burned during the reign of Bela the Blessed. Once he woke up weeping. The dragon must have three heads, he wailed. But I am too old and frail to be one of them. I should be with her, showing her the way. But my body has betrayed me. As the cinnamon wind made her way through the stepstones, Mr. Eamon forgot Sam's name, oft as not. Some days he took him for one of his dead brothers. He was too frail for such a long voyage, Sam told Gilly on the forecastle, after another sip of rum. John should have seen that. Eamon was a hundred and two years old. He should never have been sent to sea. If he had stayed at Castle Black, he might have lived another ten years. Or else she might have burned him, the Red Woman. Even here, a thousand leagues from the wall, Gilly was reluctant to say Lady Melisandre's name aloud. She wanted King's blood for her fires. Val knew she did. Lord Snow, too. That was why they made me take Dallas babe away and leave my own behind in his place. Mr. Eamon went to sleep and didn't wake up. But if he had stayed, she would have burned him. He will still burn, Sam thought miserably. Only now I have to do it. The Targaryens always gave their fallen to the flames. Kahuru Mo would not allow a funeral pyre aboard the cinnamon wind, so Eamon's corpse had been stuffed inside a cask of black-belly rum to preserve it until the ship reached Old Town. The night before he died, he asked if he might hold the babe. Gilly went on. I was afraid he might drop him, but he never did. He rocked him and hummed a song for him, and Dallas boy reached up and touched his face. The way he pulled his lip, I thought he might be hurting him, but it only made the old man laugh. She stroked Sam's hand. We could name the little one Maester, if you like, when he's old enough, not now. We could. Maester is not a name. You could call him Eamon, though. Gilly thought about that. Dalla brought him forth during battle, as the swords sang all around her. That should be his name. Eamon Battleborn. Eamon Steelsong, a name even my lord father might like. A warrior's name. The boy was Mance Raider's son, and Craster's grandson after all. He had none of Sam's craven blood. Yes, call him that. When he is two, she promised. Not before. Where is the boy? Sam thought to ask. Between rum and sorrow, it had taken him that long to realize that Gilly did not have the babe with her. Kojja has him. I asked her to take him for a while. Oh. Coach Jomo was the captain's daughter, taller than Sam and slender as a spear, with skin as black and smooth as polished jet. She captained the ship's red archers, too, and pulled a double-curved golden-heart bow that could send a shaft four hundred yards. 
When the pirates had attacked them in the Stepstones, Kojja's arrows had slain a dozen of them, whilst Sam's own shafts were falling in the water. The only thing Kojja Mo loved better than her bow was bouncing Dalla's boy upon her knee and singing to him in the summer tongue. The wildling prince had become the darling of all the women in the crew, and Gilly seemed to trust them with him, as she had never trusted any man. That was kind of Koja, Sam said. I was afraid of her at first, said Gilly. She was so black, and her teeth were so big and white. I was afraid she was a beastling, or a monster. But she's not. She's good. I like her. I know you do. For most of her life, the only man Gilly had known had been the terrifying Craster. The rest of her world had been female. Men frighten her, but women don't, Sam realized. He could understand that. Back at Horn Hill, he had preferred the company of girls as well. His sisters had been kind to him, and though the other girls would sometimes taunt him, cruel words were easier to shrug off than the blows and buffets he got from the other castle boys. Even now, on the cinnamon wind, Sam felt more comfortable with Coach Jomo than with her father, though that might be because she spoke the common tongue and he did not. I like you too, Sam, whispered Gilly, and I like this drink. It tastes like fire. Yes, Sam thought, a drink for dragons. Their cups were empty, so he went over to the cask and filled them once again. The sun was low in the west, he saw, swollen to thrice its proper size. His ruddy light made Gilly's face seem flushed and red. They drank a cup to Coach Jomo, and one to Dalla's boy, and one to Gilly's babe back on the wall. And after that, nothing would do but to drink two cups for Aemon of House Targaryen. May the father judge him justly, Sam said, sniffing. The sun was almost gone by the time they were done with Maester Aemon. Only a long, thin line of red still glowed upon the western horizon, like a slash across the sky. Gilly said that the drink was making the ship spin round, so Sam helped her down the ladder to the women's quarters in the bow of the ship. There was a lantern hanging just inside the cabin, and he managed to bang his head on it going in. Ow! he said. And Gilly said, Are you hurt? Let me see. She leaned close and kissed his mouth. Sam found himself kissing her back. I said the words, he thought, but her hands were tugging at his blacks, pulling at the laces of his breeches. He broke off the kiss long enough to say, We can't. But Gilly said, We can, and covered his mouth with her own again. The cinnamon wind was spinning all around them, and he could taste the rum on Gilly's tongue, and the next thing her breasts were bare, and he was touching them. I said the words, Sam thought again, but one of her nipples found its way between his lips. It was pink and hard, and when he sucked on it, her milk filled his mouth, mingling with the taste of rum, and he had never tasted anything so fine and sweet and good. If I do this, I am no better than Darian, Sam thought, but it felt too good to stop. And suddenly his cock was out, jutting upward from his breeches like a fat pink mast. It looked so silly standing there that he might have laughed, but Gilly pushed him back onto her pallet, hiked her skirts up around her thighs, and lowered herself onto him with a little whimpery sound. That was even better than her nipples. She's so wet he thought, gasping. I never knew a woman could get so wet down there. I am your wife now, she whispered, sliding up and down on him. And Sam groaned and thought, No, no, you can't be. I said the words. I said the words. But the only word he said was, Yes. Afterward, she went to sleep with her arms around him and her face across his chest. Sam needed sleep as well, but he was drunk on rum and mother's milk and gilly. He knew he ought to crawl back to his own hammock in the men's cabin, 
but she felt so good, curled up against him, that somehow he could not move. Others came in, men and women both, and he listened to them kissing and laughing and mating with one another. Summer Islanders, that's how they mourn. They answer death with life. Sam had read that somewhere a long time ago. He wondered if Gilly knew, if Koj Jamo had told her what to do. He breathed the fragrance of her hair and stared at the lantern swinging overhead. Even the crone herself could not lead me safely out of this. The best thing he could do would be to slip away and jump into the sea. If I'm drowned, no one need ever know that I shamed myself and broke my vows. And Gilly can find herself a better man, one who is not some big fat coward. He awoke the next morning in his own hammock in the men's cabin, with Shondo bellowing about the wind. Wind is up, the mate kept shouting. Wake and work, Black Sam. Wind is up. What Shondo lacked in vocabulary, he made up for in volume. Sam rolled from his hammock to his feet and regretted it at once. His head was fit to split. One of the blisters on his palm had torn open in the night, and he felt as if he were about to retch. Shondo had no mercy, though, so all that Sam could do was struggle back into his blacks. He found them on the deck beneath his hammock, all bundled up in one damp heap. He sniffed at them to see how foul they were, and inhaled the smell of salt and sea and tar, wet canvas and mildew, fruit and fish and black belly rum, strange spices and exotic woods, and a heady bouquet of his own dried sweat. But Gilly's smell was on them, too, the clean smell of her hair and the sweet smell of her milk, and that made him glad to wear them. He would have given much and more for warm, dry socks, though. Some sort of fungus had begun to grow between his toes. The chest of books had not been near enough to buy passage for four from Bravos to Old Town. The cinnamon wind was short-handed, however, so Kuhurul Mo had agreed that he would take them, provided that they worked their way. When Sam had protested that Maester Eamon was too weak, the boy, a babe in arms, and Gilly terrified of the sea, Shondo only laughed. Black Sam is big fat man. Black Sam will work for four. If truth be told, Sam was so fumble-fingered that he doubted he was even doing the work of one good man. But he did try. He scrubbed decks and rubbed them smooth with stones. He hauled on anchor chains. He coiled rope and hunted rats. He sewed up torn sails, patched leaks with bubbling hot tar boned fish, and chopped fruit for the cook. Gilly tried as well. She was better in the rigging than Sam was, though from time to time the sight of so much empty water still made her close her eyes. Gilly, Sam thought, what am I going to do with Gilly? It was a long, hot, sticky day, made longer by his pounding head. Sam busied himself with ropes and sails and the other tasks that Chando set him, and tried not to let his eyes wander to the cask of rum that held old Maester Eamon's body. Or to Gilly. He could not face the wildling girl right now, not after what they'd done last night. When she came up on deck, he went below. When she went forward, he went aft. When she smiled at him, he turned away, feeling wretched. I should have jumped into the sea whilst she was still asleep, he thought. I've always been a craven, but I was never an oath-breaker till now. If Maester Eamon had not died, Sam could have asked him what to do. If Jon Snow had been aboard, or even Pip and Gren, he might have turned to them. Instead, he had Shondo. Shondo would not understand what I was saying, or if he did, he'd just tell me to fuck the girl again. Fuck had been the first word of the common tongue that Shondo had learned, and he was very fond of it. He was fortunate that the cinnamon wind was so big. Aboard the Blackbird, Gilly could have run him down in hardly any time at all. Swan ships, 
the great vessels from the Summer Isles were called in the Seven Kingdoms, for their billowing white sails and for their figureheads, most of which depicted birds. Large as they were, they rode the waves with a grace that was all their own. With a good brisk wind behind them, the cinnamon wind could outrun any galley, though she was helpless when becalmed, and she offered plenty of places for a craven to hide. Near the end of Sam's watch, he was finally cornered. He was climbing down a ladder when Shondo seized him by the collar. "'Black Sam, come with Shondo,' he said, dragging him across the deck and dumping him at the feet of Code Jumeau. Far off to the north, a haze was visible low on the horizon. Kojja pointed at it. There is the coast of Dorne, sand and rocks and scorpions, and no good anchorage for hundreds of leagues. You can swim there, if you like, and walk to Old Town. You will need to cross the deep desert and climb some mountains and swim the Torrentine. Or else you could go to Gilly. You do not understand. Last night we honored your dead and the gods who made you both. Shondo did the same. I had the child, else I would have been with him. All you Westerosi make a shame of loving. There is no shame in loving. If your septons say there is, your seven gods must be demons. In the Isles we know better. Our gods gave us legs to run with, noses to smell with, hands to touch and feel. What mad, cruel God would give a man eyes and tell him he must forever keep them shut and never look at all the beauty in the world? Only a monster God, a demon of the darkness. Kodja put her hand between Sam's legs. The gods gave you this for a reason, too. For, what is your Westerosi word? Fucking, Shondo offered helpfully. Yes, for fucking for the giving of pleasure and the making of children. There is no shame in that. Sam backed away from her. I took a vow. I will take no wife and father no children. I said the words. She knows the words you said. She is a child in some ways, but she is not blind. She knows why you wear the black, why you go to Old Town. She knows she cannot keep you. She wants you for a little while, is all. She lost her father and her husband, her mother and her sisters, her home, her world. All she has is you and the babe. So you go to her, or swim. Sam looked despairingly at the haze that marked the distant shoreline. He could never swim so far, he knew. He went to Gilly. What we did, if I could take a wife, I would sooner have you than any princess or high-born maiden. But I can't. I am still a crow. I said the words, Gilly. I went with John into the woods and said the words before a heart tree. The trees watch over us, Gilly whispered, brushing the tears from his cheeks. In the forest they see all. But there are no trees here. Only water, Sam. Only water. Circe. The day had been cold and gray and wet. It had poured all morning, and even when the rain stopped that afternoon, the clouds refused to part. They never saw the sun. Such wretched weather was enough to discourage even the little queen. Instead of riding with her hens and their retinue of guardsmen and admirers, she spent all day in the maiden vault with her hens, listening to the blue bard sing. Circe's own day was little better, till even fall. As the gray sky began to fade to black, they told her that the sweet Circe had come in on the evening tide, and that Orain Waters was without begging audience. The queen sent for him at once. As soon as he strode into her solar, she knew his tidings were good. "'Your grace!' he said with a broad smile. Dragonstone is yours. How splendid! She took his hands and kissed him on the cheeks. I know Toman will be pleased as well. This will mean that we can release Lord Redwine's fleet 
and drive the iron men from the shields. The news from the reach seemed to grow more dire with every raven. The iron men had not been content with their new rocks, it seemed. They were raiding up the mander in strength, and had gone so far as to attack the arbor and the smaller islands that surrounded it. The red wines had kept no more than a dozen warships in their home waters, and all those had been overwhelmed, taken, or sunk. And now there were reports that this madman who called himself Euron Crow's Eye was even sending longships up whispering sound toward Old Town. Lord Paxter was taking on provisions for the voyage home when Sweet Circe raised sail, Lord Waters reported. I would imagine that by now his main fleet has put to sea. Let us hope they enjoy a swift voyage and better weather than today. The Queen drew Waters down into the window seat beside her. Do we have Sir Loris to thank for this triumph? His smile vanished. Some will say so, Your Grace. Some? She gave him a quizzical look. Not you? I never saw a braver knight, Waters said. But he turned what could have been a bloodless victory into a slaughter. A thousand men are dead, or near enough to make no matter. Most of them our own, and not just common men, Your Grace, but knights and young lords, the best and the bravest. And Sir Loris himself? He will make a thousand and one. They carried him inside the castle after the battle, but his wounds are grievous. He has lost so much blood that the maesters will not even leech him. Oh, how sad. Toman will be heartbroken. He did so admire our gallant knight of flowers. The small folk, too, her admiral said. We'll have maidens weeping into their wine all across the realm when Loris dies. He was not wrong, the queen knew. Three thousand small folk had crowded through the mud gate to see Sir Loris off the day he sailed, and three of every four were women. The sight had only served to fill her with contempt. She had wanted to scream at them that they were sheep, to tell them that all they could ever hope to get from Loris Tyrell was a smile and a flower. Instead she had proclaimed him the boldest knight in the Seven Kingdoms, and smiled as Toman presented him with a jeweled sword to carry into battle. The king had given him a hug as well, which had not been part of Circe's plans, but it made no matter now. She could afford to be generous. Loris Tyrell was dying. Tell me, Circe commanded, I want to know all of it, from the beginning to the end. The room had grown dark by the time that he was done. The queen lit some candles and sent Dorcas to the kitchens to bring them up some bread and cheese and a bit of boiled beef with horseradish. As they supped, she bid Orain to tell the tale again, so she would remember all the details correctly. I do not want our precious Marjorie to hear these tidings from a stranger, after all, she said. I will tell her myself. Your grace is kind, said Waters with a smile. A wicked smile, the queen thought. Orain did not resemble Prince Rhaegar as much as she had thought. He has the hair, but so do half the whores in Lys, if the tales are true. Rhaegar was a man. This is a sly boy, no more. Useful in his way, though. Marjorie was in the maiden vault, sipping wine and trying to puzzle out some new game from Volantis with her three cousins. Though the hour was late, the guards admitted Circe at once. Your Grace, she began, it is best you hear the news from me. Orain is back from Dragonstone. Your brother is a hero. I always knew he was. Marjorie did not seem surprised. Why should she? She expected this from the moment Loris begged for the command. Yet by the time Circe had finished with her tale, tears glistened on the cheeks of the younger queen. Red Wine had miners working to drive a tunnel underneath the castle walls, but that was too slow for the Knight of Flowers. No doubt he was thinking of your Lord Father's people suffering on the shields. Lord Waters says he ordered the assault not half a day after taking command, 
After Lord Stannis's Castellan refused his offer to settle the siege between them in single combat, Norris was the first one through the breach when the ram broke the castle gates. He rode straight into the dragon's mouth, they say, all in white, and swinging his morning star about his head, slaying left and right. Mega Tyro was sobbing openly by then. How did he die? she asked. Who killed him? No one man has that honor, said Cersei. Sir Loras took a quarrel through the thigh and another through the shoulder, but he fought on gallantly, though the blood was streaming from him. Later he suffered a mace blow that broke some ribs. After that... But no, I would spare you the worst of it. Tell me, said Marjorie. I command it. Command it? Cersei paused a moment, then decided she would let that pass. The defenders fell back to an inner keep once the curtain wall was taken. Loris led the attack there as well. He was doused with boiling oil. Lady Alla turned white as chalk and ran from the room. The maesters are doing all they can, Lord Waters assures me, but I fear your brother is too badly burned. Cersei took Marjorie in her arms to comfort her. He saved the realm. When she kissed the little queen upon the cheek, she could taste the salt of her tears. Jamie will enter all his deeds in the White Book, and the singers will sing of him for a thousand years. Marjorie wrenched free of her embrace so violently that Cersei almost fell. Dying is not dead, she said. No, but the maesters say, Dying is not dead! I only want to spare you. I know what you want. Get out! Now you know how I felt the night my Joffrey died. She bowed, her face a mask of cool courtesy. Sweet daughter, I am so sad for you. I will leave you with your grief. Lady Merriweather did not appear that night, and Circe found herself too restless to sleep. If Lord Tywin could see me now, he would know he had his heir, an heir worthy of the rock. She thought as she lay abed with Jocelyn Swift, snoring softly into the other pillow. Marjorie would soon be weeping the bitter tears she should have wept for Joffrey. Mace Taro might weep as well, but she had given him no cause to break with her. What had she done, after all, but honor Loras with her trust? He had requested the command on bended knee, whilst half her court looked on. When he dies, I must raise a statue of him somewhere and give him a funeral such as King's Landing has never seen. The small folk would like that. So would Tommen. Mace may even thank me, poor man. As for his lady mother, if the gods are good, this news will kill her. The sunrise was the prettiest that Circe had seen in years. Tena appeared soon thereafter, and confessed to having spent the night consoling Marjorie and her ladies, drinking wine and crying, and telling tales of Loras. Marjorie is still convinced he will not die, she reported as the queen was dressed for court. She plans to send her own maester to look after him. The cousins are praying for the mother's mercy. I shall pray as well. On the morrow, come with me to Baylor's Sept, and we will light a hundred candles for our gallant night of flowers. She turned to her handmaid. Dorcas, bring my crown. The new one, if you please. It was lighter than the old, pale-spun gold set with emeralds that sparkled when she turned her head. There are four come about the imp this morning, Sir Osmond said when Jocelyn admitted him. Four? The Queen was pleasantly surprised. A steady stream of informers had been making their way to the Red Keep, claiming knowledge of Tyrion, but four in one day was unusual. I, said Osmond, one brought a head for you. I will see him first. Bring him to my solar. This time, let there be no mistakes. Let me be avenged at long last, so Joff can rest in peace. The Septons said that the number seven was sacred to the gods. If so, perhaps this seventh head would bring her the balm her soul desired. 
The man proved to be Tairoshi, short and stout and sweaty, with an unctuous smile that reminded her of Varys and a forked beard dyed green and pink. Cersei misliked him on sight, but was willing to overlook his flaws if he actually had Tyrion's head inside the chest he carried. It was cedar, inlaid with ivory, in a pattern of vines and flowers, with hinges and clasps of white gold. A lovely thing, but the queen's only interest lay in what might be within. It is big enough, at least. Tyrion had a grotesquely large head, for one so small and stunted. Your grace, the Tiroshi murmured, bowing low. I see you are as lovely as the tales. Even beyond the narrow sea we have heard of your great beauty, and the grief that tears your gentle heart. No man can restore your brave young son to you, but it is my hope I can at least offer you some balm for your pain. He laid his hand upon his chest. I bring you justice. I bring you the head of your Valonqar. The old Valyrian word sent a chill through her, though it also gave her a tingle of hope. The imp is no longer my brother, if he ever was, she declared, nor will I say his name. It was a proud name once, before he dishonored it. In Tyrosh we name him Red Hands, for the blood running from his fingers. A king's blood, and a father's. Some say he slew his mother, too, ripping his way from her womb with savage claws. What nonsense, Circe thought. Tis true, she said. If the imp's head is in that chest, I shall raise you to lordship and grant you rich lands and keeps. Titles were cheaper than dirt, and the riverlands were full of ruined castles standing desolate amidst untended fields and burned villages. My court awaits. Open the box and let us see. The Tyroshi threw open the box with a flourish and stepped back, smiling. Within, the head of a dwarf reposed upon a bed of soft blue velvet, staring up at her. Circe took a long look. That is not my brother. There was a sour taste in her mouth. I suppose it was too much to hope for, especially after Loras. The gods are never that good. This man has brown eyes. Tyrion had one black eye and one green. The eyes, just so, your grace. Your brother's own eyes had somewhat decayed. I took the liberty of replacing them with glass, but of the wrong color, as you say. That only annoyed her further. Your head may have glass eyes, but I do not. There are gargoyles on Dragonstone that look more like the imp than this creature. He's bald, and twice my brother's age. What happened to his teeth? The man shrank before the fury in her voice. He had a fine set of gold teeth, your grace, but we— I regret— Oh, not yet. But you will. I ought to have him strangled. Let him gasp for breath until his face turns black, the way my sweet son did. The words were on her lips. An honest mistake. One dwarf looks so much like another. And your grace will observe he has no nose. He has no nose because you cut it off. No! The sweat on his brow gave the lie to his denial. Yes! A poisonous sweetness crept into Circe's tone. At least you had that much sense. The last fool tried to tell me that a hedge wizard had regrown it. Still, it seems to me that you owe this dwarf a nose. House Lannister pays its debts, and so shall you. Sir Marin, take this fraud to Kyburn. Sir Marin Trant took the Tyroshi by the arm and hauled him off, still protesting. When they were gone, Cersei turned to Osmond Kettleblack. Sir Osmond, get this thing out of my sight, and bring in the other three who claim knowledge of the imp. Aye, your grace. Sad to say, the three would-be informers proved no more useful than the Tyroshi. 
One said that the imp was hiding in an old town brothel, pleasuring men with his mouth. It made for a droll picture, but Circe did not believe it for an instant. The second claimed to have seen the dwarf in a mummer show in Bravos. The third insisted Tyrion had become a hermit in the Riverlands, living on some haunted hill. The queen made the same response to each. If you will be so good as to lead some of my brave knights to this dwarf, you shall be richly rewarded, she promised, provided that it is the imp. If not, well, my knights have little patience for deception, nor fools who send them chasing after shadows. A man could lose his tongue. And quick as that, all three informers suddenly lost faith, and allowed that perhaps it might have been some other dwarf they saw. Circe had never realized there were so many dwarfs. Is the whole world overrun with these twisted little monsters? She complained, whilst the last of the informers was being ushered out. How many of them can there be? Fewer than there were, said Lady Merriweather. May I have the honor of accompanying your grace to court? If you can bear the tedium, said Circe. Robert was a fool about most things, but he was right in one regard. It is wearisome work to rule a kingdom. It saddens me to see your grace so careworn. I say, run off and play, and leave the king's hand to hear these tiresome petitions. We could dress as serving girls and spend the day amongst the small folk, to hear what they are saying of the fall of Dragonstone. I know the inn where the blue bard plays when he is not singing attendance on the little queen, and a certain cellar where a conjurer turns lead into gold, water into wine, and girls into boys. Perhaps he would work his spells on the two of us. Would it amuse your grace to be a man one night? If I were a man, I would be Jamie. The queen thought, if I were a man, I could rule this realm in my own name in place of Tommen's. Only if you remained a woman, she said, knowing that was what Tana wanted to hear. You are a wicked thing to tempt me so. But what sort of queen would I be if I put my realm in the trembling hands of Harris Swift? Tana pouted. Your grace is too diligent. I am, Circe allowed, and by day's end I shall rue it. She slipped her arm through Lady Merriweather's. Come! Jalabar Shaw was the first to petition her that day, as befit his rank as a prince in exile. Splendid as he looked in his bright feathered cloak, he had only come to beg. Circe let him make his usual plea for men at arms to help him regain Red Flower Vale, then said, His grace is fighting his own war, Prince Jalabar. He has no men to spare for yours just now. Next year, perhaps. That was what Robert always told him. Next year she would tell him never, but not today. Dragonstone was hers. Lord Hallen of the Guild of Alchemists presented himself to ask that his pyromancers be allowed to hatch any dragon's eggs that might turn up upon Dragonstone, now that the isle was safely back in royal hands. If any such eggs remained, Stannis would have sold them to pay for his rebellion, the queen told him. She refrained from saying that the plan was mad. Ever since the last Targaryen dragon had died, all such attempts had ended in death, disaster, or disgrace. A group of merchants appeared before her to beg the throne to intercede for them with the Iron Bank of Bravos. The Bravosi were demanding repayment of their outstanding debts, it seemed, and refusing all new loans. We need our own bank, Circe decided. The Golden Bank of Lannisport. Perhaps when Tommen's throne was secure, she could make that happen. For the nonce, all she could do was tell the merchants to pay the Bravosi usurers their due. The delegation from the Faith was headed by her old friend Septon Raynard. Six of the warrior's sons escorted him across the city. Together they were seven, a holy and propitious number. The new High Septon or High Sparrow, as Moonboy had dubbed him, did everything by sevens. 
The knights wore sword belts striped in the seven colors of the faith. Crystals adorned the pummels of their long swords and the crests of their great helms. They carried kite shields of a style not common since the conquest, displaying a device not seen in the seven kingdoms for centuries, a rainbow sword shining bright upon a field of darkness. Close to a hundred knights had already come forth to pledge their lives and swords to the warriors' sons, Kyburn claimed, and more turned up every day. Drunk on the gods, the lot of them. Who would have thought the realm contained so many of them? Most had been household knights and hedge knights, but a handful were of high birth, younger sons, petty lords, old men wanting to atone for the old sins. And then there was Lancel. She had thought Kyburn must be japing when he had told her that her moon-calf cousin had forsaken castle, lands, and wife, and wandered back to the city to join the noble and puissant order of the warrior's sons. Yet there he stood, with the other pious fools. Cersei liked that not at all. Nor was she pleased by the High Sparrow's endless truculence and ingratitude. "'Where is the High Septon?' she demanded of Reynard. "'It was him I summoned.' Septon Reynard assumed a regretful tone. "'His High Holiness sent me in his stead, and bade me tell your grace that the Seven have sent him forth to battle wickedness.' "'How? By preaching chastity along the street of silk? Does he think praying over whores will turn them back to virgins?' "'Our bodies were shaped by our father and mother, so we might join male to female and beget true-born children.' Raynard replied, It is base and sinful for women to sell their holy parts for coin. The pious sentiment would have been more convincing if the queen had not known that Septon Raynard had special friends in every brothel on the street of silk. No doubt he had decided that echoing the high sparrow's twitterings was preferable to scrubbing floors. Do not presume to preach at me, she told him. The brothel keepers have been complaining and rightly so. If sinners speak, why should the righteous listen? These sinners feed the royal coffers, the queen said bluntly, and their pennies help pay the wages of my gold cloaks and build galleys to defend our shores. There is trade to be considered as well. If King's Landing had no brothels, the ships would go to Duskendale or Gulltown. His High Holiness promised me peace in my streets. Whoring helps to keep that peace. Common men, deprived of whores, are apt to turn to rape. Henceforth, let His High Holiness do his praying in the sept, where it belongs. The Queen had expected to hear from Lord Giles as well, but instead Grand Maester Pissell appeared, grey-faced and apologetic, to tell her that Rosby was too weak to leave his bed. Sad to say, I fear Lord Giles must join his noble forebears soon. May the father judge him justly. If Rosby dies, Mace Tyrell and the little queen will try and force Garth the Gross on me again. Lord Giles has had that cough for years, and it never killed him before. She complained. He coughed through half of Robert's reign and all of Joffrey's. If he is dying now, it can only be because someone wants him dead. Grand Maester Pissell blinked in disbelief. Your Grace, who would want Lord Giles dead? His heir, perhaps. Or the little queen. Some woman he once scorned. Marjorie and Mace and the Queen of Thorns, why not? Giles is in their way. An old enemy, a new one. You. The old man blanched. You're your grace, Japes. I, I have purged his lordship, bled him, treated him with poultices and infusions. The mists give him some relief, and sweet sleep helps with the violence of his coughing. But he is bringing up bits of lung with the blood now, I fear. Be that as it may, you will return to Lord Giles and inform him that he does not have my leave to die. If it please your grace, Pissell bowed stiffly. There was more and more and more, each petitioner more boring than the last. 
and that evening, when the last of them had finally gone, and she was eating a simple supper with her son, she told him, Tommen, when you say your prayers before bed, tell the mother and the father that you are thankful you are still a child. Being king is hard work. I promise you, you will not like it. They peck at you like a murder of crows. Every one wants a piece of your flesh. Yes, mother, said Tommen in a sad tone. The little queen had told him of Sir Loras, she understood. Sir Osmond said the boy had wept. He is young. By the time he is Joff's age, he will not recall what Loras looked like. I wouldn't mind them pecking, though, her son went on to say. I should go to court with you every day to listen. Marjorie says, A deal too much, Circe snapped. For half a groat, I'd gladly have her tongue torn out. Don't you say that! Toman shouted suddenly, his round little face turning red. You leave her tongue alone. Don't you touch her. I'm the king, not you. She stared at him, incredulous. What did you say? I'm the king. I get to say who has their tongues torn out, not you. I won't let you hurt Marjorie. I won't. I forbid it. Circe took him by the ear and dragged him squealing to the door, where she found Sir Boros Blount standing guard. Sir Boros, his grace has forgotten himself. Kindly escort him to his bedchamber and bring up Pate. This time I want Toman to whip the boy himself. He is to continue until the boy is bleeding from both cheeks. If his grace refuses or says one word of protest, summon Kyburn and tell him to remove Pate's tongue, so his grace can learn the cost of insolence. As you command, Sir Boris huffed, glancing at the king uneasily. Your grace, please come with me. As night fell over the red keep, Jocelyn kindled a fire in the queen's hearth, whilst Dorcas lit the bedside candles. Circe opened the window for a breath of air, and found that the clouds had rolled back in to hide the stars. "'Such a dark night, Your Grace,' murmured Dorcas. "'Aye,' she thought, "'but not so dark as in the Maiden Vault, or on Dragonstone where Loras Tyrell lies burned and bleeding, or down in the black cells beneath the castle. The Queen did not know why that occurred to her. She had resolved not to give Phallus another thought, Single combat. Pallas should have known better than to marry such a fool. The word from Stokeworth was that Lady Tanda had died of a chill in the chest, brought on by her broken hip. Lawless Lackwit had been proclaimed Lady Stokeworth, with Sir Bron her lord. Tanda dead, and Giles dying. It is well that we have Moon Boy, or the court would be entirely bereft of fools. The queen smiled as she lay her head upon the pillow. When I kissed her cheek, I could taste the salt of her tears. She dreamt an old dream of three girls in brown cloaks, a wattled crone, and a tent that smelled of death. The crone's tent was dark, with a tall peaked roof. She did not want to go in, no more than she had wanted to at ten, but the other girls were watching her, so she could not turn away. They were three in the dream, as they had been in life. Fat Janie Farman hung back as she always did. It was a wonder she had come this far. Malara Heatherspoon was bolder, older, and prettier, in a freckly sort of way. Wrapped in rough spawn cloaks with their hoods pulled up, the three of them had stolen from their beds and crossed the tourney grounds to seek the sorceress. Malara had heard the serving girls whispering, how she could curse a man, or make him fall in love, summon demons, and foretell the future. In life the girls had been breathless and giddy, whispering to each other as they went, as excited as they were afraid. The dream was different. In the dream the pavilions were shadowed, and the knights and serving men they passed were made of mist. The girls wandered for a long while before they found the crone's tent. By the time they did, 
All the torches were guttering out. Circe watched the girls huddling, whispering to one another. Go back, she tried to tell them. Turn away. There is nothing here for you. But though she moved her mouth, no words came out. Lord Tywin's daughter was the first through the flap, with Malara close behind her. Janie Farman came last and tried to hide behind the other two, the way she always did. The inside of the tent was full of smells. Cinnamon and nutmeg, pepper, red and white and black, almond milk and onions, cloves and lemongrass and precious saffron, and stranger spices, rarer still. The only light came from an iron brazier shaped like a basilisk's head, a dim green light that made the walls of the tent look cold and dead and rotten. Had it been that way in life as well? Circe could not seem to remember. The sorceress was sleeping in the dream, as once she'd slept in life. Leave her be. The queen wanted to cry out, You little fools, never wake a sleeping sorceress. Without a tongue, she could only watch as the girl threw off her cloak, kicked the witch's bed, and said, Wake up! We want our futures told! When Maggie the Frog opened her eyes, Janie Farman gave a frightened squeak and fled the tent, plunging headlong back into the night. Plump, stupid, timid little Janie, pasty-faced and fat and scared of every shadow. She was the wise one, though. Janie lived on Fair Isle still. She had married one of her lord brother's bannermen and whelped a dozen children. The old woman's eyes were yellow and crusted all about with something vile. In Lannisport it was said that she had been young and beautiful when her husband had brought her back from the east with a load of spices, but age and evil had left their marks on her. She was short, squat, and warty, with pebbly greenish jowls. Her teeth were gone, and her dugs hung down to her knees. You could smell sickness on her if you stood too close, and when she spoke her breath was strange and strong and foul. Be gone, she told the girls in a croaking whisper. We came for a foretelling, young Circe told her. Be gone, croaked the old woman a second time. We heard that you can see into the morrow, said Molara. We just want to know what men we're going to marry. Be gone, croaked Maggie a third time. Listen to her. The queen would have cried if she had her tongue. You still have time to flee. Run, you little fools. The girl with the golden curls put her hands upon her hips. Give us our foretelling, or I'll go to my lord father and have you whipped for insolence. Please, begged Malara, just tell us our futures, then we'll go. Some are here who have no futures, Maggie muttered in her terrible deep voice. She pulled her robe about her shoulders and beckoned the girls closer. Come, if you will not go. Fools, come, yes. I must taste your blood. Malara paled, but not Circe. A lioness does not fear a frog, no matter how old and ugly she might be. She should have gone. She should have listened. She should have run away. Instead, she took the dagger Maggie offered her, and ran the twisted iron blade across the ball of her thumb. Then she did Malara, too. In the dim green tent the blood seemed more black than red. Maggie's toothless mouth trembled at the sight of it. Here, she whispered. Give it here! When Circe offered her hand, she sucked away the blood with gums as soft as a newborn babe's. The queen could still remember how queer and cold her mouth had been. Three questions may you ask, the crone said, when she'd had her drink. You will not like my answers. Ask, or be gone with you. Go, the dreaming queen thought. Hold your tongue and flee. But the girl did not have sense enough to be afraid. When will I wed the prince? she asked. Never. You will wed the king. Beneath her golden curls, the girl's face wrinkled up in puzzlement. For years after, 
She took those words to mean that she would not marry Rhaegar until after his father Aerys had died. "'I will be queen, though?' asked the younger heir. "'I?' Malice gleamed in Maggie's yellow eyes. "'Queen you shall be, until there comes another, younger and more beautiful, to cast you down and take all that you hold dear.' Anger flashed across the child's face. If she tries, I will have my brother kill her. Even then she would not stop, willful child as she was. She still had one more question to her, one more glimpse into her life to come. Will the king and I have children? she asked. Oh, I. Six and ten for him, and three for you. That made no sense to Circe. Her thumb was throbbing where she'd cut it, and her blood was dripping on the carpet. How could that be? She wanted to ask, but she was done with her questions. The old woman was not done with her, however. Gold shall be their crowns, and gold their shrouds, she said. And when your tears have drowned you, the Valonqar shall wrap his hands about your pale white throat and choke the life from you. What is a Valonqar? Some monster? The golden girl did not like that foretelling. You're a liar, and a warty frog, and a smelly old savage, and I don't believe a word of what you say. Come away, Malara. She is not worth hearing. I get three questions, too, her friend insisted, and when Circe tugged upon her arm, she wriggled free, and turned back to the crone. "'Will I marry Jamie?' she blurted out. "'You stupid girl,' the queen thought, angry even now. "'Jamie does not even know you are alive.' Back then her brother lived only for swords and dogs and horses, and for her, his twin. "'Not Jamie, nor any other man,' said Maggie. "'Worms will have your maiden head. Your death is here tonight, little one. Can you smell her breath? She is very close. The only breath we smell is yours, said Circe. There was a jar of some thick potion by her elbow sitting on the table. She snatched it up and threw it into the old woman's eyes. In life the crone had screamed at them in some queer foreign tongue and cursed them as they fled her tent but in the dream her face dissolved, melting away into ribbons of gray mist, until all that remained were two squinting yellow eyes, the eyes of death. The Valonqar shall wrap his hands about your throat, the queen heard, but the voice did not belong to the old woman. The hands emerged from the mists of her dream and coiled around her neck, thick hands and strong, Above them floated his face, leering down at her with his mismatched eyes. No! the queen tried to cry out. But the dwarf's fingers dug deep into her neck, choking off her protests. She kicked and screamed to no avail. Before long she was making the same sound her son had made, the terrible thin sucking sound that marked Joff's last breath on earth. She woke gasping in the dark with her blanket wound about her neck. Circe wrenched it off so violently that it tore, and sat up with her breasts heaving. A dream, she told herself, an old dream, and a tangled coverlet. That's all it was. Tana was spending the night with the little queen again, so it was Dorcas asleep beside her. The queen shook the girl roughly by the shoulder. Wake up and find Pissell. He'll be with Lord Giles, I expect. Fetch him here at once. Still half asleep, Dorcas stumbled from the bed and went scampering across the chamber for her clothing, her bare feet rustling on the rushes. Ages later, Grand Maester Pissell entered, shuffling, and stood before her with bowed head, blinking his heavy-lidded eyes and struggling not to yawn. He looked as if the weight of the huge maester's chain about his wattled neck was dragging him down to the floor. 
Pisel had been old as far back as Circe could remember. But there was a time when he had also been magnificent, richly clad, dignified, exquisitely courteous. His immense white beard had given him an air of wisdom. Tyrion had shaved his beard off, though, and what had grown back was pitiful. A few patchy tufts of thin, brittle hair that did little to hide the loose pink flesh beneath his sagging chin. Brittle hair that did little to hide the loose pink flesh beneath his sagging chin. This is no man, she thought, only the ruins of one. The black cells robbed him of whatever strength he had. That and the imp's razor. How old are you? Circe asked abruptly. Four and eighty, if it please your grace. A younger man would please me more. His tongue flicked across his lips. I was but two and forty when the conclave called me. Kaith was eighty when they chose him, and Elendor was nigh on ninety. The cares of office crushed them, and both were dead within a year of being raised. Marion came next, only six and sixty, but he died of a chill on his way to King's Landing. Afterward, King Egan asked the Citadel to send a younger man. He was the first king I served. And Tommen shall be the last. I need a potion from you, something to help me sleep. A cup of wine before bed will oft— I drink wine, you witless cretin. I require something stronger, something that will not let me dream. You— your grace does not wish to dream? What did I just say? Have your ears grown as feeble as your cock? Can you make me such a potion, or must I command Lord Kyburn to rectify another of your failures? No, there is no need to involve that, to involve Kyburn. Dreamless sleep. You shall have your potion. Good, you may go. As he turned toward the door, though, she called him back. One more thing. What does the Citadel teach concerning prophecy? Can our morrows be foretold? The old man hesitated. One wrinkled hand groped blindly at his chest, as if to stroke the beard that was not there. Can our morrows be foretold? He repeated slowly. Mayhaps. There are certain spells in the old books, but your grace might ask instead, should our morrows be foretold? And to that I should answer, no. Some doors are best left closed. See that you close mine as you leave. She should have known that he would give her an answer as useless as he was. The next morning she broke her fast with Toman. The boy seemed much subdued. Ministering to pate had served its purpose, it would seem. They ate fried eggs, fried bread, bacon, and some blood oranges newly come by ship from Dorn. Her son was attended by his kittens. As she watched the cats frolic about his feet, Circe felt a little better. No harm will ever come to Tommen whilst I still live. She would kill half the lords in Westeros and all the common people, if that was what it took to keep him safe. Go with Jocelyn, she told the boy, after they had eaten. Then she sent for Kyburn. Is Lady Fallis still alive? Alive, yes. Perhaps not entirely comfortable. I see. Circe considered a moment. This man, Bronn. I cannot say I like the notion of an enemy so close. His power all derives from Lawless. If we were to produce her elder sister— Alas, said Guybern, I fear that Lady Fallis is no longer capable of ruling Stokeworth, or, indeed, of feeding herself. I have learned a great deal from her, I am pleased to say, but the lessons have not been entirely without cost. 
I hope I have not exceeded your grace's instructions. No. Whatever she had intended, it was too late. There was no sense dwelling on such things. It is better if she dies, she told herself. She would not want to go on living without her husband. Oaf that he was. The fool seemed fond of him. There is another matter. Last night I had a dreadful dream. All men are so afflicted from time to time. This dream concerned a witch woman I visited as a child. A woods witch. Most are harmless creatures. They know a little herb craft and some midwifery, but elsewise. She was more than that. Half of Lannisport used to go to her for charms and potions. She was mother to a petty lord, a wealthy merchant upjumped by my grandsire. This lord's father had found her whilst trading in the east. Some say she cast a spell on him, though more like the only charm she needed was the one between her thighs. She was not always hideous, or so they said. I don't recall the woman's name. Something long and eastern and outlandish. The small folk used to call her Maggie. Magi? Is that how you say it? The woman would suck a drop of blood from your finger and tell you what your morrows held. Blood magic is the darkest kind of sorcery. Some say it is the most powerful as well. Circe did not want to hear that. This Magi made certain prophecies. I laughed at them at first, but... She foretold the death of one of my bedmaids. At the time she made the prophecy, the girl was one in ten, healthy as a little horse, and safe within the rock. Yet she soon fell down a well and drowned. Malara had begged her never to speak of the things they heard that night in the Magi's tent. If we never talk about it, we'll soon forget, and then it will be just a bad dream we had, Malara had said. Bad dreams never come true. The both of them had been so young. That had sounded almost wise. Do you still grieve for this friend of your childhood? Kybern asked. Is that what troubles you, Your Grace? Malara? No. I can hardly recall what she looked like. It is just the Magi knew how many children I would have, and she knew of Robert's bastards. Years before he'd sighed even the first of them she knew. She promised me I should be queen, but said another queen would come. Younger and more beautiful, she said. Another queen who would take from me all I loved. And you wish to forestall this prophecy? More than anything, she thought. Can it be forestalled? Oh, yes. Never doubt that. How? I think your grace knows how. She did. I knew it all along, she thought, even in the tent. If she tries, I will have my brother kill her. Knowing what needed to be done was one thing, though. Knowing how to do it was another. Jamie could no longer be relied on. A sudden sickness would be best, but the gods were seldom so obliging. How then? A knife? A pillow? A cup of heart's bane? All of those posed problems. When an old man died in his sleep, no one thought twice of it. But a girl of six and ten, found dead in bed, was certain to raise awkward questions. Besides, Marjorie never slept alone. Even with Sir Loras dying, there were swords about her night and day. Swords have two edges, though. The very men who guard her could be used to bring her down. The evidence would need to be so overwhelming that even Marjorie's own lord father would have no choice but to consent to her execution. That would not be easy. Her lovers are not like to confess, knowing it would mean their heads as well as hers. Unless... The next day the queen came on Osmond Kettleblack in the yard, as he was sparring with one of the red wine twins. Which one, she could not say. She had never been able to tell the two of them apart. She watched the sword play for a while, 
then called Sir Osmond aside. Walk with me a bit, she said, and tell me true. I want no empty boasting now, no talk of how a kettle black is thrice as good as any other night. Much may ride upon your answer. Your brother Osney. How good a sword is he? Good. You've seen him. He's not as strong as me or Osfrid, but he's quick to the kill. If it came to it, could he defeat Sir Boris Blount? Boris the belly? Sir Osmond chortled. He's what? Forty, fifty? Half drunk half the time? Fat even when he's sober? If he ever had a taste for battle, he's lost it. Aye, Your Grace, if Sir Boris wants for killing, Osney could do it easy enough. Why? Has Boris done some treason? No, she said. But Osney has. <laughs>